anything I can do to help you out, Hillary? Welcome, Jay Browning. You guys are in the queue. Go ahead and disable your video until it's time for you to be called. Thank you. Yeah. You can see the full screen. Yeah. Down below. Yeah, but the top one is Even if it's just a page. So we're pretty much good to go. I just wait for him. I just wait for them to start the meeting and then I stop sharing my screen. We're getting a little feedback that could be from us here in it's up here. Corvallis. So, Apologies. It just takes a while. Yeah, it takes like a long time. 30 seconds. Do we mute sound to YouTube? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we got a lot of folks here. Okay. We don't have the news this Natural gas LNG plant was being announced for us. They all have these the same color features, and they all came to the floor. Still did that. Was that the anti crowd or the floor crowd? Yeah. It's trying to get the other thing's question. We got people to sit down. Good morning, everyone. Is the uh, sound level okay? Supposed to be on. I just did. Good, Good morning, morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're just going to do a quick mic check with our Salem headquarters. Salem headquarters, can you hear us loud and clear? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. All right. We defer to you, Chair Kelly, State Forester Mukamoto. Can everyone hear me loud and clear? Great. Okay. Um, Welcome everyone to the Wednesday, March 8th, 2023 Board of Forestry hybrid public meeting. For the record, I'm Jim Kelly, Chair of the State Board of Forestry. I know we've got a lot of people here that are eager to testify, so I'm going to try to really keep us on time and, and push through as, as quick as I can to maximize our amount of time for testimony. Today, we are live streaming this event on YouTube to make sure our viewers online can follow along with our virtual proceedings. I'll go over some meeting housekeeping tips. Everyone partic 
participating in the virtual and physical meeting room, please silence your cell phones and try to limit background noises. For online participants, remember to mute yourself when you're not speaking and disable your video when not presenting or when providing public comment. For the record, we ask everyone participating today to state their names using the available microphones so that those listening online can track the commentary. If you experience technical issues in the virtual meeting room, use the chat function on Zoom to connect with our ODF host during this event. For those watching this meeting via live stream and present in this room, I'll remind everyone of our general order of operations. After an item is introduced, I'll invite the presenters to begin. For board members, if you have clarifying questions, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, or if you are present, I think you all are, merely raise your hand and I'll call on you. Uh, presenters, we will do our uh, best to ask questions one at a time. After a presentation, we will open the floor for board discussion and additional questions. We have one decision item in front of the board in block form, the consent agenda. From there, we will proceed with our agenda, which is filled with items that will inform the board um, for our current efforts to revise the forestry program for Oregon and provide uh, foundational information leading up to the March 9th field tour. And in order to ensure the board can, can conduct all the items on the agenda, the public comment provision under uh, agenda item one will be limited. The public can comment on items on and off the agenda. Upon the Conclusion of the board and state forester comments, we will begin our public comment portion. The board received a high level of interest in the week's meeting and to accommodate everyone who would like to provide uh, public comment, we made a couple of logistical adjustments uh, to accommodate testimony provide, uh, providers. The meeting time, obviously, we moved to start at 8.30 instead of 8 o'clock and uh, we'll limit each person to two minutes. And uh, again, we'll try to, to uh, have as many presenters as possible. We do understand that this is not a lot of time, but if you would like to share more information with the board, we recommend sending in written testimony for this meeting. To enter it into the record, please uh, send in your comments by March 22nd. That, any questions? If none, I will perform a roll call to confirm quorum can be met for today's items. Liz Agpawa. Chair Kelly, I am present. Carla Chambers. Here. Ben Doimling. Here. Shonda Ferrari. Here. Joe Justice. Here. Brenda McComb. Here. And I am here as well. Okay, we will move to the consent agenda item. Um, and uh, I think you all have that in front of you. Uh, would anybody like to present a motion? Uh, Chair Kelly, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Do we have a second? I second that. Ben Doyne with seconds. Okay, in that case, we will um, prepare to have a vote on that. Um, and I will call uh, the roll here. Liz Agpawa. Aye. Carla Chambers. Aye. Ben Doimling. Aye. Chandra Ferrari. Aye. Joe Justice. Aye. Brenda McComb. Aye. And I am an aye as well. Um, so we have a motion uh, that uh, was made by Joe and who seconded it? Ben. Ben. And uh, for the record, uh, that motion has passed. And uh, so we are moving with record speed. Thank you all. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. Um, and I'd like to welcome State Forester Cal Mukamoto to begin with your opening comments, Cal. You may. Well, <laughs> thank you, Chair Kelly. Uh, and thank you all for joining us here at Oregon State University home of the beavers and probably one of the best forestry schools in the nation oh. and the world. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this feels uh, recently the department had the opportunity to present to the natural resources subcommittee of the joint committee on ways and means ways and means is responsible for the heavy lift of matching up up available funding with state government budgetary needs. Last week's presentation was our opportunity to help subcommittee members get to know 
our agency and the services we provide to Oregonians so they can use that understanding as they build the next biennium's budget. Uh, we very much appreciated Chair Kelly's comments to the subcommittee, which I believe provided critical perspective on what the department is and will continue to face. During the presentation, I highlighted a few key challenges for ODF. The first was fire funding, and not just the lack of dedicated emergency fire funding me mechanism, the department's base level budget for fire protection ensures that there are enough resources at the local level to protect for to protected forest resources and Oregonians from wildfires. As fire seasons worsen, the cost to provide the adequate level of protection increases and the cost of public and private landowners is becoming untenable in many areas of the state. The second is climate change. Climate change is adding complexity to every part of ODF's core mission, from wildfire suppression to forest management to forest health. The final challenge accompanies an immense opportunity. There are millions of dollars of federal funds on the table for fire resili forest resilience and wildfire reduction work. This funding would go a long ways toward transforming the state's most vulnerable forests. But the challenge is actu in actually putting all that money to good use on the ground due to workforce capacity limits across the board. Despite these and other challenges, ODF employees continue to do all they can on behalf of the Oregonians we serve and are optimistic that legis the legislature will provide us with resources needed to continue our important work. With that, I'll hand it back over to Chair Kelly. Any other uh, board member opening comments? Carla Chambers. Thank you, Cal. I appreciate the um, update on the legislative front. Um, you know, we've in the pre-board meetings we talked at length about the finances of this agency, and the governor's budget came in at about 281 million. Um, three big drivers in that budget: our three-year average on big fire is about 95 million. We owe 50 million to the E board and about 28 million uh, annually as proposed with that HCP. Those three big drivers are about 61% of this annual budget. I just, I wanna be sure the department, it has a full court press on collections of the 72, 73 million of accounts receivable and the 61 million that still needs to be invoiced primarily from uh, the last two years fires. Um, Finally, really support that MGO uh, cash flow forecast. I think, Cal, you referred to our budget as fragile. I completely agree with that. And to be able to congregate these large drivers and understand as we make policy decisions or have policy discussions, we too understand how it's going to impact ODF's budget. So um, just putting a call out for um, you know, making sure we understand where we are financially as well. Thank you. Any other opening board comments? Okay, I um, I have a few comments. Um, you know, and I know uh, that that many uh, rural Oregonians are are um, very concerned about what's going on here, and and we get that. Um, and we're going to welcome your testimony today. There has been rumors and grumbling that have been going on that that uh, uh, some seem to think that. Um, the department and the board is really trying to shut out rural voices. And let me let me give you a little bit of background about what's gone on the last few years and what we're trying to do, because uh, I've just I'm going to explain why I think that's absolutely false. Um, since I've been on the board of forestry, which is four and a half years, um, all the meetings before COVID all took place in Salem. Uh, the, the policy was that they uh, that the department would have Board of Forestry meetings one a year outside of Salem. But in fact, that never happened in my first couple of years. Then we had COVID. Um, and typically, we would probably see the same people and often just three or five people who wanted to testify uh, when we would have our typical meeting. Once in a while, we'd have a hotter topic and there'd be some more than that. So when I became board chair, I thought, let's get real about 
reaching out uh, and having meetings in other parts of the state and, uh, um, and, and giving more access to more Oregonians no matter where they live. Um, and of course, we were still we're struggling with COVID, so wasn't able to do that right away. We had our first meeting in I don't know how many years, but but longer than I'd been on the board um, outside of Salem last year, uh, and we we did that down in Seaside. Um, and and that those changes were were really. I, I want to say not just my idea, that really was Cal and his leadership team and Ryan and Hillary, all of those folks really supported um, uh, the work that would go into having more of our meetings outside of Salem. And um, so uh, this year, uh, you know, besides we here meeting in Corvallis, we will be meeting in La Grande or Enterprise, then Sisters, we'll have one more meeting in Salem, and then we'll be in Medford. So this is a sea change in terms of access for Oregonians. Um, and not only that, uh, we've changed to where we have two-day meetings, and with most of those uh, meetings outside of Salem, we'll have an event in the evening where we can meet with local folks and leaders. Um, so in my view, uh, Cal and his team, um, we've done more to increase public access and input really focused on rural Oregonians than I think has ever been done before. When we met in Seaside, as a result of those efforts, all of a sudden I was faced that morning with uh, nearly 60 people signed up for testimony. We couldn't possibly get through our meeting. Uh, staff at the time was struggling to figure out what to do and wanted to limit everybody's testimony to one minute. I thought that would be an insult to the folks who had showed up. So we scrambled at the very last minute uh, moved a couple things to our agenda to uh, the meeting uh, in January. And uh, we limited testimony to um, two minutes and got everybody uh, uh, in there who wanted to testify. So after that experience, knowing we have a lot on our agenda, I, uh, I communicated that we would try to limit testimony to the first uh, 15 who signed up uh, leading to the conspiracy that we're trying to shut voices down. Um, and to, for this meeting, uh, we, of course, uh, all started getting a lot of interest in, in testimony. So immediately when I heard that, we changed it to two minutes. We uh, uh, moved it so that we were meeting earlier. We're trying to do everything we can. But the reality is um, that uh, there's only so much that we can do. Um, and so it's really not been helpful uh, to sort of amp this all up by uh, uh, communicating that there's some sort of conspiracy going on that that uh, 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 that we're trying to shut voices down. And so let me let me be real clear. I totally support everyone's right to organize and have the voices of your supporters here and making their opinions heard loud and clear. Um, but but it's it's. Uh, you know, we've had a number of kind of dark conspiracies put forward in the last few months, and none of them have been true. Um, and they dial up the emotions uh, unnecessarily. Nobody, nobody likes to to hear that that um, they don't that uh, there are people trying to shut them out. So, um, with all of that, um, we you know just just want you all to understand there's no per perfect way to do this. I'm completely open uh, to improving our process uh, to, uh, to make it work. I expect that as we move forward and continue to meet outside of Salem, that we will have more meetings like this with more people, and that's that's a great thing. It's a good thing, and we will do our best to cope. But we do have a lot on our agendas, and there's like I said, there's only so much we can do. So with that, um, I hope that uh, makes sense to you all. But uh, anyhow, with that, we will move on. Okay. And we will move on to public comment. Uh, thanks to all of those who have signed up to provide testimony to the board today. We ask everyone in the queue, whether online or in person, to not exceed their allotted time of two minutes. I ask that before you start, you state your full name, the, tom the topic you are commenting on, any associated affiliation if you are representing a group or organization. A timer will be provided to track your time and each commenter will be called on by the board administrator. 
With limited time available, anyone who exceeds their time will be prompted to provide a closing comment and muted. With many commenters today and limited time, I want to offer a few suggestions. When providing comments, try to endorse rather than repeat the testimony of others. That will help us uh, get the maximum number of people who want to testify up here uh, and able to do that. Um, and uh, submit written testimony to accompany your statements or, or information. And again, that uh, can be sent up till March 22nd. Uh, and um, so with that, just be prepared to uh, deliver your mark, remarks within the time allotted. And so, Hillary, are we ready to engage with public comment? Yes, Chair Kelly, we are ready to begin. Chair Kelly, we have quite a few in the queue, whether in person or here uh, online, uh, who have signed up for my public testimony today. So everyone in the queue for item one, thank you, first off, for joining us. To ensure we stay on track, I will list the names in a set order and call on each of you to begin your testimony. As some testimony providers are in person and others online, please be prepared to engage when your name is called on. I will do my best to clearly enunciate your name, but please correct any mispronunciations when you state your name for the record. When you begin, a timer will be displayed for two minutes up here on front of you for those in person, and then for those online, it'll be a shared screen. When you see that timer run out, we just ask that you provide your closing statement. To start us off, we will have the individuals joining us in person proceed to the rear of the hall and use one of the standing microphones located in the back of the room. I will announce sets of four to give those time to organize at the top of the hall. Those in person, when you're done, please return to your seat for another group to come up. Okay, so the first set to provide testimony will be in the following order. Cyrus Javadi, David Reed, Kevin Leahy, Eric Griss. Good morning, Chair Kelly, members of the Board of Forestry, our state forester and members of the other members of the Department of Forestry. My name is Cyrus Javity. I'm a state representative for uh, House District 32, which represents Clatsop and Tillamook County. I'm here today to express my concerns about the Habitat Conservation Plan being pursued by the Oregon Department of Forestry and its potential impact on the communities I represent. Our districts are known for their natural beauty and their economic production, with forest harvest generating revenue for state and county operations and services, supporting thousands of workers hundreds of family-owned businesses, and critical wood manufacturing infrastructure. We understand the need to implement HCP, but it must strike a balance between conservation and economic viability. However, the recently released state forest implement implementation plans are a source of disappointment and alarm for me and my constituents. The projected harvest levels of 165 to 182.5 million board feet reflect a 27% reduction from the 225 million board feet. Average ODF suggested the HCP would deliver as recently as November 2022 and a 34% reduction from what the agency projected at the start of the HCP process, HCP process in 2018. A reduction in harvestable timber of this side would devastate local taxing districts budgets that would provide essential public services like public safety, education, and infrastructure maintenance. This would make our communities more reliant on the state school fund and other state funds, straining already limited resources. I urge the ODF to explain and address the shortcomings of the recently released state forest IPs and suggest removing the HCP constraints from the IPs until an HCP is adopted by the Board of Forestry. As representatives of the impacted communities, we believe that an alternative plan that achieves the harvest levels ODF claimed their HCP would produce would more appropriately consider the economic impacts of the HCP while also addressing conservation issues that must be rectified. In conclusion, I urge the, you to direct the ODF to improve the, the HCP to increase timber harvest volumes before it's too late. We believe that by working together, we can develop a plan that better serves our communities while providing adequate protection for sensitive wildlife. Thank you for your attention on this important matter. Next up, David Reed. I'm David Reed, representing the 600 member Astoria Warrington Area Chamber of Commerce. Commissioners, today you have the power to protect habitats and destroy livelihoods. The good news is it is entirely possible to do the former without doing the latter, just not with the current HCP. 
There are other HCPs that will protect fish and wildlife without doing the extraordinary damage to jobs, communities, and families that we all know the current one will do. You have already heard from me and many others about the very real and inevitable economic damage that will result from implementing this HCP. Today, I want you to know the human damage. I want you to know the volunteer firefighter who just wants to serve her neighbors and help accident victims. I want you to know the family who have leveraged and invested everything in a log truck to run a family micro business, only to have that opportunity vanish overnight. And their kids who once had the security of a livable family income, but now have to watch mom and dad struggle to make the next mortgage payment, let alone the next truck payment. I want you to know the assault victim who calls 911 only to be told that police help is more than an hour away because of cuts to rural law enforcement. The student who today attends a rural school with abundant resources thanks to timber revenue, but overnight finds himself in yet another underfunded, understaffed school. I want you to know the transit system employee who has been striving to reduce carbon emissions by expanding rural bus routes, but now sees their work cut, ironically, in the name of the environment or the kid who just wants to play soccer in an after-school league offered by the Parks and Rec District. None of these people are imaginary. None of these stories are hypothetical. Each of these outcomes will happen, will come true, unless we can agree on an HCP that takes their lives into account. We don't have to trade the environment protection for human needs. There is a way for us to get both, but it will require involving the stakeholders in the plan and not dismissing rural voices as somehow biased or uninformed. I don't believe that anyone set out to create a rural disaster scenario, nor do I believe that the current plan would have gone forward had the harvest numbers we saw revised in January been estimated earlier in the process. But we know them now. We know what this will mean for real people. We know. So let's fix this while there's still time. Let's fix this while we can still protect the natural environment without crushing the human one. Thank you. Up next, Kevin. Good morning, Chair Kelly and board. I'm Kevin Leahy. I am the Executive Director of CEDAR, Clatsop County's Economic Development Organization and Associate Vice President of Clatsop Community College. I'm speaking in opposition to the HCP. So the average wage in the forest product sector in Clatsop County is $70,599, an 85% differential between the annual wage in our county and the forest product sector. This is especially critical as we are a rural and underserved community. This proposal could potentially kill 275 family wage jobs, plus reduce viability for other local businesses. Most are still recovering from the pandemic, where Clatsop County had the second highest unemployment rate in the entire state of Oregon. As the director of our Small Business Development Center at Clatsop Community College, we served 238 businesses last year. Most of those businesses, 50% of their income comes from locals, not tourists. So we need to support this. There's, there's a ripple effect if this goes through. It would have a, a tsunami effect on our local economy. We already have the highest number of houselessness per capita in the state of Oregon. The $8.5 million annual reduction uh, would dramatically reduce the services and service levels, including an almost $600,000 reduction to my employer, Clatsop Community College. With Future Ready Oregon a key priority for the state, this project will devastate planned workforce training, plans and projects, and will just widen the education gap for our students. We just asked to look at the social economic analysis for this proposal, the more input from stakeholders, and I request that the state postpone the approval of the HCP and re-engage with our local and state elected officials and the private sector to prepare a plan that is more equitable and sustainable for the health and well being of our community. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Up next, Eric. Good morning. My name is Eric Grass, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to address you today. As a first generation immigrant, I have been living and working in Clatsop County for several years. My family arrived in this country when I was 11 and my parents found employment in the local seafood canneries. My siblings and I worked hard in school while our parents provided for our family. I am proud to say that I graduated high school with a 3.8 GPA and received DACA status during my senior year. I began working at Hampton Lumber Mill in 2012 and my wife and I are currently raising our three-year-old son in Napa. I am here to speak about the critical importance of state forest to the working families, our schools, public health, and public safety are all at risk under the proposal HCP. I fear that my son, who will soon attend school in Clatsop County, may not, may not have access to the same education programs that were available to me. Furthermore, 
A reduction in timber revenue will impact our rural law enforcement and fire services. With the influx of tourists during peak season, these services already stretched to the limit. I am also concerned about the industry I have built a career in, my colleagues and mentors at the mill, the log truck drivers, the loggers, the mechanics, and the road builders. State Forest provides good jobs for real families, and the decision to decrease harvest levels will affect our lives, our children's lives, and our grandchildren's lives, and limit the opportunities available to them. Given the new harvest level projections came in lower than expected, please take a step back. If you really need two years, take it. My family, my community, our industry, and all of the people here today are worth it. Thank you very much. Thank you. The second set to provide testimony will be in the following order. Courtney Bangs, Shailene Bangs, Katie Pritchard, Michael Lang. First up, Courtney Bangs. Courtney Bangs, Clatsop County Commissioner, District 4. For over two years, I've come before ODF and this board to present impacts and concerns, which were answered with, don't worry, we'll be able to harvest more over time without, than without this HCP. When that fell through, it turned into, don't worry, the legislature will decouple the department and then all worries will go away. So I'll move to the topic of decoupling because it's being thrown around by environmental groups, this board and ODF. Even though this is a legislative issue and not one for this board, it continues to color board discussion. Decoupling does not address economic drivers that exist because of timber harvest. Extreme reductions in harvest will cause broad economic and social implications. Supplementing public budgets won't make up for lost businesses and family wages. In my community, millions of dollars are directly tied to the timber industry. According to OFRI, 11 jobs are created in Oregon for every million board feet. Simple math shows that this steep harvest will reduce jobs by over 275. In the end, decoupling may save government agencies, but it won't save my community and the people in it. It would only force us to beg for funding by chasing scarce general fund dollars by NEM after by NEM. It's not a more sustainable or predictable funding source. And we'd be begging a state government that's already proven that we're an afterthought. But I'm not here to talk about decoupling. I'm here to discuss the board's decision space, which is the current financial structure and not a future maybe. What does that current financial situation look for state lands? Bankruptcy. By ODF's own admission, this HCP was not written with GPV in mind. It was written with an environmental lens and now we have to determine the social and economic impacts. Don't believe that this is an all or nothing approach. We can do better. Five acres is a staff position. They've already openly admitted to giving away an excess amount to account for the catastrophe the size of the Columbus Day storm. We're not asking you to throw away years of work. We're asking you to develop a balanced plan that doesn't give away more than it is needed. Thank These you. are lifetime decisions. Take time, do the work, get the best deal before these communities are gutted, please. Thank you. Up next, Shailen. Hello, my name is Shaylin Bangs. I wanted to talk to you today about how the HCP will impact my community. This is pretty scary for me and my friends because our families work in the forest industry. The last few years have been rough. At first, in COVID, our industry was considered essential. Our parents and grandparents went to work during a very scary time, and they provided paper products and lumber to stores. Zoom work was never an option. That was scary. In fact, distance ed didn't work because half my school didn't have home access to the internet. To make my point, two months into the shutdown, my dad went on a forest fire along with hundreds of industry members. That's a very scary memory. Through COVID, they placed themselves at risk to provide needed resources and allow protection to others. Now I'm here today to ask you to allow my community's parents to continue to work in that same industry. COVID has already been tough on us kids and we went from being afraid of family going to work every day to fear of them losing their jobs. It's a lot. Yesterday we were good and needed. Now it seems we are not. Beyond the jobs lost due to limiting harvest, the math says we will lose millions of dollars from educational services in my county. That means us kids are losers. Timber dollars help us fund programs like 4-H and provide for our schools. Living rule already means we don't get what the big schools get. 
When you want to be a NASA engineer like me, it can be disappointing and frustrating. 4-H and our local timber companies try to pick up the slack by providing camps and other opportunities. I and close to 350 other kids in 4-H learn so much about leadership, community, and different career paths. But without those timber dollars, our community will have to cut back on what they can offer us. Then there is our community college. Over half a million dollars will be lost yearly from them. Close to 800 students will be directly impacted. I really don't want to see all this go away. And among those 800 students is my cousin and my future self. My friends and I are finally starting to get back to normal, but looking at job and education opportunity loss will make things so much harder again. So I'm asking you to please reconsider this plan and give it more time to find another solution, one that actually displays the balance that everyone keeps talking about. Thanks for listening to me today. Thank you. Up next, Katie. Good morning. For the record, my name is Katie Pritchard. I live in Astoria, Oregon. I grew up in Clatsop County and have served that community as a firefighter, then on active duty military service for more than 20 years before I moved on to now serve my community as our Senator's Chief of Staff. I am the daughter of a timber feller who gave his life harvesting timber in Clatsop County to provide not only for his family, but to supply the building needs of the people in this great state. Growing up, I used to look at the houses being built and think my dad could have been the person that fell that tree that is now part of someone's dream of having a home. I know it sounds like a silly child's thing to think that, but it was where building materials came from. And with that extreme need that we have now for housing in Oregon, I wonder how many houses will have Clatsop County lumber in them if this current plan prevails. Will we be <clears throat> importing from other states, other countries? How does that help the environment? My partner is a commercial fisherman. His parents are small woodland owners. My kids work in Astoria. I could go on and on about the individuals in our community, who they are and how this will impact them. I truly want to. I want to list the many, many people that have reached out to the Senator's office. I want you to know the people that will be most impacted by this current plan. They don't have to be though. If you can take a different approach now that you know how much it will impact us. This proposed HCP has turned out to be a profound disappointment for the state of Oregon and a devastating blow to my county. What adds insult to injury is how arbitrary this feels. I feel, I feel like a few people drew some lines behind closed doors and asked us to just trust them. The board and ODF have created this situation, but my community is the one who will feel this consequence. Where will you all be when my community is suffering because of it? There is no reason to think a less restrictive HCP wouldn't create better outcomes and still receive approval from the federal agencies. There is no reason to delay drafting a new plan. We already know the current plan does more harm than good. We know you can do better and you should for us. I'd like to leave you with by drawing your attention to a letter I'll submit as testimony that was recently sent to the governor by legislative members of the Coastal Caucus who represent approximately 425,000 citizens of Oregon. I beg you to hear them, Thank hear you, me Katie. and the people I'm speaking for today. Thank you for the opportunity. Before I announce the next one, I'll get the third set set eight ready. We have Casey Kula, Carol Cautry, Joshua Estes, and Michael Martin. So please present yourself, Michael. Good morning. My name's Michael Lang, and I'm with the Wild Salmon Center. I want to thank the board for your commitment to a balanced habitat conservation plan, a steady supply of timber and also stabilizing revenue for rural services. I also wanna thank the department for the opportunity to comment on the draft IPs. Uh, we submitted uh, general comments along with several of our uh, member groups in the State Forest Coalition. We support the HCP uh, integrated into the IPs as an on-ramp for HCP implementation. However, the IPs are silent about in, uh, integrating the climate plan adopted by the board. The goal of the climate plan is to establish the ODF as a national leader in promoting climate smart forest policies and actions. The climate plan includes direction to incorporate climate change into the forest management plan and the IPs. This includes harvest rotations that increase carbon storage. Implementing the HCP with longer rotations on land outside of the HCAs are important first steps toward establishing the ODF as a national leader on climate smart forest practices. I also wanna talk about legislation for a moment. As you may know, Senator Golden introduced a bill, Senate Bill 90, that would create a task force to study issues related to state forest management. Their broad interest in creating this task force with everybody at the table to find common ground and develop recommendations to stabilize funding for rural services. 
However, the timber industry, unfortunately, aggressively opposed this little task force bill. So now, and some of these are Portland-based timber companies, are on record opposing additional revenue for rural services. Very disappointing. Um, we hope that uh, they will reconsider and become part of the solution to stabilize funding for rural services. Again, there's broad interest in finding a solution and let's bring people together and work together to find solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, Casey. Can you hear me? All right, good morning. Uh, thank you, board chair, State Forester Mukamoto. Uh, for the record, I'm Casey Kula. Um, I currently serve as the State Forest Policy Coordinator for Oregon Wild and a former Yam Hill County Commissioner. So I got a lot to go through here. So first, as you know, you just heard Senate Bill uh, 90 would have formed a task force to find alternative revenue sources for taxing districts that overlap with Board of Forestry lands and that currently get paid when forests are logged. As I understand it, the governor's staff plan to initiate a private forest accord style process to find that stable revenue. And that means that you as a board have the opportunity to promote the most conservative state forest habitat conservation plan, the one that protects the most miles of riparian zone, while knowing that local governments are stabilized. There you go. Second, state forest rehabilitation and community wildfire risk are urgent needs that can be done by loggers, mill workers, fish biologists, track hoe operators, and we need a workforce training pipeline for that. There's federal money available, including uh, the 2023 Farm Bill, and I know that your staff is working on it. I just want you to support them in obtaining those federal dollars. Fourth, I commend your staff and the authors that are in the room for moving forward the Private Forest Accord. There's a lot happening with it, and I want you to know that people are working on it who are in the room right now. Finally, our Board of Forestry lands need your help in order to create more opportunities in recreation, whether that's OHV parking lots, fishing holes, campgrounds, oh my gosh, and mountain bike trails. So I, um, what I hope is that you will value the Oregonians and understand that their recreation is important to all of us. So thank you very much for your time. Yes, 15 <laughs> seconds left. Thanks for the enthusiasm. Up next, so Carol. Enthusiastic. It's early this morning. <laughs> uh, Brenda, Chandra, uh, you guys came out and saw my family's logging operation out of Banks, Oregon about a year ago. Um, I want to thank you guys uh, for listening to me today. I would uh, encourage any one of you to come out and visit any one of our logging sites at any time. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Harold Cotry. Uh, I am an employee of a small family owned and operated logging company based out of Tillamook, Oregon. And I'm here today because our back is up against the wall. Cotry Tree Farms was founded over 30 years ago by my father and uncle. Today, my father, uncle, brother, cousin, and 20 other employees call this company home. Our annual payroll exceeds $1.4 million. Along with that, we provide family sick leave, paid vacation, and fully funded paid family health insurance. The average age of our employee is 34 years old. I mention this because these truly are family wage jobs. Along with the 20 of us, we subcontract on average 15 small business owners in our community, paying them over $2 million last year. Cotter Tree Farms logs almost exclusively on state land. The proposed HCP will likely destroy our family business. It is in the process, or <laughs> in the process it will not only leave 35 people unemployed, will destroy my father and uncle's retirement as most of our equipment is their retirement and being so long logging specific it won't work in any other industry <laughs> this coincides with the careers of most of our employees myself included the skills we have honed over years of hard work and dedication will pretty well be useless in any other industry likely we will be forced to start at the bottom all over again all politics aside, the government's goal isn't to destroy livelihoods, increase wildfire frequency and severity, or contributing to rising housing costs. We have a lot of middle ground between protecting endangered species and obliterating our current timber harvest. This HCP was a first attempt. Although many of us see this as a failure, I personally hold out hope you will try again and provide more equity for the rural communities and careers that will surely be negatively impacted. Thank, Thank you. you. I want to remind everybody to introduce themselves at the beginning of their testimony. Thank you. Thank you. 
Up next, Joshua. Good morning, board, uh, chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Josh Estes. I'm a third generation pulp and paper worker here today on behalf of the Association of Western Pulp and Paper Workers Union. We represent uh, pulp and paper workers in Washington, Oregon, Virginia, and California, and Idaho. Um, thousands of timber pulp and paper industry jobs are on the line uh, at, before you today with your decisions. I think it's really important to uh, to put a face on the potential collateral damage that well-intentioned policy aims to support, but has a negative effect on. The people in this room represent a, a broad swath of labor, business, community, and their, their jobs are not the only ones on the line. Their families' livelihoods, the future of our children are on the lines with uh, policies like the this draft that came before you. We're, we're really hoping that we can go backwards take a little time to to get this right and not have the 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 plainly obvious uh impact that these decisions will have these these jobs are going away uh we i hear talk about resiliency uh, i hear opening statements from our forester talk about resiliency i don't think there's any more resilient job than the timber pulp and paper industry workers we've been attacked for now generations and we continue to watch our jobs and our livelihoods go away uh, these jobs are three to one multipliers in the pulp and paper industry. Uh, they're often the largest taxpayer in rural communities. When they go away, communities are devastated. You have the opportunity right now to reconsider your position on the draft force plan. I, I encourage you to do that. And I encourage you to think about every one of these jobs that will go away. You, you worry about your finances. What do you think the families are worrying about when they have to wake up day to day and go to work wondering if they have a job the next day? Please, please take the time to get this right. Our lives and our livelihoods are on the line. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are we good? My name is Mike Martin. I am the communications director at the Help Health uh, <clears throat> Clatsop Care Health District. The district was formed over 40 years ago by the community for the community, serving Clatsop County, the North Oregon coast. Clatsop Health District provides one of the only skilled nursing facilities in the area. In addition, Clatsop Care Health District also provides an in-home services, retirement village, and a memory care community. In all, Clatsop Care employs over 150 employees and cares for over 200 local people on a mo monthly basis. This allows residents to stay in the area and care uh, for those uh, close to family, friends, and neighbors, rather than having to go to larger cities for care. You would be hard pressed to find a person that lives in the Clatsop County area that has not had a family member, neighbor, friend, or someone at Clatsop Care's vital services. However, after reviewing the HCP with other community leaders, we would be greatly impacted by the implementation of this plan. Class of Care Health District alone would be affected by approximately a quarter million dollars on an annual basis. As a not-for-profit organization that services this community first, this would mean the difference between getting much needed improvements, technology, equipment, vital communications equipment, and supplies or not getting them at all. Every year we have unexpected events that require additional funds to provide the level of service and community expects. Even with the proper budgeting and financial management, water heaters go out, elevators need to be replaced, lifts and hoists need to be purchased, and technology evolves as we build back to pre-COVID levels of occupancy as well as hiring levels. Our aging population is only growing, and the need for taking care of our seniors and those that need short-term and long-term care will continue to increase, not decrease. We are also one of the only places that accepts Medicare and Medicaid to the level and percentages of our occupancy and, and clients that we do. So our ask is simple. We ask that the HCP please review more closely. And all this deterrence ultimately ends up being distributed critically need services and districts to the school and community. Again, thank you. Thank you. The fourth set to provide testimony will be in the following order. Betsy Johnson, Mark Stanley Jr. Bill Dombrowski, Gwen Teese sharing his time with Sydney Anderson. For the record, my name is Betsy Johnson. 
I'm the former state senator from District 16, including Clatsop and Tillamook counties. I'm here to represent people who don't have the opportunity to speak and will absolutely be affected by your plan. They oppose your plan. I'm gonna ask them to stand. Communities in Northwest Oregon have gone from incredulous to furious over how this HCP is handled, as have I. To call this an open and inclusive process is bureaucratic hogwash. Respectfully, Chair Kelly, where you sit for your meetings doesn't matter. It's how well you listen and react to what you hear. Rural Oregonians do feel this plan is being shoved down their throats. No feedback has been incorporated into the HCP to make it more socially or economically viable for ODF for the affected stakeholders. Devising a plan behind closed doors and then managing the communication process so that people are informed shortly before important decisions are made is not meaningful stakeholder engagement. In Clatsop County, where this HCP will be felt most severely, 87% of the land base is forested and off limits to development. Options for alternative revenues are limited. We need to maintain critical forest sector, sector infrastructure so our rural communities can continue to be places where people can live, work, and raise a family. Talk of decoupling and alternative revenues is disingenuous. It's a cheap cover-up to hide the loss of revenue to local government, schools, law enforcement, public health from your ill-conceived plan. The legislature is managing scarce resources to address housing and homeless. I'd like to point out that this HCP would make it worse. It's going to raise eyebrows in the Capitol if you show up asking for general fund dollars when you haven't even tried to amend the HCP to achieve better financial outcomes. Whose pocket are you going to pick next? Any extra money should be going to seniors, kids, law enforcement, public health, and not subsidizing ODF's mismanagement of the state for us. I hope that you will reconsider this plan, listen carefully to the voices that you're hearing, and change your direction before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, Mark. I am Mark Stanley, Vice President of Bighorn Logging. Our industry is struggling to survive. We have lost six high capacity logging companies in our recent area with their invaluable experience gone forever. My fear is with this new HCP plan, there will be more companies finding themselves financially unstable and unable to stay in business. The timber industry will go extinct and maybe that's your goal. I've lacked confidence in the state of Oregon and the Board of Forestry. Bighorn Logging has 70 employees relying on us to keep them working. So I'm creating a backup plan. We have met with timber companies in other states like Idaho and Washington who need contractors. That would not be my ideal outcome, but I also need to make sure our employees have an opportunity to earn income for their families in a profession they love. We should be building up the next generation of loggers, not setting them up for failure. I also sit on the bank's fire district board of directors. We rely on ODF funding as part of our budget. Go, uh, a fair amount goes towards station maintenance, our intern program, our apparatus, our equipment and personnel work alongside ODF on multiple fires and conflagrations throughout the year. What happens when we don't have the equipment or personnel to help fight them fires? We need to be invested in the future of the fire service, not crippling it. I'm just one person, but I could walk around the block from our office at Bighorn Logging to Hampton Lumber, Banks Fire District, and Bighorn Logging, and that affects hundreds of families in that one block of Banks, Oregon. Show me the numbers the current management plan is failing. I can show you real numbers on the negative effect this will take on rural Oregonians. Oregon should be the leader in timber harvesting. There is not many states you can harvest a tree, cut it down, mill it into lumber, and buy it at your local lumber yard. This is something you guys should be proud of. I've never been very political, but you've got my attention now. Looks like it's time to get political as we grow business in the state of Oregon. And it's a very sad day that we're sitting in front of the Board of Forestry fighting for our industry right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Up next, Bill. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Bill Dombrowski. I'm the president of United Steelworkers Local 1097. I'm a Clops County resident and an employee at the Wana Pulp and Paper Mill. <clears throat> the Cloth Forest benefits greatly from having the pulp mill in the area. The Wana Mill employs 600 United Steel workers annually spending 15 million on fiber and biomass in Clatsop County. Biomass is created from the leftover products, and we burn that in our recovery boiler to provide energy. This energy feeds 15,000 homes in the area. <clears throat> With um, 
<clears throat> the Clatsop County already has a responsible forestry. Clatsop County citizens are <clears throat> creating useful products. We have an abundance of wildlife and we are creating renewable energy. The people that work these jobs in Clatsop County <clears throat> forests also live there and respect the forest. The local wildlife we see every day and the economic and social health of the forest provides our community, including our children's schools, the safety for our kids, pro <clears throat> provided the first responders and other services. <clears throat> Keeping the Wanda Mill pulp mill competitive should be a priority and a responsible for responsible forestry. The pulp mill uses residuals from the local sawmills and makes toilet paper that improves people's lives. In addition, the mild mass left over from the forest <clears throat> forestry, <clears throat> we are able to create renewable energy instead of it being slash burned. Reducing the, this amount from the sawmills, refuse and biomass availability locally only increases the cost of our pulp mill and puts our jobs in jeopardy along with everyone else's. So I ask <clears throat> that you reconsider this. This is a, this forestry plan negatively impacts everybody in our community and our jobs and our livelihood. Thank you. Thank you. Before you begin, Quinn, I'm gonna announce the fifth set. Fifth set begins with Kelsey Olson, He and Soak, Amanda Astor, Rex Lothar. All right, ready for you to begin, Quinn. Good morning, Chair Kelly, State Forest Mukamoto, members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the OSU SAF student chapter's perspective on the state of forestry education in Oregon. My name is Quinn Teese. I'm the OSU SAF student chapter chair. And I'm Sydney Anderson. I am a forest engineering student and member of the OSU SAF student chapter. We are here today representing the members of our student chapter. The members of our chapter come from a diverse background. This includes students from around the country and around the world from different economic backgrounds and educational paths. Each student has a unique reason as to why they chose forestry, ranging from managing resources for future generations, supporting our families and communities, improving forest health, the climate crisis mitigation, and being a part of one of the biggest industries in the state of Oregon. Three concerns our chapter members perceive for the state of forestry in Oregon are how COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic have affected, has affected the education for future foresters, the lack of coordination of forestry programs between state universities and community colleges, and the uncertainty of potential workload posed by the upcoming changes to the Oregon Forest Practices Act put forth by the for Private Forest Accord. Thank you all for your time. Um, please see our complete written statement for more information and we're also available for questions. Thank you. Up next, Kelsey. Good morning, Chair Kelly, State Forestry Mukamoto and members of the board. My name is Kelsey Olson. I'm a junior at Philomath High School and I've been a part of the Forestry Natural Resource Program for the last three years. I'm an officer and the secretary in our forestry natural resource program. This is my fellow officer, Case Ho. I really enjoy being such a huge part of the program and community. It has been the best part of my high school career while also being the most fun and informative class that I've taken. I'm not only learning about forestry and land management in school, but in my day-to-day -day job. In the future, I'm planning on going to college and minoring in agriculture and natural resources. We are learning in our forestry class that active forest management has many benefits from supporting schools and community services in rural families to maintaining clean water and wildlife habitat and providing wood products that we all use every day. I ask that in all of your future decisions, you keep today's youth and future forestry natural resource leaders in mind. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Up next, Kelvin. Good morning, Chair Kelly, State Forester Mukumoto, and members of the board. Welcome to Benton County. My name is Kean Stokes. I've been part of the Forestry Natural Resource Program at Flomond High School for the last three years of my high school career. This is my classmate, Ty May. This program has been the best part of my high school career. It, has able, it is able to give me a new hands-on approach to life. My family's business, Stokes Construction, has been in business for over 50 years in the Flomond area build logging roads and do a little bit of logging and rock crushing. I would like to help the forest industry like my grandfather and my father have. 
without the harvesting of the forest land and proper land management, we risk not having a family business. There are many other small family businesses just like ours. We ask that in making your decision on the conservation of the forest, that you consider our youth and the impact that it will have on our future careers and businesses. Thank you for your time. Up next, Amanda. Good morning, Chair Kelly, State Forester Mokomoto, and members of the board. For the record, my name is Amanda Sullivan Astor. I'm the Forest Policy Manager for Associated Oregon Loggers, which represents about 1,000 small family forest businesses in the state uh, and 23,000 hardworking Oregonians. You've heard a lot of our members today, um, and you've heard from them about the Habitat Conservation Plan. So I'm going to actually focus elsewhere today. Um, the overemphasis of extended rotation ages as the only climate smart forestry practice could perceivably decrease short and midterm fiber supplies and jobs that would otherwise that it would otherwise support. Any decrease in short and midterm work for AOL small business members can lead to layoffs with no guarantee of employee return or worse, the need to sell their equipment or businesses altogether. We rely on stability for our production-based businesses dealing with the global wood fiber commodity market. We want to be a part of solving society's greatest challenges, and we believe we can play a critical role in climate mitigation. But our small businesses must be thoughtfully considered uh, to e ensure irreparable harm and unintended consequences aren't caused in the wake of ideas that simply sound good. Oregon's forests are among the best in the nation at sequestering carbon. The production of our natural and working lands combined with the best in the nation forest pr forestry professionals means Oregon is a leader in natural climate solutions. And thankfully, Oregonians have the option to consume locally. Producing regional fiber to meet the demands of today and the future limits the carbon footprint from overseas transportation and creates domestic jobs in a growing sector. But proposals of long rotation ages in already healthy and thriving stands would create adverse impacts and only minor carbon benefits. In addition, leakage is a very real negative impact of proposed longer rotation ages with less harvest uh, occurs uh, when less harvest occurs locally, it shifts elsewhere to meet global demand. With innovations in tall wood buildings, which you'll hear about later today, and new markets for biomass, America is vying to be at the forefront of climate solutions in the world, and we need to retain our workforce to meet to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Before you begin, Rex, I'll call up the six set. We'll be Rob Ferris, Jeff Levy, Ronnie Daniels, and Ethan Schuster. Rex, please begin. Yeah, my name is Rex Lowther. I'm the executive director for Future Natural Resource Leaders. Uh, we are a statewide or a nonprofit organization that deals with the forestry education in high school. And many of our members are in the audience today. Uh, we've just heard from a few representatives from Philomath High School, Sweet Homes here, and Sio is represented as well. Um, I think it's important to know that, you know, anytime we have a plan um, that is from the state level, from you know a high level, uh, it affects people you know at the lowest level. Um, I look at different you know tax incentives when we tax our um, uh, our corporations, and they pass those taxes back down to us. Um, so, for example, the cat tax. When I go buy a car, um, there's a cat tax line item. So I'm paying that cat tax, even though it was intended to tax corporations. The HCP is the th same thing. You know, we look at this large process, um, protect the environment, but it affects people. It affects the people in this room. Um, it affects the students, um, the future students, uh, the future you know, workers in the industry. So I think it's important that um, as you think about these things and, and think about this program, um, that you are thinking about uh, the people that it will affect, um, the jobs and the, and the future students. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, Rob. Good morning, members of the board. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Robert Ferris Jr., uh, president of Ferris Lumber Company in Lyons, Oregon. We are probably the most uh, public timber dependent company in, in Oregon. We're government contractors and rely on state lands for our continued survival. Uh, I'm uh, I'd like to say that the business community routinely performs due diligence, spending vast amounts of money and time to make the, the correct decisions. The Board of Forestry 
went through an HCP process previously on the Elliott State Forest and ultimately decided it was not the route to take. There's, there's no embarrassment or shame to make the proper decision to end the HCP process and to discontinue management on over half of the Department of Forestry lands. Please scrap the HCP and the forest plans because it fails to meet the original objectives of protecting agency budgets and protecting timber dependent communities. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Up next, Jeff. <coughs> Chair Kelly, members of the board, State Forester Kel. The HCP will rob the state of millions of dollars in timber harvest revenues. This will cost billions more in lost revenue to the ODF, likely bankrupting the ODF in future. The loss in revenue to rural communities that rely on timber revenues will, cat will be catastrophic to the counties, local governments, first responders, community programs, school, and most of our, our children. In fact, three generations will feel the impact. Some of the hard, hardest working people are in the timber industry. Chair Kelly, you said on the 15th emergency meeting that if we lose a mill, we lose a mill. Right there is wrong. No timber industry loss, not one job, sir. Chair Kelly, another thing you said was the timber wars have not have not begun. Well, sir, I'm here to tell you that they've been going on for years and it started with the spotted owl. <clears throat> the cat came out of the bag with the timber harvest levels. The 34% reduction in harvest is not sustainable for all. The very things this HCP is trying to protect will simply burn away as forest service has proven for decades. Wildfire will decimate our state forests. Finally, Chair Kelly and the ODF board go back to the drawing board, scrap this current HCP, bring in those that actually work in the industry, hold special meetings with public comment, and listen to us. Please consider a more balanced approach to our future because our future depends on it. Thank you. Up next, Ronnie. My name is Ronnie Daniels. I'm from Polk County, Route Sheridan Highway 22. I moved to the state 29 years ago, and maybe 30 in July. Chair, you supposed to be the servants. We was cutting four billion, four two billion to four point two billion foot of wood. Okay. Number two, you're down 83% today. Now you want to cut it minus 34%. You got some bullshittery matters to deal with, my friend. We have losing money. The cat tax is hurting these businesses also. Use probably the foresters and everything else. There have been more fires since, since basically 90, 98 to 2002, as the numbers of square footage wood, link, uh, board feet of wood is cut. We have had more fires. As a beekeeper, I rely on them when they go through and clean the forest and new trees come about. But I notice also with my beekeepers up and down the state, our death rate, not just only from the mites and the various other diseases, is gone up substantially. Because if you don't have a clean forest, you don't have a great forest. Now, let's get to the last point. This is the earth. When I was in the Navy 34 years ago, we were eight degrees off. You're down to 32, almost 29 to 32 degrees off. So as you lean, it gets warmer. Let's get the facts of bull sugar out of the way. If you lean the pole back up, we get colder where organs level that. Let's cut through that facts now. And at the same time, you're hurting our kids. You're hurting vocational education, 4-H, FFA, forestry, and everything else. And my money, I'm getting tired. I'm paying $7,500 more in the last two years that y'all don't listen. Y'all keep spending money like you got a paper bum hole. We got to stop it. We got to get fiscally balanced. We need to support our industry on what we're going to do. We're going to get it from China. We will put more everything to come across the Pacific than what we do in these trail logging trucks. May God help you and listen to the people. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Again, appreciate the enthusiasm. Um, yeah. Can we have, so, uh, before we call the next floor, uh, Ethan, go ahead and approach this podium. 
The next seventh set will be Stacy Detweiler, Casey Hawk, Tyler Ernst, Megan Tuttle. Ethan, please begin. Hello, my name is uh, Ethan Schuster. I attend Sweet Home High School. Um, my life is revol revolved around the timber industry and logging, um, whether it be family, work, or my school. Um, through family, my dad owns a log truck business. Um, that's where our family income comes from. He started about like six or seven years ago. And uh, uh, he's taught me everything I know like about logging. And I've been under trucks, grease and trucks since I was 10 years old. Um, whether it comes to school, I go to you know, my school. So uh, we're surrounded by forests and uh, we have a forestry uh, program, everything else. Um, and we learn all about logging there. So, um, and for work, I work at a shop and I'm working on uh, logging equipment and everything else. And I'm just constantly surrounded along uh, around the timber industry. Um, while this does not affect me at all, I'm concerned for schools and families and people that are going to be affected by this plan. Um, while I believe that habitat conservation is super important, I also understand that the forest industry is more important than a bunch of loggers cutting down trees. It provides a career and lifestyle for hundreds of thousands of people. It provides generations worth of knowledge and expertise being passed down to future generations. And coming from a high school student kid out of Sweet Home High School, who this hope hopefully won't affect, it concerns me for future for the future of the industry and everyone who would be affected by the HCP. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, Stacy. Chair Kelly, members of the board and State Forester Mukamoto, thank you for the opportunity to provide public comments today. For the record, my name is Stacy Detweiler and I'm the Oregon Policy Senior Program Manager at the Wild Salmon Center, a nonprofit organization dedicated to conserving wild salmon and steelhead rivers and ecosystems. I wanted to focus my comments today on the private forest accord, particularly as it relates to the 2023 legislative session, and to thank the board and ODF staff for ongoing progress on implementation of the PFA rules and finalization of the private forest accord habitat conservation plan. We provided comments on HB 5020 ODF's budget and support of full funding for the PFA, um, echoing comments made by OFIC and OSWA at the Ways and Means hearing last week. We thank the governor for including full base CSL funding for the PFA in the government's recommended budget and urge full funding of POP 106 under ODF's budget and related POP 105 and ODF and W's budget. Full funding for these POPs that include core programs under the private forest accord, including the SFISH program for small forest land owners to upgrade or replace culverts, adaptive management program and mitigation fund are integral to finalizing a federally approvable private forest accord habitat conservation plan. If an HCP is not finalized and approved by 2027, the private forest accord changes roll back to the previous Oregon Forest Practices Act standards. Additionally, I also wanted to provide comment on the post-disturbance rulemaking. Thanks to ODF staff for making progress on development of the literature review, and we look forward to continuing to work together on this process. We wanted to highlight the tight timelines of this report and rulemaking process if any changes are to be included in the private forest accord habitat conservation plan moving in a parallel process. Any new post-disturbance rulemaking must be consistent with the requirements of the Private Forest Accord report or the approved Private Forest Accord HCP. And the post-disturbance rulemaking must also address desired future conditions specifically related to vegetation retention measures for streams to align with the new Private Forest Accord requirements. I look forward to continue working with the board and staff as we move into the next phase of the PFA. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comment. Thank you. Up next, Casey. Okay, moving on, uh, Tyler Ernst. Well, good morning, Chair Kelly, members of the board. For the record, my name is Tyler Ernst, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Oregon Forest Industries Council. In my brief time this morning, I wanted to raise concerns that OFIC has with item number six on today's agenda. This is now the second time in three meetings that the board has heard a presentation on the putative climate benefits of extended rotation ages. And, and both of these presentations uh, came from individuals and organizations that engage in advocacy towards a desired shared outcome. Uh, now I get it, no one walks into a subject like this as an ideological blank slate. We all 
advocate in one manner or another for what we believe to be the best and most desirable outcome. But as this board considers how to incorporate climate focused considerations into its decision making on public forest management and private forest policy, we believe that it is incumbent on this body to hear from others in the scientific community that have raised serious concerns with many of the assumptions that undergird uh, conclusions drawn by organizations like Sightline. I don't have time this morning to outline all of our concerns uh, with Sightline's materials, um, although I will note two items first. They tend to ignore the negative real world effects that such policies would have on manufacturing, on jobs and the regional supply of sustainable building materials and on certain important metrics of forest health, such as susceptibility to disease and impacts to early cereal species. Second, they ignore or downplay basic components of carbon accounting, such as substitution and leakage, to arrive at a conclusion that overstates the alleged benefits of extended rotation ages. So we would encourage the board to uh, take time um, in coming meetings to listen to others in the scientific community that might be able to provide a, a counterbalance and, and raise some of these issues. Um, and uh, we would be happy to provide any recommendations for who might be tapped to provide this information. Thank you for your time. Up next, Megan. Okay, well, since Megan's not present, I'll go ahead and move on to the virtual testimony. We may include some folks from the waiting list who showed up in person after the virtual testimony is completed. Thank you for waiting online. We'll be we'll be doing this in this order. Jen Hamaker, Nathan Jepson, Jay Browning, Joseph Uren, Joe Liebowitz. Up first, Jen Hamaker. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? If you can Hello? speak a little louder. Okay, can okay. you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, am I on? Am I on this video thing? No. <laughs> we okay. can see the room. Yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. Well, good morning. My name is Jen Hamaker. I'm the president of Oregon Natural Resource Industries. I wish that you guys could turn the camera around and show the massive amount of people that are standing. Uh, filling up the room there. It is uh, speaks volumes. Um, I wanted to say thank you, Betsy. 100% agree with you. I was, a, I was a third generation Timberland owner. I was a third generation Timberland owner. I'm going to tell you a little story. A little boy who was born in Texas saw his mom die, get belly shot, die right in front of him. Lived in an orphanage until his dad's mechanic shop burned to the ground and he couldn't uh, pay the orphanage to care for him and his brothers anymore. He was moved up to Toledo, Oregon with his uncle, and he lived with his uncle and his 13 boys. Um, and this is where he fell in love with the woods. This is where he fell in love with nature. It became his sanctuary, his quiet place. He fell in love uh, when he grew up. He fell in love with a woman whose father milled lumber in the woods up by Triangle Lake. She drove the log trucks. Dad milled the wood. He learned how to mill the wood. After the war, he decided to seize the opportunity when the federal government opened up the forest for two reasons. Number one, to put men back to work after the war, and number two, uh, to build houses for the families that were popping up after the war. I'm talking about my grandpa. My grandpa was Aaron Jones. He was the owner and founder of Seneca Sawmill, company and, and family of companies. He built the most technologically advanced mill in the world. He was an innovative sawmill owner. He loved the woods. He loved nature. He taught me the same and to respect it and to honor it. He was an icon, not only because he was a great timberman, but because, am I done? But because he, uh, because he was known for uh, setting the standard of nurturing and caring for the forest. He was a true steward. He was a true boots on the ground environmentalist. Thank I, need you, to tell you, I need to tell you one thing. We sold Seneca because of what we saw happening in the state of Oregon. Our timberlands are being shut down. 
We've sold Seneca in part because of exactly what this HCP is going to continue to do. Please do not make this the same fate to the rest of these mills, Stempson, Hampton, Freres, all these men and women, all these kids in, in your audience. Please do not make the same mistake. Do not give them the same fate as we had. Please. Jen, thank you very much. Up next, we have Nathan. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yes. Thank you, Chair Kelly and board members for allowing me the opportunity to provide comment today. For the record, my name is Nathan Jepson. I'm the president and CEO at NWH, and I'm speaking today to voice concerns about the proposed HCP. NWH, formerly Northwest Hardwoods, was founded in Oregon in 1967 and has become the leading manufacturer and supplier of hardwood lumber to North America, Europe, and Asia. The company operates over 40 manufacturing and warehousing facilities across the United States, including sawmills, concentration yards, and distribution facilities. These facilities include our two Oregon sawmill locations in Eugene and Garibaldi, employing over 100 employees. NWH purchases timber directly from ODF, but we mostly acquire alder from ODF timber, which has been previously purchased by local softwood mills. If the softwood mills can't purchase sufficient volume, this will negatively impact our log supply and will put our business and jobs in Oregon at risk. We currently must supply wood from a wide geographic area, including Northern California to the Columbia River to adequately supply our mills today with the current ODF harvest levels. The proposed reduced harvest volumes from the HCP are alarming to say the least. We were disappointed that the board voted against the motion to direct staff to draft alternative HCP proposals with the goal of increasing harvest levels while still meeting conservation goals and supporting local communities. This is something we believe is still possible and very doable in a timely manner. The reason which was given not to pass the motion during the special board meeting on February 15th was that pursuing an alternative HCP could potentially set the whole thing back two years. In our view, this is not a sufficient reason to push forward an inadequate plan that will significantly impact the state forest for the next seven decades, a 70 year plan. There should not be a rush to make this decision until it's thoroughly reviewed against viable alternative options. Our local environment, our forests, our economy, and our employees deserve more effort and consideration from you. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, Jay Browning. Jay Browning, if you're able to share your screen. Um, can you oh. see me? I can't see you, but we can hear you, so. Okay. okay. My name is Jay Browning. I'm the owner of J.M. Browning Logging. I've been in the woods for 52 years as a logger. Uh, I've been in business for 42 years. Started getting involved in state timber sales 40 years ago, bought some salvage sales and I, I did some tree farm work, but state timber sales are 90% of our work for the last 25 years. When a sale comes up, we're bidding against other contractors, usually seven or eight of us for turning in prices to six or seven timber companies. It's very competitive. Um, a reduction in the cut could possibly be the end of my company or others. Um, I plan on my company running for another 40 years with the next generation. Uh, our equipment is designed at just working on the state timber sales. You have bigger timber, longer yarding distances, and we have big equipment that won't work on private tree farms. I've invested millions of dollars and gone millions of dollars into debt for low emission, low carbon emission trucks, equipment. We've, we've uh, replaced all, almost all our log trucks with low carbon emissions. We, um, we only have 11 trucks, used to have 40, but um, last year we paid $108,000 in road use tax, licensing and permits, $23,800, cat tax, $55,847. It, it's tough to do business in Oregon. I feel that Oregon uh, is not business, not small business friendly. 
That was a quick two minutes. <laughs> it is. Thank you, Jay. If you'd like to provide a closing statement, we can move on to the next one. Yeah. Close. Oh, um, you know, we, we've we uh, invested hundreds of millions of dollars into Oregon over the last 42 years, uh, providing good jobs, benefits, everything. Uh, let's not lose sight of, of companies like ours that are the backbone of our rural, rural counties. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Joseph. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to provide public comment. My name is Joseph Yorn. I represent Audubon Society of Lincoln City and Salem Audubon Society. In previous testimony and comments, we have made our position on the proposed HCP clear. We support a strong HCP as a critical compromise necessary to preserve wildlife and timber revenue. <clears throat> Excuse me, but today I speak for myself as an Oregon citizen. I want to say thank you, board members, all of you, for your dedication and commitment in the service of our public lands. Last month's difficult 4 3 vote was hard to watch. I'm sure it was agonizing for all of you. Thank you for providing such a meaningful example of how it is possible to disagree without being disagreeable. I also want to thank and commend the State Forest Division of ODF. I was a public school principal for 20 years at every level from primary to middle to high school. Over those years, I dealt with more controversy than I care to remember. When I say I know how difficult it is to work through hard decisions, I mean, I really know. I know how hard it is to maintain a professional attitude and demeanor when opponents feel no obligation to do the same. Our ODF staff has seen this in spades. I know how frustrating it is to confine your position to science and facts in an atmosphere thick with omissions, false claims, misrepresentations, and speculative hyperbole. Again, ODF continues to work under extremely difficult circumstances. And I know how hard it is to communicate that you have listened, considered alternatives, weighed options, and then landed on a decision that opponents disagree with. Again, I wanna thank you for this opportunity. I hope you and ODF staff can all continue to find the strength and peace of mind needed to continue serving all Oregonians. Thank you. Thank you, up next, Joe. Can you hear me? Yes. Chair Kelly and members of the Board of Forestry, my name is Joe Levisite, Statewide Conservation Director for Portland Audubon. I'm testifying today on behalf of our over 16,000 members across the state, and I urge you to move forward with the state forest HCP process without delay. The best way to ensure that our state forests can become viable habitats once more, balanced with responsible extraction of timber, is through an HCP process that has been years in the making. Please don't be swayed by timber interests that seek to maximize their profits at the expense of counties that will remain at the vagaries of a fluctuating timber market to support their essential services. We need a new model for supporting rural counties that diversifies support beyond timber revenue. With dwindling state forests left as quote unquote complex mature habitat, which is currently at about 10%, these ecosystems have lost significant functionality and increasing fire risk, forest insect and disease outbreaks and other climate related impacts will only increase in years to come. Over the past decades, the documented population declines of iconic endangered species like the Northern Spotted Owl and Marbled Merlet should be fair warning. The most recent Northern Spotted Owl meta-analysis conducted by Franklin et al. in 2021 assessed population trend using a 26 year data set and documented steady annual declines of up to 9%, leaving the conclusion that their populations face the real threat of extirpation throughout the range. In state forests, it's clear that decades of unsustainable timber harvest resulting in vast Habitat degradation and fragmentation is why there are so few spotted owls and why barred owls are moving in. When wildlife and fish populations are in trouble, we know that is a red flag warning for the risks we are placing on the people that live in these communities as well. Please move forward with the State Forest HCP. Thank you for all your work so far on this. Thank you, Joe. Uh, we do have time for uh, two more. Uh, so if we could have Blake Manley and Van Decker, if they're in the room, to proceed to the back. 
Uh, up first is Blake. Thank you. Uh, my name is Blake Manley. Uh, I'm president of the Natural Resources Educators Association, uh, also the teacher of these fine young people that sit in front of you from Sweet Home High School. And I'm the creator of Manly Jobs, uh, the nationwide YouTube channel focusing on real life jobs. Uh, my students are concerned. We had this conversation this week and they're concerned because this looks a whole lot, this HCP looks a whole lot like uh, the national forests of the 90s and the 80s. It looks a whole lot like that. Whether or not we want to call it that or not, looks like that. They're concerned because this is their livelihoods. This is what they want to do. Like, the, guys, stand up. Holy cow. They don't have to be here. None, not one single kid in this room from Sweet Home has to be here. I didn't coerce them. I didn't say, you know, this is on your grade. They want to be here because they're concerned. Uh, they're concerned because uh, a fragile budget, which was said in the opening comments, means where does that money come from? Well, we'll reallocate to it. Okay, what's that mean? That means it comes from somewhere else, right? Uh, who gets affected by this the most? In this room right now, who's going to be affected most by this HCP? It ain't me. It's not any of the people at the board. It's not anybody sitting in the stands. The ones standing up, they're the youngest in this group. They'll be affected by this for the most amount of time. And if I look around, I'm seeing ones that don't agree with the current model. They love to hunt and fish. We talk about it all the time. I have to have, yell at them to put their phones away as they're trying to show me the latest thing they've fished and hunted and took pictures of because they love that. So they're not against habitat. They're not against conservation, but they're against this current model of the HCP. So in closing, I just want you to, to take it affect these young people. It's going to affect them the most as you move forward. Look at their faces and promise me that you're not going to do something that's going to affect them for the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before Van comes up, we did have one more. Apologies. Uh, Grace Brailer. So we'll close out with her. Van Decker up next. Van Decker going three times. Okay. Uh, up next is Grace Brailer. Chair Kelly, State Forester Mukamoto, members of the board, um, thank you so much for squeezing me in today. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Grace Brailer. I am the Wildlands Director for Cascadia Wildlands. We are a 25-year-old nonprofit conservation organization that works to, to defend and restore the Cascadia bioregion's wild ecosystems. We have over 12,000 members and supporters across the country, so many of whom live in, work in, and retreat to Oregon's cherished state forests. Collectively, we envision vast, mature, and old growth forests, a stable climate, rivers full of wild salmon, and a vibrant, diverse community sustained by the unique landscapes of Cascadia. That vision is why we continually come to express our support for a strong habitat conservation plan for Western Oregon State Forests. For decades, timber corporations in Oregon have benefited from tax cuts that have devastated local budgets by billions, thus unjustly and unfairly pitting the protection of essential remaining habitat for imperiled species against basic government services. The habitat protections and harvest levels outlined in the HCP would apply to public lands that are to be managed for the benefit of all Oregonians, not just a certain subsection of Oregonians, to bring the department into compliance with the Federal Endangered Species Act. The HCP provides the department with regulatory certainty, thus guaranteeing that logging can continue into the future. The status quo of take avoidance and mass timber extraction has not worked. Please don't kick the can down the road to future generations who are inheriting a climate and biodiversity crisis that they took no part in contributing to. Please take the comprehensive approach now to conserve what habitat still remains. The costs of inaction are far more dire and far more costly. Please move forward with an HCP for Western Oregon State Forests that is at least as strong as Conservation Alternative 3. Thank you again dearly for um, all the work that is going into this and for accommodating all of these comments today and squeezing me in at the last minute. I appreciate it greatly. Testimony providers, we appreciate your participation for those 
online. We ask uh, that you just remain muted and disengage your video, but you're feel free to stay in the meeting. Chair Kelly, State Forest from Okamoto, and members of the board, this concludes our public testimony portion. I would want to congratulate you all for this exercise in free speech. Um, and I was I was deeply impressed by all the testimony. I was uh, deeply impressed by the fact that uh, almost without exception, uh, you didn't go over the allotted time. And that's just a real symbol of, of the respect that that you obviously have for each other. Um, you know, and, and I will not uh, debate what anybody says. I will debate when someone claims that I have said something that I haven't said. I have never said, if we lose a mill, we lose a mill. Uh, and since that was stated, I want to go on the record that that's not true. Um, and uh, the other thing I'd just like to call out is uh, Betsy Johnson. Betsy, um, you can come beat up on us uh, whenever you want. It's great to hear you. You've always been a great leader for... Um, uh, for uh, representing uh, rural uh, Oregon, and uh, and it's great to hear your voice again. So, and and we really appreciate all the service that you have given through many years uh, to the state of Oregon. With that, um, we are not scheduled to have a bathroom break until uh, ten thirty, and since we started out at seven thirty, uh, we are really going to be just a, a little bit behind schedule. But I think we should. Um, uh, stop here um, for a, um, let's say, a 10 minute, 11 minute. Um, so if we uh, return here at uh, 915. 915. Yes. All right. Uh, with that, we're adjourned for 10 minutes. Thank you.
Recording in progress.
Welcome back, everyone. We're going to move to the next. Uh, well, just a minute before we move to the next item on the agenda, um, my fellow board member Carla suggested that after all that testimony, we might want to take ourselves just a few more minutes behind schedule and uh, have board, any board members who, who would like to comment on the testimony have an opportunity to do so. I see you, Joe Justice, down there. Joe, go right ahead. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Um, thanks. This is great. I, I think, you know, Jim, we're accomplishing what we wanted to do coming out with these meetings, um, hearing from, you know, different Oregonians and their perspectives. And this is, to me, as a board member, extremely valuable. I, I you know, it's, uh, I know it takes time, but this is part of the, you know, part of the political process. And and I, I just want to point, I really thank Blake Manley for bringing his, bringing his students. You know, Blake's a Northeast Oregon native, and uh, I've known Blake for a long time. His dad logged for me and um, bringing students and giving that kind of perspective and, and also having these students here to see this. I mean, this is how, you know, we make decisions in government um, as part of the executive branch that we, you know, are here working uh, for Oregonians. And I think it's real valuable for you to see, you know, this happen and also get, get the perspective from students. So thank you, Blank. I appreciate it. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. okay. Um, so I'm Carla Chambers, I just want to thank everybody that showed up this morning. Um, it's just, you know, I really, I grew up in rural Oregon, um, and I've spent my entire career in natural resources. And I always really value those people that have dirt under their fingernails and are out, you know, really working in the woods and on these farms. And, you know, we, we certainly know who helps put these fires out and, I, I just can't thank you enough. I also want to thank the Clatsop County Sheriff for showing up this morning. Um, I just ask him, would you stand up, uh, sir? I thank you. Uh, I asked him how the HCP would impact his budget. And I think you said 1.2, 1.1 1. 1 million and how many positions? 1.4 million and how many positions? At least 12. And, um, you know, I just appreciate the testimony from rural Oregonians on how this would really impact your economies and forestry plays such a key role in Oregon's economy. We know that. Um, and it would take an awful lot of dollars to backfill this discussion. And that's why I brought up, you know, the, the Department of Forestry's finances have the same exact problem as rural economies finances when it comes to this discussion. We're very dependent on this revenue. So thank you for being here today. And um, we know that we need some fixes to this HCP and we, we appreciate hearing all these voices. Ben Doimling. Um, ben Doimling for the record. Um, I just wanna say thank you to everybody for this testimony. I, I hear you. Um, I hear you loud and clear, and I, I don't disagree with the issues that have been raised in general today. They're very real issues, and this is really important stuff. And I 100%, and I, I think I speak for all of us, but I'll speak for myself, that that we hear you loud and clear. Um, and I think while there might be disagreement on what the solutions are, I think there I don't think there's any disagreement on the work that we have ahead of us and the importance of this work. So... Um, Thank you all for, for being here today. I really, really appreciate it. Brenda. Yeah, thank you all for showing up today and testifying. I really appreciate it. Um, I think I can understand how you feel. Uh, my father uh, was had a dairy farm that I grew up on. And when I was five years old, I sat next to the milk room and watched all those cows get loaded on a truck because the farm went under. He couldn't make it work. And so I understand the anxiety that comes with not knowing what the next job's gonna look like or, or how change might happen and, and, and affect people's lives. So um, I'm sorry that you feel the anxiety that you do. I think I understand it to some degree. Um, and we need to think about a way forward here that is going to truly balance the protection of species that have been under threat for a long time 
And now we need to try to find a way to try to protect them while at the same time ensuring that we continue to cut trees, to go to mills and pay people to work in the forest. Liz. Thanks. Liz Akpawa, um, board member. Um, I just uh, want to thank that next generation for y'all coming here and um, and being part of a democratic process. So I wanna thank you for that. And I hope that continues through your lifetimes on things that move you, which this obviously does. And then just um, my appreciation for everyone who's here and those who are able to testify within our timeframe for both your passion that we heard and your professionalism in a democratic process. So thank you for that. Oh, Chandra. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we're a little bungled up here. Um, uh, yeah, I would like to express my appreciation as well for everybody who showed up today and, and really the, the really thoughtful tone and comments and the way that you approached this board. I know that um, there's temptation to, um, be more aggressive, right? And maybe even more personal with the folks up here. Um, but I thought there was a real mm -hmm. respect in the tone um, that you all brought here today. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, and just the acknowledgement by many of you that, you know, this this board is trying to find a balance. And I, I think you all acknowledge that. I think you recognize that we're trying to find that and you're trying to find that. And it's, it's not an easy space to be in. Um, you know, if you folks were, in Seaside, we had a whole bunch of folks, a whole bunch of public testimony. And, and I'll apologize, I was virtual that way. So I don't know if they were in the room or they were virtually, right? But they were there saying, hey, you need to be doing a stronger HCP for the environment. There are jobs and industries that rely on these species that are dwindling, right? Fishing, recreation, all of those things, right? And those folks are in the room and they're passionate and they had generations of folks before them that were in the fishing industry. And so it's it's this balance between, you know, all Oregonians value these things um, and we do too. And I just, I really appreciate that you recognize that that's complex and we have to hear from you and, and we're hearing from everybody as well. And we're trying to find that pathway forward. And to the extent that there are conversations going on or available also about alternative pathways, I hope that you will partake in those if you have um, an opportunity to. And um, finally, I'm sorry, I'm taking longer again, but I would like to thank the students for being here too. Um, I have four kids at home um, who are also really interested in natural resources and want to have a career in that space. And so it's really important that you're here um, and you're learning about the issues that are facing um, well, all Oregonians, but particularly you. So thank you for being part of this process. Well, you can see that this board is um, not a shy bunch. Give them an opportunity to, to comment and they all jump at it. Um, and with that, we will move on to the next uh, item, which is the uh, Forest Protection Association overview. And I will hand this over to ODF staff. Good morning, Chair Kelly, State Forester Mukamoto, members of the board. For the record, my name is Tim Holschbach. I serve as the Deputy Chief of Policy and Planning with the Protection Division at the Oregon Department of Forestry. Uh, today is uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce the uh, district managers of our uh, Forest Protective Associations within the state of Oregon. Uh, Forest Protective Associations were the, are the original wildfire suppression organizations in the state with over 100 years of history of of suppressing fires and applying forest law within their uh, jurisdictional boundaries. The purpose of this agenda item is to provide the board with an overview of the history of the Forest Protective Associations and their relationship with ODF and the Board of Forestry. I'd like to introduce uh, Pat Scripp, who's the uh, District Manager for Douglas Forest Protective Association, Mike Robeson, who's the District Manager of Coos Forest Protective Association, R.D. Buell, who's the District Manager of Walker Range Forest Protective Association, the Forest Protective Association district managers will be providing a pr presentation describing their unique relationship and their roles and responsibilities of their associations. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to these three gentlemen. Good morning, uh, Chair Kelly, members of the board, uh, State Forester Mukamoto. 
Um, again, for the record, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Pat Scripp. I am the district manager for the Douglas Forest Protective Association out of Roseburg, Oregon. Um, just a brief history, as Tim mentioned, you know, we've had over a hundred year history of working with the Department of Forestry. We probably share more DNA with the department than not. And the protection division can find its roots in the association model where we have a seat or where landowners have a seat at the table and a voice is heard and we bring to bear that resource to fight fire with us. And that is still true in today's model. As many of you may know, having fire protection on your forest lands is mandated by Oregon law. The, uh, and uh, one of those ways landowners could do that is that there's three ways. They could pay a fire patrol assessment to the Department of Forestry. They could have a, a fire plan approved by the board, or they could be a member in good standing of a, a protective association that meets the standards of the board. Our organizations have grown over the years. Today, we protect, uh, the three associations here today, protect 3.4 million acres of forest land in Oregon. Kind of put that into scale, that's 21% of the 16 million acres under ODF's jurisdiction. Our mission is simple, is to kill fire, and per, either through aggressive uh, fire suppression or prevention activities. We, we dovetail into what we call the complete and coordinated system. These are anchored in law, uh, and our priorities are life, resources, and property. Mike? Thanks, Pat. Uh, good morning, Board of Forestry Chair Kelly. Thank you for the great time and great. Organized. If you've ever tried to organize three old guys for this, her job well done, Hillary. Thank you. And also, I would like to say a shout out to the students in the crowd here. Thank you very much for showing up. And I have applications if you need a job. <laughs> Coos Bay, Oregon. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, I'll get him. I'll get him the online app. Uh, so, with that, I uh, my name is Mike Robinson. I'm uh, the district manager for CFPA Coos Force Protective Association out of out of Coos Bay, Oregon, uh, and also a beaver. So, uh, this this for me is my uh, 48th fire season, and it's going to be my last. So. I've had a long, enjoyable career with uh, with the with the associates. I started in at DFPA. Uh, I never worked at Walker Range. I've been to Walker Range on fires. And oh, by the way, we saved RD for last because he's our he's our killer of the speaker. Here, so, <laughs> so uh, but anyway, this is we've been doing this a long time. And, and just to give you guys the introduction, kind of putting a face to who we are, uh, we have a long-standing associate agreement with ODF. And we work through the, the details of that agreement from time to time. And we're getting ready to do that again with Tim and, and staff. So we just wanted you to see who we were and what we do and, and a little bit of our passions. And so we, we run as a, as a standalone business. We're a private nonprofit corporation and uh, in, in the state of Oregon recognized. Um, we have our own CPAs. We have our own accountants. We do our own accounts receivable payable. We do our own payroll. We do our own health insurance. Our retirement plan is our own standalone. Uh, so we we run as a, as a, a business. We do our bills monthly, just like a normal private business would do. So we take pride in that, and we 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 feel that we're rather engaged uh, in our daily work with ourselves and the DNA that we share with ODF. So we take pride in that. As Pat mentioned, we do get our authority from. ORS 477. So I, as a, as a state fire warden, I was appointed, I, I've been around since Ed Schroeder. Uh, and Ed Schroeder, State Forester Schroeder, one time told me, he said, if you want to stay in acting with association, you better be a damn good fireman. And so I, I took that to heart. So uh, for my career, that's what we have, we have always focused on. And for, for your information, the associations are fire centric. We, that is all we do. We, we, uh, we we work side by side with ODF at our district office with forest practices and state lands. Obviously, uh, we've been involved greatly with the LA State Forest and out of CFPA. 
Uh, but that is our business. We get up every morning wondering what we're going to do to better what we do for our landowners and our communities. And uh, in the wintertime, we work through budgets. In the, in the springtime, we work with kids and, and fire prevention. And, and uh, in the summer, every day is firefighting from daylight to dark and 24-7. And that's what we do. So it, it gives us a little edge over our, our brethren at ODF, our, our district forcers. And we, we do jab them occasionally that, oh, we just have, we're worrying about fire. That's what we do. So we like that. That's our passion. <clears throat> So um, the other thing that we pride ourselves in is we, 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 we think we're fairly nimble and creative and innovative. Um, we solve problems uh, immediately. I, uh, I don't envy your process that you have to go through to, to solve problems. We, 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 we're more nimble, we're more, we're more flexible, and uh, we're able to uh, make decisions that help our employees it helps us manage risk. Uh, for example, we know that uh, about 90% of fire fatalities are related around driving. So we figured out that that's probably a good thing for us to try to manage is how long our firefighters are on the lines. And uh, we put in a, what we call a driving matrix that if they've been out for so long, they got they got take they can't drive. So we we don't want them on the road. So it's a simple thing, but it's a process of managing that risk and dealing dealing with the employees and making a place for family wage jobs. So uh, we probably some of the toughest leadership I've ever had was uh, going through COVID. Uh, I mean, I've been a leader for a long time, and that was the unknown, right? We, it was the fear of the unknown and the ability for us to work and build something to take care of our employees. And then we reached out and helped ODF also to build policy and procedures on how to deal with COVID. So we, we think we're pretty good at innovation and being creative. Uh, we, we started the first detection cameras in the state of Oregon, uh, started on one of my lookouts in DFPA's uh, uh, out of their center. So we think we're, we're pretty good at doing that. So, and we also, uh, as well as our, our state districts around us, we, we really get into our communities. And we, we're on RFD boards where um, we coach basketball. Uh, we referee basketball. I've refereed for 25 years. I've been up at the Beavers and ref, ref basketball and um, we teach students at schools again to the students that will get you that app later. Uh, so we're we're building a forestry program in our our high schools that so that gives the spurs the interest of our youngsters to come into our into our workforce. So uh, we pride ourselves on having long term employees. I mean, we won't say how many years we've all worked together, but probably we'd have to get the calculator out to do that. So. Uh, and just finishing up before we give it, oh, before I turn it over to RD, uh, a couple other things, and I'll go kind of script is uh, we're our signers on the master agreement in Oregon with the Forest Service. The associations are that that is very unique and it's very bothersome to our federal partners uh, because we we can bring healthy tension to conversations. And sometimes healthy tension is good for decision making. And so we have the ability to do that. And it also allows us to stand, stand with the Forest Service, our federal partners, when we have large fire on the landscape. Biscuit fire for me, uh, a third of DFPA's district has been burned over since 13. Uh, Walker Range is heavily involved with our federal partners. So it's, it's a must that we stay in, in, in tune with, the, with our federal partners and stay signers on the master agreement. So. If I may ask, the master agreement is so key to us uh, adding capacity to the department. Where we enter into cost, it gives us the ability to enter into cost shares with our federal partners. It allows us to be a signer to the Western Oregon operating plan with the BLM. You know, we want full alignment and be able to um, relieve tension in the system. In 2020, the Archie fire, uh, there were no state teams available. There was no Salem staff. It was three days before we got a call from Salem saying, how are you doing down there? Uh, I just realized you have 100,000 acres burning. They were overwhelmed, the system was. But that tool of being a signer to the master agreement 
allowed us to engage and go into unified command with a federal uh, outer region team and given some local uh, direction and capacity there. I'm off, man. Okay. I'm RD Buell. I'm the district manager for Walker Range Fire Patrol in Gilcrest, Oregon. I guess that's home of the Gilcrest State Forest, folks. So that's one way to look at it. Okay. I want to talk about associations being a valued cooperator with the complete and coordinated fire protection system in the state. You know, the association employees stay very involved within the state system with ODF by being on the safety committees statewide, GO board, IMTs, uh, fire finance, industrial fire prevention work groups. I mean, and then the master agreement, we work with that. You know, our employees, between all the three associations stay involved with the ODF all the time, okay? And then we fire, you know, we put people on what we call the, the IMTs, which is our incident management teams in the state, which have three of them. And we stay involved in that. I mean, Coos, Douglas, Walker Range, we supply incident commanders, division supervisors, fire information, so that we, we help to benefit the fire protection, firefighting organizations within the state under the IMTs, okay? You know, and then our training that has gone through with a lot of our association employees, they have moved on into the state organizations as district foresters, Area directors, unit foresters, you know, staff positions in Salem. You know, at Walker Range, you know, we're pretty much surrounded by federal ownerships. So a lot of our employees have gone over to the federal side. Okay. Which is fine. Okay. It makes things work better. Okay. Remembering that the associations are really a landowner and shareholders are our landowners, okay? So that we do a lot of training, all three of us do a lot of training to get our industrial fire, fire, firefighting crews up and trained every year so that we can use them on fires. And it takes a lot of time, but right now, you know, within Coos and Douglas, they got 60% of the certified local resource bosses have been trained through them in the last years or so. You know, we do a lot of work with the legislators, county level, trying to help them out and direct them in what's going on with the fires. It just takes time and we're a landowner based community oriented associations. Okay. You know, and then we work real hard, all three of us, keeping our employees employed. Okay. It is hard to find people that want to move to Gilcrest, Oregon. Okay. If, I don't know how many of you have been there, but there's not much there. Okay. So, you know, you want to keep your employees that you have. You want to keep them employed year round. Same way with Douglas and Coos. You know, they've been doing a lot of what we co op call co op work projects. Okay. That is to keep our employees employed at least year round, trying to. Okay. Look at Douglas right now. They've been, they hold 17 million seedlings for landowners and supplied 16 tree planting inspectors down in the Douglas country, okay? Between the three of us, we run a ODOT fire and ice program, which we take a lot of our 
seasonal employees go still stay employees at Walker Range, go over to ODOT in the winter and run their snow plows. It's good for them. It's good for us. They work year round. ODOT gets the same people. Don't have to do all the training. We get the same people back every year. So, you know, the biggest thing is, is the associations are community orientated associations. We deal with our employees, with the communities, the counties and the states. And we take pride, all of us, that we can do that. Okay. You might okay, we're gonna get it wrapped up here. You know, I know we you guys have a long day. So uh what are so one of the things that motivates us or motivates me is uh things that I fear. <laughs> so I try to understand what what I fear and how to because I like to be in control of things. Um, my staff would tell you that. Uh so I we have things that are almost out of our control. Uh, rising insurance costs are just, we have been dealing with this as a private company, as all private companies are. And when you put the word fire in in your title, uh, all of a sudden they, the eyebrows go up. They think you're in Southern California and you're on CNN headline news every six o'clock. So we, we're trying to work our way through that. We just took a 500% increase in insurance. So that is things that are a little out of our control. Yet I try to I challenge myself and and all of us do in trying to say we don't accept that. We want to see something different. We want to get with underwriters. We want to figure this out. So those are that's one of those fearful things that we're working through. Um, we all we we talk about the sustainability of the current fire model that we have. Uh, how we how we support that the value of the resources on the landscape, how much money can they can we charge landowners in order to provide the great service that we do. Um, I think we need to draw a line between adequate level of protection and the support that Salem uh, gives the entire state. A lot of that cost is coming to the districts and it's becoming hard for us to support the additional costs that are coming out the districts. The districts need to be an adequate level of protection. That's by law, that's what we do. And some of these unforeseen costs, pass-through costs, are, are making it a real challenge for us to get 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 things going. Uh, it's always interesting. One of our fears, or one just an interesting dynamic, is the legislative group and 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 watching them work and and where we land, where we end up, and uh, and 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 fortunately and 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 rightfully so, the firefighting community gets a lot of respect. Uh, they do a lot of hard work, and uh, it, in the end, most of the time we have we we get the support that we need. It, it doesn't come without work, though, right, Cal? It's tough work. Um, we were uh, some of the delays that we see, some of the challenges. Uh, uh, we're we're cash cash flow business. Cash is king for us. If we have delays in revenue streams that are that that are part of our budget coming to us, it it puts us in a bind. Uh, so that is something that we're working closely with fire protection staff and 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 Cal's helping us to make sure that we're efficient in receiving the, the revenue streams we need uh, that are part of our budget. Uh, we we are in the same boat on the large fire cost that everybody else is in trying, you know, we're waiting for money from 2017 uh, FEMA, FEMA related dollars. So that's a challenge for us. We get that. Um, yeah, and and then just uh, uh, one of our other, uh, I think we're getting into a better place with our BLM partners in Western Oregon. I, I think we are. I, I feel like we're gaining ground there. And uh, but it's not going to be any easier funding Western Oregon firefighting as costs continue to go up. So those are some of the fears that motivate me to get out of bed and put on my shoes and go to work and and to deal with all the, the good people that I work with. Pat. So just a couple other things that, you know, keep me up at night, things that I have no control over or feel like I'm losing control over are the large fires on landscape on our federal uh, partners. Those are huge taxing events. And you know, we watched our neighbor, we share a common border of like 430 miles with the Umpqua National Forest. And we've watched them have teams on their forest for over 100 days, keeping that pace and scale with them 
is just exhausting. And I worry about my staff. Um, I worry about ODF staff. You know, these are dedicated uh, professionals to their vocation. I have managers that put in over 400 hours in the month of August annually for the last 10 years. Um, we have a large amount of our landscape that has been altered and not reset or pre-treated for the next fire. It's a checkerboard ownership of O and C, and it's a challenge. There's huge safety concerns that are out of our control. The only, the only way to mitigate those risks is to continue adding capacity uh, aviation-wise, and that's expensive. You know, the uh, the other one is a lot of uncertainty in, in the fire model, uh, how Oregon is structured, and that question of where do the associations fit in. I think we have a proven model. We're very accountable and uh, always look to improve. So what motivates us? You know, we want to be an advocate for the land and the landowners that we serve. We recognize when we say life, resources, and property, that timber on those hills is, is real property, you know, and our communities. In 2020, that is the largest natural disaster Oregon seen with over 4,000 structures lost. So we are preparing, you know, for this era of fire. Um, what motivates me also is a sense of duty uh, and the fear of failing where our predecessors uh, succeeded or even excelled. It is a new day, new challenges, and I want to thank you all for your time and the time that you've given us and uh, provide an opportunity for if you have any questions for us. I've got one question. Um, since you guys brought the subject up of retirement, how's your leadership bench looking for uh, as you face those transitions? Well, I could say, Douglas, we have a pretty young uh, core staff. We lost one of our managers to uh, the Department of Forestry moving to Southwest Oregon. Uh, good for him, bad for us. But we have a great team um, underneath me and uh, our successional management is strong. It's that next generation below them that it's the challenge mm -hmm. to find that bridge. And RD spoke about the co-op work program. Really, that's a employee retention program. This is a vocation, a craft. They need time to practice it. And every year we get a return. Applications available at DFEA. Hey, hey. And it, ours is a pathway to other careers, too. Um, that, uh, you know, we that's where we... We need to keep them engaged and show them a, a pathway to a career in the fire service and wildland. And and uh, Chair Kelly, we we've uh, just to add on to that. We've we've added a, uh, some capacity based on Senate Bill Seven Sixty Two uh, that retains some of our our core middle uh, the family guys and gals that have the young families. Those are the ones that I'm interested in keeping around for the long haul, right? I've got good managers, the CPAs and stuff that have 10 years left, but I got really good people that have 15, 20, 30 years left. Okay. So that that we keep our eye on that. My job is not, an, this job is not an easy one to fill. You just, you know, may, we usually fill them from within, but uh, you got to have passion. You got to have drive. You got to be a leader. You got to understand fire. You got to know a little bit about uh, some soft skills on communicating. And so it, it's a it's a tough one well, to feel the and all of them are vocational. And our jobs are very instinctive. Mm -hmm. you, if you don't have a feel for it, then it's just probably not the right job for you. So thanks for the great question. Well, I've got more questions. Oh. Yeah, um, I'll start Liz with you, Liz. Me? Okay. Liz Akpawa, good morning. Um, so um, I think it's a two-part question. I wanted to, um, you, someone made a comment about one of the things that keep them keep you up at night is the checkerboard nature with the federal lands and um, the need to pre-treat. Can you explain a little bit why that keeps you up at night? So, as I said before, 13% of our timber base of our 1.6 million acres in Douglas District has uh, been impacted by fire in the last 10 years. And it's a checkerboard ownership of ONC land and private land. So most of the Roseburg District is classified as uh, LSR for a better term. And there was no, um, I don't like the term um, salvage, 
because I really look at it as it's a treating for the next event. We know we'll have fire on that landscape. So it leaves a landscape filled of uh, old growth snags. And we're talking like 120 to 140 trees per acre. And the limbs are, you know, six, eight inches. And these trees become very precarious. You can't get underneath them when they're on fire. Fire will travel from snag to snag and spot, it, independent of ground fire. And it leaves me in a difficult position to ask our young men and women to go in there and suppress fire when that is the, the core mission of us. So we, we expend a lot of resources, uh, aviation resources to keep those fires down. But if there's something we can do to pre-treat that before the next fire, our old the old timers journals say it'll take three to four fires to get rid of those snags. Okay. And then I have just one more um, comment is that today is the International Day for Women. And I see a lot of men and women out there of the student age. And I'm hoping that will continue to come through your organization and um, enlighten that and be bright about it. Thank well, you. I could, I could speak for Douglas. You know, one of our uh, key and upcoming young leaders is a graduate of Oregon State. And she is our protection supervisor in Roseburg and manages a, a staff of about 25 um, and guides operations uh, on the day-to-day -day affairs there. Thank you. Brenda. Yeah, thank you, Jim. And thank you all for the presentation. It was really informative. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to say as a wildlife biologist, I sure hope you don't get rid of all of those snags because <laughs> we'd like to have some around. Um, but a question for you regarding um, the use of prescribed fire as uh, on the landscape on, on your properties. Is, is that something that your organizations are involved in? And to what degree? So uh, for Douglas, you know, we do, uh, we issue the burning permits uh, for those uh, control burns, whether they're the slash burns or a lot of pasture burning uh, is conducted in Douglas County uh, as a, for the, the ranching community. Mm -hmm. So we issued the permits, we stand by given weather forecasts, you know, there's current laws prohibit us from, you know, assisting them beyond uh, actual lighting. And, but there are landowners that employ us through these co-op agreements mm -hmm. uh, and we uh, burn for the, the Cow Creek tribe on some of their trust lands and um, private holdings as well. So we're filling that in. We're still trying to work. We're actually supporting uh, getting some of our staff trained up as qualified burn bosses mm -hmm. to a level they could engage with the federal government mm -hmm. and looking for uh, those training opportunities. Thank you. So. And, then, and then we further engage, uh, we just like an ODF district, state district, uh, we, we do the same work that they do in the smoke management program with the landowner. So we enter all the data that, you know, gather all that, look at the units, help, help make it by, you know, good decisions for the landowners, help them, they get away, obviously. And we definitely in court encourage them to do more burning we want more burning done on our landscapes we're burning thousands of acres a year but we need to be burning tens of thousands of acres a year right so. and for a reference as well um the forest protective associations historically haven't had the same liability protections that the state foresters had or the department of forestry that's uh recently been changed in the 2021 legislative session that was part of senate bill 762 as well so that's new found uh authorities and protections for them uh for the type of work that you're talking about thank you yeah, I have a quick question, uh, Joe Justice, for the record. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, patrol assessments. Um, what uh, what kind of, um, what has your assessments been doing over the last few years? What's the landowner's um, response or feedback related to those assessments? And, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm from Eastern Oregon, I'm mean, not from your area, but my understanding kind of low site productivity, marginal property is difficult to keep working, uh, whether it's ranching or, or, or or um, or um, growing trees, but I'm just curious to some feedback about your assessments and what your landowners are saying. Yeah, and, and so for for us, through the last 20 years, we've, it's been since 91 or 92, we've had 50-50 funding in, on the west side. And, uh, and because our organizations are pretty, we got a working board, they help us uh, maintain a pretty frugal system of fire protection maintain you know even though it's adequate so 
Uh, traditionally, our 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 rates go up about between about five percent. So uh, this year, our budget looks like it's up eighteen percent, uh, somewhat due to the added capacity, the the current service level that we are going to honor from the legislative's work on Senate Bill Seven Sixty Two. Uh, so, uh, and when I mentioned that we need to make sure that the landowners buy have the ability to uh, influence the adequate level protection, I want them to have all the options possible. We just we just uh, uh, gathered we we secured a, a multi use helicopter last year. Uh, it's a three hundred thousand item that the district landowners uh, support and fund. And with a helitech program with that for a quick response to keep fire small. And that's that's their decision to make. That's an adequate level of protection thing. When I get a huge increase from Salem or wherever I uh, something I can't control, then that that gives us less options. It 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 takes the flavor away from the landowners wanting to, you know, get behind something. And and so and then a lot of times our only option is to save dollars is at the district level since we have pass through costs that come to us, and uh, and I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here from Eastern Oregon you get this, uh, and but that's that's kind of we have had a little easier a narrative Joe because um, there's more value there that we're protecting, and and the performance we do for those folks. But we're getting to the point where that's they're raising their eyebrows too. This year we're up seventy cents. So, um, uh, if I, I may follow up uh, on that, is the uh, I don't look at it. I'm ours is a four to five percent increase, or but it's really about that level of protection. I go to them, uh, my board, and I present that package what that level of protection is, and with it, there's a, a fixed cost. But what is really unsustainable um, is uh, on those public lands that we protect, you know, where some rates are, you know, getting close to, uh, I hate to say it, but in some places in Southern Oregon might be close to $8 an acre on public lands, whether they're federal, uh, BLM, uh, BIA, or uh, then we have our county, county as forest. lands, yeah. county forest. Uh, it really is a challenge for them and, uh, and the state forest. They pay the, the actual cost. And um, that is unsustainable uh, for them as well, you know, in the in the long run. Looking for new models, I really think it's a brain trust to get us to a different place. Okay, Carlos got a question, then we're going to have to really cut it off because we're going to be a full half hour behind schedule. So you said you went from a 5% um, to an 18% increase, and you mentioned the 500% increase in insurance costs. Yeah. Um, I understand with some of the you know, insurance policies, um, they're not even making those available at a 500% increase. And I wanted to see if you're, if you're seeing that as well. And on the 18% is, is one of the biggest, is the biggest driver in that insurance. And if not, what are the other biggest drivers? Yeah. So uh, part of, there's three drivers. One is, well, one, one is that insurance increase. One, one is the increase in Salem support cost. Uh, Another one is our credit is down this year. We spent more money. We had had a fire season. We spent more money, so we don't have as much to much money to carry over. Those are those are the three three. And then the fourth one that's bothering us is inflation. Yeah. I mean, we're redlined in every category. Sure. You know, if you put in, you know, we were twenty thirty thousand over on fuel. You know, everything's over. Okay. Just, so that's that's those are the main drivers. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. It's uh, we really appreciate you guys uh, all coming here, and uh, we appreciate you as as partners um, and uh, very informative. So thank you again, and uh, we will then move on to the our next item. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Our next item is um, a presentation on our, uh, the proposal for the new Climate Smart Award. Uh, Josh Barnard and um, Christine Buell, please.
Yes. Good morning, Chair Kelly, members of the board, State Forester Mukamoto. I'm Josh Bernard, Forest Resources Division Chief. The purpose of this agenda item is to update the board on the department's Climate Smart Forestry Award. For background, in 2021, the department published the Climate Change and Carbon Plan with the goal of helping Oregon's forestry sector lead climate change mitigation and adaptation through Climate Smart Forestry. The plan identified the need to incentivize Climate Smart Forestry. One of those ways is through public recognition of those that are innovative and impactful in stewardship. Following adoption of the plan, staff began to work on developing a Climate Smart Award. The Climate Smart Award is intended to recognize better climate and carbon practices as part of the department's climate change and carbon plan. I'll now turn it over to Christine Buell, our forest entomologist, who is here today with us and one of two leads on the award development. Thank you, Josh. Um, for the record, I'm Christine Buell, forest entomologist within the Forest Health Unit in the Forest Resources Division at ODF. Um, so thank you so much for hearing us today, Chair Kelly, board, and State Forester Mukamoto. Um, I also want to acknowledge my partner as a co-lead in the Climate Smart Award, and that's Emily Martin, and she is actually out on maternity leave, so International Women's Day in full effect. Um, and she um, has done a lot of the heavy lifting on this, and she's um, working in monitoring in also in the Forest Resources Division. Um, so what is this award? This is a new award. Um, for ODF, and basically it's recognizing strategies that address carbon capture and reduction. Um, this is actually also acknowledged as one of the things that we would do in our um, climate change and carbon plan. So uh, why now? Well, um, I think it's a bit overdue because between ongoing hot droughts and wildfire um, and additional fallout from those droughts, such as insects and diseases that are opportunistically taking advantage of our landscape of stressed trees, we're accumulating a lot of dead trees. And that means a lot of carbon loss. Um, and that's also a loss of carbon capture. And so in this image, this is the Fremont Wynema, um, one of the many images that we took during our aerial survey, our forest health aerial survey this past summer, um, which is a over 70 year um, monitoring effort that's a cooperative between Oregon Department of Forestry and the U.S. Forest Service in which we fly all the forested portions of the state to identify where we see tree damage and mortality down below. Um, we are mapping insects, disease, abiotic stressors. We do not typically map wildfire because that's mapped more comprehensively elsewhere, but we do include it in our calculations. However, what we saw this past year was a large scale dieback, particularly in our true fur, where we saw historic levels of dieback over 1 million acres with mortality of true fur, um, largely due to drought stress and then subsequent insect attack and, and other stressors. And this is only in the true fur. It does not include the other species. If you want to include the other species that we mapped, um, increase that acres with mortality to over 2 million acres. So this is pretty historic. You might have heard about our results um, in many of the articles that came out entitled Firmageddon this past year. So um, we really need to incentivize what's happening on the landscape preventatively to reduce all of this carbon loss. So this is just a figure to drive the point home as if we haven't already felt it in um, recent years um, that it's getting drier, it's getting warmer um, and at an increasing rate. So what this figure is showing you is the drought levels across the state on average starting in 2000. So it's going from lower levels of drought, but still in drought at yellow, increasing to red and then at exceptional drought, which is the highest ranking, very dark red. So you can see a lot of red happening there in recent years, a lot of dark red. And so in the past 16 years out of, or uh, 16 out of the past 22 years, we have experienced across the state in Oregon below average annual precipitation. And then at least 27% of the state last year was in exceptional drought. That is the highest ranking and models are indicating that this is going to increase. 
So back to this award, what are we trying to do? Um, we're basically wanting to recognize landowners, managers, and researchers. So it's a broad swath of people that are working on our landscapes to encourage climate smart silvicultural strategies, um, any ways that they are improving carbon capture or retention um, and fire management response, smoke and um, fire and smoke adaptation, enhancing forest climate resilience and restoring ecological function and carbon reduction or capture and innovative research and products. So the framework of this award is that it's going to be annual and it's going to cover the state, so not broken out by regions. It's across the state that we will have two awards for two different categories. One category is going to be for landowners. And because there are different methods employed by some other folks, we're including another category. That's gonna be the research and innovation category. And I'll describe who is in each one of those categories. For nomination, um, anybody can self-nominate or nominate others, um, but winners may not be nominated again within a span of three years because um, we do want to spread out the incentives across the state to different folks doing different things. Uh, the process is that the Oregon Department of Forestry's Climate Smart Committee that um, we have selected across multiple, all of our divisions and across multiple areas of our state to get a broad breadth of backgrounds and views, um, that group is going to select nominees that first fulfill the criteria that we've set forth. And then um, we're going to ask the Forest Legacy and Stewardship Program Working Group to make recommendations from those folks for a pool of candidates to the state forester. And then from there, the state forester will have the opportunity to select two awardees. These are the two categories that I had mentioned. So one award for each category. One is the landowners, managers, and operators. And that's going to include um, pretty much everybody um, in that category. So private, non-industrial, industrial, industrial nonprofit, tribal, public, non-federal. And then in the research and innovation category, um, these broad, broad groupings are researchers, educators, fabricators, consultants, and nonprofits. We do have one requirement for the landowner and manager requirements thus far, and that is no Forest Practices Act rule violations for two years prior to the award nomination. Now, we don't want to punish people forever for infractions, but we don't want to encourage that behavior either. <clears throat> the criteria for the award is that for both categories, these nominees must indicate how they did at least one of the, um, did at least one of the following, and that's enhance carbon sequestration and storage, reduce carbon losses, reduce emissions, reduce forest industry waste, increase resilience of forest ecosystems. And then nominees for the research and innovation category must include novelty of their research results or products or their strategies and future implications of research results and products. There are some weighing factors to help parse out because there are a lot of people doing good things out there and we want to um, really acknowledge the folks that rose to the top. And they do need to show um, the benefits per acre where applicable. Um, this will offset Comparison, comparisons between smaller and larger acreages, and then the degree of difficulty, which can include risk. So that's um, an increase in money, time, equipment in um, employing these strategies. And their innovation, new products as mentioned, new research, um, new strategies, and then overall good practices across areas and projects. And these nominations will be bolstered um, by some potential other certifications um, that fall under climate smart strategies um, or participation possibly in ODF programs that are offsetting um, climate um, uh, issues or uh, increasing carbon capture reduction that could be any of the um, wildfire um, uh, cost shares that we um, allow landowners to apply for, um, some of which may reduce the um, carbon release on some of those landscapes. Uh, so what do they get if they win? An engraved plaque um, and recognition at a Board of Forestry meeting. We also are going to heavily advertise the winners and announce um, the award so everyone is aware of it, uh, utilizing our ODF public affairs staff um, in their various channels, OFRI, um, Oregon Small Woodlands Associations, 
um, Association of Oregon Loggers, loggers anybody that can advertise this, um, we plan to use those resources to advertise and to award the winning nominee. So where are we at in the progress? Um, we have incorporated feedback from multiple groups that we presented this award to. Um, we got a lot of great input from the Family Forestry and Regional Forest Practices Committees. Um, there was also a multi-day Climate Smarter Forestry event that may some of you may have attended through the um, Hayes family from Hyla Woods, um, where there were a lot of different perspectives at each of those days, and we advertised this, the development of this award and incorporated some of the feedback that we got there, and our own ODF Climate Smart Committee and ODF executive and leadership teams that we presented to. So where we're at now is that we would like to finalize the criteria for this award and implement the program. And the timeline for um, acceptance of this program being finalized is that come uh, this October, we will advertise the opening of the award. And then the following September, we would like the board to advertise who the winners are. And so um, with that, I can open up for questions if we have time. I've got one question um, and a, a comment. I, I'm a little concerned about the um, that that to be able to get an award, they have to do one of that list you had, like in, increased carbon. And I think we're going to be hearing about in a future presentation how you know some strategies to increase carbon can actually reduce resilience. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I don't know how to address that, but you might want to think about progress on two or more of that list might make more sense. And then I just wanted, the question is, what um, what will be your plan for review, when and, and how? I mean, any new program like this is not gonna work perfectly. Um, so, uh, you know, after a couple of years, you're gonna have learned a lot. What's, what's the plan there or is there a plan? Um, I would like to address both of those questions with one answer. Um, this is a plan in progress. And so we may have a shaky first year, maybe even first two years in uh, delegating this award in terms of you know, some of the criteria that we're setting forth that maybe there's some things that we're not thinking about. So we're gonna have a couple of guinea pigs um, initially, but we do hope to address um, casting the net as wide as possible. And that's what we are trying to do with the two categories. There might be more categories that need to be incorporated. But then also when we look at the um, criteria that they have um, fulfilled, we also want to look at, are there any offsets that are positively, negatively impactful long-term um, that are going to contradict any benefit of the strategies that they're employing? So we'll definitely want to weigh what are the um, negatives to any of the strategies that they're employing. Maybe we're not seeing a um, how it might be negatively impacting carbon um, capture or reduction of release in the immediate term, but down the road, could this have an impact? And so that's definitely something that we want to be aware of. And one more thing I will say about that during the, um, the Hayes family, um, uh, multiple day climate smarter event. One of the things that they mentioned is that, for example, you need to think about totality of carbon capture. So a younger tree is going to capture more carbon, um, per unit biomass than an older tree. However, that older tree is larger and in total over the lifespan is capturing more. It's not the rate, it's the totality. And so those are things that we need to really consider. Great. Carla. You know, every time I listen to you, um, I, I, I'm always impressed and, um, you know, Ben, I appreciate one of your comments during one of the board meetings that I don't know exactly how you worded it, but even if you wanted, your trees might not make it to 80 years. And as I listen to all the fire pressure on these public lands, every forestry tour I've been on, when I ask about longer rotations, the number one thing that comes up is fire risk and just the risk to that landowner and how much risk that is. And, you know, this resiliency and forest health on these public lands, especially think of, you know, just the last conversation we listened to at some point, I would love you to come back to this board and really talk about forest health and resiliency on these vast amounts of public lands that were essentially, you know, you're one in 50, your, your 2 million is one in every 15 acres in this state is, you know, dead and dying. That's a big number. So I really appreciate every time you come and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And definitely our whole unit would, would like to. Uh, and, uh, on it. 
Yeah, thanks. A couple of quick comments. Um, thanks for this. This looks great. I really encourage you to continue forward. Um, those dead trees, they're not sequestering carbon, but they are storing carbon mm -hmm. for a very prolonged period of time. So I think that's just something to keep in mind that we want to keep those dead trees out there um, storing that carbon. Um, and on public lands relative to Carla's comment, um, fire risk is highly variable across the state. There are some places where fire risk is very high. Where Joe lives, yes, obviously that's a, that's a huge concern, but there are parts of uh, coastal Oregon where fire risk is much lower and fire frequencies historically have been in the order of hundreds of years. So I think that we need to kind of put it all into perspective in terms of uh, the risk of fire and uh, and the effects that it might have on, on carbon storage and carbon release. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Um, and, you know, we do also want to acknowledge that it's not about wildfire. That's not the only thing killing the trees out there. And so, for example, on the coast range, we do have several different insect or disease agents that are tree killers that are higher than what we would see in other parts of the state. So definitely across the state, we do have a lot of different agents at work, but um, it, you can't compare them as a one to one. But thank you for that. Linda. Um, Liz Power. So. Um, Christine, one of the things that you said when I looked at that was that you sort of uh, broken down landowners and then research and um, and innovation. And I'm wondering if that we that we consider uh, including uh, innovation as well as weighting that in with the landowner, because um, I think landowners innovate continually. And um, it's to me, it's not such a straight line coming from you know, research to the landowner. I think that it's, especially with climate change, we're just learning so much so quickly and it's like a sea change. And a lot of our models on how we think about gathering information and putting it to test is just so changing. So that would just be my one comment is, where does that maybe innovation comes across, you know, um, all your um, uh, sectors. Absolutely. So we really did struggle figuring out how to parse out to have these different categories because they will employ some different tactics, but there definitely will be crossover that maybe even products will be produced by landowners. So um, we're definitely um, leaving this extremely wide and open, and then we'll see as the, as the years go on how we might need to reconfigure. Okay, no more questions. Uh... Christine, you make Josh look good. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. This is thank great. Thank you very much. Looking forward to it. Thank you. All right. Um, I think um, we'll do one more uh, presentation that's 15 minutes after this, uh, and then we will take a second morning break um, too. So our next uh, presentation is um, an update on the forestry program for Oregon and uh, Oregon Kitchen Table proposal for engaging Oregonians and Ryan Gordon. Uh, how you feeling, Ryan? Excuse me, I'm, I'm doing okay. Okay. Trying not to spread my uh, cold with the rest of the room here today. Let's get my notes together. And uh, Wendy is up. Excellent. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Kelly and State Forester Mukamoto board members. Uh, good morning. My name is Ryan Gordon. I serve as the planning branch director uh, for the department. And uh, I am up uh, here with you for the next three agenda items. Sounds like we'll take this one first and then go to a break and uh, pick up with the other two. Um, as you mentioned, Chair Kelly, uh, this topic relates specifically to the work that the Board of Forestry is doing with the agency uh, executive team to uh, re review and uh, rewrite the strategic plan for the agency. But it also, um, I think, indirectly relates to uh, a topic that's been discussed here pretty robustly today, and that's uh, community engagement. And it has been the express interest of the board, as well as the department to um, diversify uh, the uh, ways in which we are engaging with the public and with the community at large, both around the revision of the agency's strategic plan, 
as well a lot of, as well as a lot of the other policy issues um, that are before this board and are before uh, the department. And uh, that's really the um, purpose of uh, this topic uh, here this morning. So uh, as I um, outlined um, in the staff report that was uh, provided with the agenda, I'm, I'm joined today by uh, Wendy Willis, who is the director with Oregon Kitchen Table. And uh, I'll provide a few more kind of uh, overarching comments and then invite her to introduce the work of Oregon Kitchen Table and then talk a little bit about some of the specifics of the proposal that we have uh, to work with them. Uh, on community engagement around the strategic plan work that we're doing. Um, overall, the intent as expressed by the board subcommittee that's been working on the strategic plan is to try to better incorporate um, all Oregonians values for forests in Oregon. And uh, that is uh, certainly a key component of our engagement through Oregon Kitchen Table. Um, but secondarily, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity in working with Oregon Kitchen Table to develop uh, some new relationships and some new pathways for the department to uh, connect with a broader uh, group of Oregonians so that as the department moves forward, not just with the strategic plan, but with a lot of the other work that we do, uh, we've got some new pathways to hear some different voices and uh, include some different input in the work that we do. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pause there. Uh, and Wendy, I hope that was a reasonable uh, introduction and setup. And I'm going to let you introduce yourself, the program, and a little bit about uh, the proposal that we've got on the table for, for working with you. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chair Kelly and board members. I'm, I'm very, I'm ha very ha really happy to be with you today. I'm sorry I couldn't uh, do it in person. I ended up having to be uh, uh, at the desk the rest of the day. So I hope you have a, a productive and enjoyable meeting. Um, as Ryan said, I'm Wendy Willis. I'm the director of Oregon's Kitchen Table, and we're a statewide community engagement program um, housed at Portland State University in the National Policy Consensus Center. We've been around um, since, since 2010, and we were first grant funded um, and then have moved into a combination of funding from um, grants and, and public projects. We've, we work on community engagement from every level, from like the smallest unincorporated areas of county to statewide projects like this one. Um, some of the most recent statewide projects is we just finished a, um, a project on high school graduation requirements for the Department of Education. We're actually working um, right now on the Integrated Water Resources Plan, um, so the, which is also a statewide project that sort of bears some resemblances, some of the things that some of the goals that you all have. And our, our, um, our, our focus has been over the years to really make it sort of seamless and frictionless for folks to participate who are gonna participate anyway, who have an interest in the subject matter, have a high level of knowledge, and we um, provide opportunities for people to do that both online and in person, but then really focus resources and time on communities that um, that public entities don't usually hear from, and 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 for a variety of reasons. And so, people whose first language isn't English, people who um, have you know felt excluded from from governing for whatever reason, youth, um, people in remote areas of the state, and and in order to do that, we often um, we use a really segmented and targeted um, approach. And so we try to do a bunch of different kinds of activities, usually going to where people are already gathering and um, really giving a lot of latitude to people from culturally specific groups to say, you know, what's the, what's the way, what's the way of engagement that works the best for you? So this spring, we're spending some time doing um, what we call community connector interviews, talking to folks about, um, what their what kinds of conversations are going on in their communities about forests and forest related um, topics, and what kind of um, gathering opportunities there are coming up in the later spring and summer. So we'll do that. We're doing these interviews, and then we'll work um, with Ryan and any of you who'd like to participate to to finalize the design of the process. And then late spring and into summer, we'll do a series of 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 um, projects, including 
a survey in multiple languages that'll be both online and paper and some larger listening sessions um, that'll be very late in the process so that some of those can kind of respond to what we've heard up to now. And then a lot of culturally specific and community specific activities, everything from like having a table at a parade to, you know, working with, I talked yesterday actually um, with a um, program that serves um, youth that are sort of at risk of dropping out who do act outdoor activities to talk with those young people about whether they wanted to do some outreach to other youth um, um, since their experience with the outdoors has become so important to them. So, uh, so uh, as you can imagine, this kind of work is um, both labor intensive and requires a lot of um, people from all kinds of areas of, of the state to reach out to their neighbors and friends and networks to participate. So um, we'll, you'll hear from us again because we'll, we'll, you know, we'll want to make sure that you're aware of what's happening and, um, and any way that you'd like to participate in this process um, would be welcome and, um, and would be you know, del delightful and exciting. So I'm happy to answer any more detailed questions you might have, but I just wanted you to have a name and an email address with a face so that if you had ideas or wanted to have further conversation, um, you'd have an opportunity to reach out to us because we'd love to talk to you. So thanks. Thank you, Ryan. That's great. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, just a couple of quick comments. Uh, just wanted to underscore, uh, as Wendy said, through this process, uh, you know, we will uh, be looking to include every voice that we can. Um, and also don't want to lose sight of the fact that we will continue, as we have here today, to have the uh, traditional avenues of input um, to the board and to the strategic plan revision through uh, written and spoken testimony, uh, participation in board meetings, and would reference that we do have posted on the department's website now our uh, finalized schedule of board meetings and board retreats, of which there will be two this year through the rest of this calendar year, which includes the locations uh, of those meetings and those retreats so that folks can plan around that. And with that, I'll uh, pause for questions. And Ryan, for the public's benefit, would you mind naming the members of the subcommittee of the board that are working on this? You bet. So the uh, subcommittee members um, are sitting right here at the end of the table. Joe Justice, Ben Doimling, and Brenda McComb are all serving on that subcommittee, working with the uh, department staff on the strategic plan. They're doing a lot of work on this, so they deserve some special recognition. Thank you. Uh, questions? No? Okay, um, Ryan, I think we will um, take a quick break again, just, just do a 10 minute break. So uh, we'll get, um, we'll take a recess and be back at 1040 and you'll be back with us. Thank you. Yeah, I gotta go. Bye, everybody. Thank you.
electric charger. So he had to, yeah, he's hoping not to get a ticket or whatever they do to you. All right. Uh, next presentation, we've got Ryan Gordon back with us. And um, uh, Ryan, you're going to give us a legislative session update. Is that right? And uh, with Derek? Correct. Yes. Thank you. And uh, again, good morning, Chair Kelly. And uh, for the record, Ryan Gordon, Planning Branch Director uh, with the department. And uh, the intent of this agenda item is uh, an update on the 2023 legislative session. Uh, but more importantly, I want to make a proper introduction here for Derek Wheeler, who uh, joined the department actually on the first day of the legislative session, the day after uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, as our legislative coordinator, um, and I'm really pleased to invite uh, or to welcome Derek um, and to add that capacity uh, at ODF. We've been talking about it for a while in board meetings, and it's just going to be uh, already has been uh, tremendously valuable for us to have an internal strategic partner uh, focused on building relationships uh, and helping us to track issues and uh, develop some strategy around our engagement with the legislature and uh, other uh, uh, policy issues. Uh, so I'll let Derek introduce himself here in a minute. Um, and he'll also be talking about some of the key legislative uh, topics that we've been, uh, or that we are, or that he is tracking uh, this session. Just wanted to quickly mention as well, you received uh, with the Staff report, um, the department's summary of the governor's recommended budget for ODF. Um, and as uh, State Forester Mukamoto uh, referenced in his opening comments, we did appear before the Ways and Means uh, Subcommittee on Natural Resources, I think it was last week now, um, and, and gave our presentation there. Um, so certainly uh, welcome uh, any questions on the GRB and other topics. Uh, but first, I'm going to turn it to Derek. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, so my name is Derek Wheeler. I'm the very new um, legislative coordinator for the department. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the legislature. And before I go on, I wanted to say what is, uh, I wanted to touch on the governor's expectations, because that really colors what we're doing, what other agencies are doing, and, and how bills will play out through, um, through the legislative session. And <clears throat> the general direction that we're getting is um, for, for agencies to focus on their own capacity before we build out any extra capacity. So do what we're doing well before we start, before we're asked to do more. And so that that feeds into, um, you know, what we ask for in our budgets. Um, but what we can't control for is what legislators ask of agencies to do. So what they might ask the Department of Forestry to do above and beyond what we do now or other agencies, DEQ, et cetera, et cetera. But that um, governor's expectation, I, I did want to bring up because I think it'll be very interesting to see how that goes through the legislative process and, and just how it works. We've got a new governor, we've got uh, new expectations. So I just wanted to say that. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of some of the bills that we're tracking, I'll just jump right in. I um, one of the bills that will hit us uh, square is HB uh, 3016. This is um, what's being called the Trees Act. Um, this is, would have a lot to do with our urban forestry program. It uh, it creates a, a community green infrastructure grant program. So it would be a program to be used within uh, in cities to build on their tree capacity, tree canopies and such, just to, to um, you know, take take communities that otherwise have not had um, some of the some of the green opportunities, the parks, the bioswell stuff like that, and and infuse the infuse those programs with cash. At the same time, um, the department would be utilizing a tree canopy tool um, to help with that uh, assessment. So that that bill, the Trees Act, um, received a a works or a, um, a public hearing last week, and it went very well. Um, it still has yet to have a work session, but I, I certainly expect that will move at least through through the committee. Um, and then tomorrow, there are two other bills that I, I wanted to put on everybody's radar. One is uh, House Bill 2161. Uh, this this makes small changes to the fall, uh, small forest land tax credit, and that's a, that'll go to a work session tomorrow. And then also House Bill 2685. This restores the corporate excise tax for woody biomass also in the same hearing, um, will be heard tomorrow. Um, 
on the Senate side, um, one of the major bills of the session is Senate Bill 530. This is the Natural and Working Lands Bill. Um, it had an iteration last year um, that some loved, some hated, and so they went back to the um, the drawing board with that and came out with a um, a, a much different um, uh, proposal. Um, that this proposal would essentially um, fund uh, landowners to incentivize um, carbon sequestration, whether that be in forest lands, grasslands, etc. It's it's basically a funding mechanism. It would ask the Department of Energy to basically play quarterback of the money and the and the agencies involved in that. Um, and so that has a significant amount of uh, legislative momentum. Um, it is Senator Dembro's uh, crowning achievement. And I know he, he would really love to see it passed this year. And so that's being worked. Uh, I don't have any dates on when a work session uh, is scheduled for that one. And I'm coming straight off of another bill this morning. This was uh, 509. And this went to a work session this morning, and I and I left the Capitol right after that. Uh, this has to do with uh, um, Oregon State Fire Marshal's um, Neighborhood Protection Cooperative Program. So they're setting up a program to the end goal of what 509 um, is, is to better coordinate um, community response to wildfire. So this gives added um, capacity to um, the state fire marshal within the within the built environment um, to work on things like defensible space, things like that. And it also builds heavily on um, connections between other agencies, specifically the Department of Forestry, um, to work on you know prevention on the outside of the communities and then trying to uh, quell any sort of uh, fires within the communities. So that um, actually passed out of committee this morning uh, on a four to one vote, and it will be heading to um, the floor. Uh, two more bills I wanted to bring up real briefly, and we haven't seen this next one. This is uh, Senate Bill 80, which will, um, I don't want to say revolutionize our map, but it will um, uh, adjust our map. As you know, we've had to pause our uh, mapping um, efforts until we figure out what exactly is going to come out of the legislature because they tell us what our expectations will be. Well, part of those expectations will be coming out of Senate Bill 80. Um, the expectations that are on the board now are, are largely based on the Wildfire Program Advisory, Advisory Council suggestions. So we're going to be building off those suggestions and then making that into a bill and we'll be moving forward with that. And that will ostensibly be our mapping bill. There may be more, I, I can't promise you. There's a lot of mapping bills to be considered. Um, and lastly, I wanted to bring up uh, Senate Bill 82, which has to do with uh, wildfire insurance. I don't know the fate of this bill. It was in work session um, right after Senate Bill 509 this morning, so I was on the road. Um, I would assume it passed, but regardless, what this bill was intended to do is say um, insurance companies couldn't drop um, uh, landowners or house owners um, because of, of their inclusion in the fire map and, and their and their fire um, designation. That was the first take. The second take that was voted on ostensibly uh, this morning would um, make sure that insurance have to fully explain why they would increase premiums or drop, they would have to explain to the landowners, the affected landowners, uh, why. It would also force um, the insurance agencies to factor in um, good works on behalf of the landowners, like home hardening um, and working on defensible space as part of the premium. And then lastly, you couldn't use a statewide map as, as a basis for canceling a policy or an increasing uh, um, a premium. So those are right now um, some of the bigger bills that are coming out of of the legislature. Um, I, I, I have to say that I, I give these um, updates regularly and they're always different. So um, if you ask me in two days, I would give you probably a different speech, but uh, that's that's what's on the radar right now. Thank you. Derek, is there, there was talk about relative to the mapping of creating a gold star uh, program to yeah. to uh, recognize and reward and you sort of indirectly referenced something like that is that is there is there something that uh, is alive that is going to do that i can't say definitively i know that i the discussion is being had but what vehicle the gold stars take or or doesn't take i i, I don't okay. know no no yeah 
Other questions, Carla? <laughs> So it, it seems the governor's been very clear on her priorities and focus on our own capacity. I don't see large blocks of money. I mean, if this board sits here and makes a $30 million policy decision, I assume she's going to expect us to eat that or find ways to fund that internally. I don't see dollars coming from, I don't see dollars coming uh, for natural resources. Am I reading that correctly? Natural resources aren't one of her uh, main priorities. I'll, I'll say that. And so, um, when I when I brought up the governor's expectations, I, I thought you know that colors the funding because anything above and beyond what we're currently using or or um, would be asking for, yeah, we don't we don't know. We don't know where that source will be. We had a uh, we had a rosy um, uh, revenue forecast, so that that helps. But um, how that actually plays out, I. Your guess is honestly as good as mine. Go ahead, Liz. Uh, Liz, I pile for the record. Um, Derek, and this may be something you cannot answer, but you know, when you looked at the governor's priorities, one was housing. Do you, in your um, attendance and participation on these bills, is there a possible future connection with her emphasis on that and with us and forestry? Do you see anything that connects or could be part of what we uh we look into in the future in this year yeah there there is actually a bill that um i failed to mention and i don't have a way to look up in front of me right now um uh there's a, a large housing grant uh program that um will be focusing pretty heavily on mass timber built um uh houses so that has a direct nexus to some of our our space and and it would certainly figure into the the governor's priorities as well that um has a lot of uh legislative traction i'll call it um and i believe it it passed through its work session out of committee um but again it, it would have a a large fiscal ask and um it's it's fate in ways and means is up in the air um, ben Doimling, for the record. Um, first of all, I'm super excited that you're on board here with ODF. Having a full-time position doing this work is really awesome. And thanks for this presentation. Um, one specific question, and I know this is within the context of what you just sort of told us, but um, I wanted to ask about Forest Legacy. Um, I know that was not an addition to that position wasn't in the governor's budget. Um, that is new work. However, that position would open the doors to huge amounts of federal funding. And just wondered if you had any thoughts on where that capacity might potentially come from, if there's a chance for that additional capacity going forward? Honestly, I'd, I'd have to, I'd have to defer to Ryan okay. on that. Yeah. <clears throat> Did I get my voice to work? Um, so appreciate that that question, uh, Ben, and and uh, you're correct. We we did have uh, in one of our uh, in our agency request budget, we had a policy option package that would have included some additional capacity for the Forest Legacy Program, and that did not make it into the governor's uh, recommended budget. And uh, I think I'd, I'd answer your question by saying that there is a, a larger conversation afoot in general, not just within the department, but in in the state government enterprise. Um, about how we can best position the state to take advantage of a lot of the additional funds that are coming, federal funds that are coming through um, Bill and IRA, the uh, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and so we're uh, certainly um, working with the governor's office and other partners to think about how we can, uh, as, an, as a state enterprise and within ODF, build the capacity um, to be able to uh, manage those funds and put them on the ground and also think creatively about how we can work with our partners as well um, and leveraging their uh, strengths to, to make it happen. Um, so I, I would kind of lump it into that bucket. Um, but uh, for the purposes of our conversation here today, I would say that that particular uh, pop did not make it into the, the governor's recommendation. Thank you. Good to hear that, that those conversations are still happening. I'll, I'll just jump on that. I, you know, I know another pop that didn't make it was the lander offset related to 762. What, what kind of, is there any conversations about that in the legislature? Um, Derek, what, what do you, 
What are you hearing about that? I guess. Well, I I, I don't want to get over my skis. I'll, I'll actually defer. I'll defer to, to Ryan. Well, I, I don't know if I have a lot more uh, I, a lot of color to add. All I all I would say was that uh, there was a significant testimony at our budget hearing to uh, speak to some of the pops that weren't included in that that subject came up. For, so, um, we certainly can't talk to anything that's beyond our governor's budget, but that that subject did uh, did come up. And I, I, I can't add more than that. Yeah. Chandra. Hey, for the record, Chandra Ferrari. Welcome, Derek. Um, quick question. Number one, we heard one of the stakeholders reference uh, SB90. I'm curious what where that's at in a process or if there's any movement. And then I'm also just curious to the budget hearing if there were any threads of discussion worth noting in particular committee questions directed at the department, like what the main topics of those might have been. Sure. Um, if I can, I'll, I'll answer the, the second part first. Um, some of the, the main questions had to do with, uh, with wildfire response itself. Um, it basically, it was an existential question that kept happening. Should we put out fires quickly? Um, that, was, that was a continual uh, question that, that uh, was had with us. Um, and so we had to we had to you know speak to our response why why we respond so quickly if we keep a, a fire small you know what are the economic benefits there um, so that was a main one uh, another one that came up was the coastal zone um, act reauthorization amendments also otherwise known as Cesara so this is a non point source where organs in non compliance with with federal statute and um, and it's it's costing the Department of Land and no DLCD some money. And so uh, we're, we should be on our way to fixing this uh, through the private forest accords, um, but you know things move slowly in the federal chain. Um, and so those questions came up quite a bit because you know there is a nexus with us, DLCD, and of course Department of uh, Environmental Quality. And then regarding uh, Senate Bill 90, this was um, initially intended as as a bill to sort of relook state. Uh, state management funding mechanisms things like that for for state forests um the governor's office decided that a better form would be outside of the outside of the legislature and so the current directive and honestly i can't give you any details because i don't know um, um was to take was to take the basic concept of senate bill 90 and move it into what has been called a pfa style negotiation Please don't ask me any details again. I, I, I do not know. No. All right. Um, any other questions? Um, Derek, I'll repeat what Ben said. Just really great to have uh, you in this position and doing that work. Um, excited. I think it was the the urban tree one. Was that House Bill 3016? 3016, yes. Um, you know, I, I, I've pushed on this because I felt like it was ironic that a state that has... Uh, trees on its license place was like the only or one of two or three that doesn't provide state funding for for those kinds of programs so i'm really happy to hear that that's hopefully yeah being addressed all right um other questions thank you both thank you well, and i'm really impressed that you were able to define cesara <laughs> it's written down yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we're going to move on and miraculously we are on time. Yeah, that is that is a miracle today. Um, and our next uh, presentation is on uh, long rotational uh, forestry. As a discussion, we'll have Ryan and Kate Anderson from the Sightline Institute. Um, welcome, welcome Kate. All right, thank you once again, uh, Ryan Gordon, Planning Branch Director with ODF, uh, with the last uh, item on the agenda, uh, at least for me today. Um, and I get the opportunity to introduce Dr. Kate Anderson, who is a senior researcher at the Sightline Institute. Um, and she's here today to discuss with us present theory and future outlook for longer rotation forest management in Oregon. Um, and I did want to uh, just mention, up front, uh, that uh, as you all know, over the last few meetings, uh, we've been trying to bring some 
uh, different perspectives and different information uh, into board meetings to uh, provide some context and background for decisions that are before the board, um, as well as context for the strategic uh, planning work that the board is doing. Um, and so this is uh, this topic is in the interest of that uh, continued and ongoing conversation. Um, so I really appreciate um, Dr. Anderson joining us today. Um, I'll give a quick uh, biographical intro and then turn it over to you. Um, so uh, Kate Anderson is a senior researcher in the Farms and Forest Program at the Sightline Institute, where she leads their work on rural lands. She has a PhD in sociology, a PhD in environment and resources, and a master's in agricultural and applied economics. She also has hands-on experience working in lumber mills and on farms. She's an expert on institutional tools that jointly promote vibrant rural communities and environmental sustainability. Before joining Sightline, Kate was a researcher and instructor of agroecology, environmental sociology, and natural resource governance at UC Berkeley and the University of uh, Wisconsin in Madison. She has researched climate, biodiversity, water, and land use for the National Science Foundation Long-Term Ecological Research Program, the United Nations Development Program, and the Brazilian government. Her most recent work focuses on best case scenarios for living with wildfires in Oregon and Washington. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and thank you to the Board of Forestry for the opportunity to join you today. Nice and weighted. Is this better? Thank you. And thank you, Hillary, for um, making this meeting seem so easy. <laughs> um, so as Ryan said, I work at Sightline Institute. Um, we're a nonprofit uh, research firm. We identify sustainability challenges and solutions, and we figure out mechanisms to scale those solutions up. Um, my personal experience in timber comes from hanging out with my brother, um, who is uh, an employee at Boggan Brothers Mill in Northeast Washington for about 20 years. Um, and once when I needed some cash and I was between jobs, he got me a job running the sorter at the mill, which was a lot of fun. Um, and he's let me tag along on mill tours um, from Washington all the way to Wisconsin and logging operations. Um, and it was, it's was it been interesting to watch uh, the Boggan Brothers progress with the collaboratives and how that's changed everyone's perspectives over the years. Um, but I was invited to this meeting today to share um, my research on whether extending timber harvest rotations at scale is feasible and whether it's a good idea or not um, for, for Oregon and whether it can meet, help Oregon meet its commitments to the timber industry, jobs, um, forest health, and carbon sequestration. Um, Uh, so rural communities will continue to be some of the most impacted by climate change. Um, Christine just detailed um, some of some of the main effects, so I won't go into that. Um, but the state of the state of Oregon has committed to helping communities adapt to climate change, and it's also helped. It's also committed to um, sequestering at least an additional five million metric tons of carbon dioxide per year by 2030, and 9.5 million by 2050. Now, these are ambitious goals, um, and there's a there's disagreement about how to achieve them. Um, and extending timber harvest rotations offers a compromise. Um, it seems uh, there's some disagreement, which we heard about um, in the um, stakeholder uh, testimony section, but there's some disagreement. But um, it seems probably a win-win solution, both for meeting carbon goals and um, keeping a competitive timber industry. So this is a Google Earth image of the Santiam River watershed. Um, you can see that nearly every acre is in some uh, state of regrowth after a clear cut. The reality is that most um, commercial forests in Oregon, uh, large commercial forests are plantations. Um, and long rotations offer the option of um, cutting in half the amount of clear cutting on private land. And this would mean there's half as much bare ground in any one year. There's half as much pesticides, 
twice as much habitat <laughs> um, for less common species and cleaner st streams and steadier stream flows. The bottom line is that long rotations, especially in Western Oregon and Washington, um, can produce more timber than short rotations and higher quality timber, while at the same time storing more carbon and lowering net emissions. And all of these benefits, well, maybe not the last one, um, well, yeah, even the last one, if, depending on how you define long rotations, all of these benefits are well recognized. And there are ways, which I'm gonna to discuss today, to transition to long rotations um, that maintain timber flows and return meaningful, well-paying jobs to timber communities. Now, recently there's been some scientific uncertainty and a lot of political controversy over growing older trees, um, including long rotations. And if you like, during the q and I can get into the science and modeling weeds behind some of those um, disagreements. Um, but the presentation will focus on explaining what we know about long rotations, how we can extend typical short rotations while supporting timber communities. Um, I will just flag that earlier today, um, concerns were mentioned over logging jobs and the multiplier effects in rural communities. Um, and the transition strategy that, that's been identified by the University of Maine most, most recently and by a few modeling attempts would actually increase logging jobs and increase a lot of forest operations through more thinning, which is um, a problem because it's costly. Um, I also saw a lot of youth testify today, which is great. Um, and so that's another thing to think about when you're thinking about long rotations is uh, the intergenerational fairness. Um, and there are questions about um, carbon processes like leakage and avoided emissions or substitution effects, um, kind of carbon math questions uh, that we can get into more in the Q&A. Um, so I'm using long rotations to refer to growing forests past a short life um, and letting them reach the age that yields the biological um, greatest volume of timber from the land over successive harvests. This age is also sometimes called the biological growth maximum or the age of maximum sustained yield um, or the culmination of mean annual increment, all of which I'll describe sort of shortly. So the biological rotation age is gonna be different for different species and different regions. West of the Cascades here, many forests hit their biological rotation max around 80 to 100 years. Um, in this case, extending rotations could mean um, changing from a 40 year rotation to from two 40 year rotations to an 80 year rotation. Um, historically, long rotations were standard practice um, when the forest sector was focused more on the amount of timber produced. Um, but since the sector has financialized, trees are cut at a younger financial rotation age that maximizes return on investment. So to understand why long rotations produce more timber, I think, um, I think of a tree as a photosynthetic factory. Um, after a clear cut, as in the bottom left here, um, the sun pours down its photons, but those photons fall on stumps and seedlings. There are hardly any needles to photosynthesize carbon and sunlight into oxygen and wood. And as a result, the photons um, and the land's capacity are wasted. It takes at least 10 years for a replanted clear cut to uh, green up and look like a forest again. So this graph shows a stand's annual growth rate in cubic feet per year. You can see the 10 year period of minimal photosynthesis um, at the beginning in those first 10 years. In a 40 year rotation, around a quarter of the entire rotation is spent in the factory rebuilding stage. While the annual growth rate peak, peaks early, the forest continues growing long after this peak. Um, because this, I think people see the curve and they think they see the curve going down and they forget that there's still a lot of mass being accumulated. This orange curve is a forest's average annual growth rate, um, largely because those first 10 years of that it takes a replanted forest to green up again, a stand's average annual growth rate continues to increase well past the, the time when the annual growth rate peaks. 
Um, so it's a little hard to get your head around the math, um, but I think this is a really key process. Um, so to reach a stand's annual average annual growth rate is the total growth over its life divided by its age. Um, and this continues to increase long after the annual growth rate peaks. So to reach a stand's full production potential, also called the biological growth maximum, you wait until the average annual growth rate starts to plateau. And this is the biological rotation age. In forestry jargon, this average annual growth rate curve is called mean annual increment, and the biological rotation age is called the culmination of mean annual increment. Um, so the numbers will vary by forest, but these dynamics are, are not something anybody disagrees about. I do think some of the confusion about whether younger or older trees sequester more carbon um, comes from uh, ignoring or misunderstanding the orange line and only focusing on annual growth rate. And the clarification that it's not a rate versus volume, is it's that's a little bit misleading. It's it's not a rate versus a rate. It's it's the average annual growth rate versus the um, a, um, annual growth rate. Um, so the bottom line is there's a balance point, and today we're cutting far too young on that balance point. So I'm going to show some photos from a 12,000 acre, 12,500 acre forest in Western Oregon. Um, and the photos all come from the same forest, but from different aged stands within that forest. So this is a cut to length thinning in a 30 year old stand. And here is a stand after a cable thin in a 54 year old stand. Um, and this is what pole thinning looks like um, in a 72 year old stand. And this is that same 72 year old stand with lots of downed carbon left over from old growth harvest during World War II. I actually had um, got to walk around this forest yesterday and it's now deep in snow, as you can imagine. And um, those, those old growth logs are been popping up out of the snow. It's really, it's totally gorgeous. Um, but back to the graphs. So how do those growth curves actually translate into carbon, um, a stored carbon? So this graph shows um, a Douglas fir forest in Southwest Wisconsin that's grown on 40 year rotations. The graph shows where the carbon is stored over two successive rotations. You can see the forest is thinned in 2010, harvested in 2020, replanted, thinned again in 2050, harvested in 2060 and replanted. The green area tracks carbon in forest. The brown area tracks carbon in wood products and the gray area is carbon in landfills. Um, it's a stacked area graph, so the silhouette is what shows total carbon, regardless of which pool it's stored in. So in years where atmospheric carbon is sequestered, um, or yeah, is sequestered from the atmosphere, the silhouette goes up, and in years when um, any of these products reduce, re release carbon dioxide or emit greenhouse gas emissions, the silhouette goes down. Uh, so you can see the carbon stored in wood products spikes up after harvest years, and then it steadily, steadily declines as wood products meet the end of their life um, and carbon returns to the atmosphere. Also, after a clear cut, the whole silhouette shrinks, even though forest is being converted to wood products, um, and these wood products store carbon. This is because the branches and treetops um, that are left in the forest as in the forest as slash are burned or start to decay. And it varies by operation, but up to 40% of um, or more of a tree's biomass is left in the forest as logging residuals. Meanwhile, um, the replanted clear cut isn't yet sequestering car much carbon. So again, nobody disagrees about these dynamics, although the numbers vary. Oops. So you can see the clear cutting and the thinning here. Um, so this graph was uh, created by North, well, this graph was created by Sightline, but the modeling was done by Northwest Natural Resource Group. Um, and they modeled um, a forest in Southwest uh, with, uh, Washington, and they compared a 40 year rotation in the same forest and an 80 year rotation. Um, since some of you may be wondering, they used the um, 
forest vegetation simulator, and they conservatively calibrated the model not to overpredict growth in over tree and older trees, which we could get into in the Q and A maybe. Um, so from the 80 year rotation, it's important to remember there's the volume comes from the final harvest, but also from three intermediate harvests, as we saw in the photographs. Um, so specifically, NNRG found that the longer rotation stores 52% more timber um, than two 40 year rotations, and it sequesters 53% more carbon. And in total, there are 13% more. It stores uh, the 80 year rotation stores 13% more carbon in wood products than two short rotations. Um, and this this is because the, the, I'm defining a long rotation as the biological rotation age that produces the max amount of timber and stores the most carbon. Um, and so that dip in total system carbon after harvest is one reason why long rotations store more carbon. In the 40 year rotation, the slash is decaying, um, but in the 80 year rotation, that whole time, the trees are still growing. So those are some of the benefits of long rotations. Um, there are others, but uh, let's talk about the challenges. Um, there are four well-known challenges to extending rotations. Um, the biggest challenge is that time is money. Landowners make a lot more money harvesting a forest when it's young um, than holding an inventory and waiting. Um, so the financial rotation age, even though volume and revenue are maximized at the biological rotation age, revenue in the future obviously is worth less than revenue today. So if an investor buys timberland, this asset has to grow as fast as other investments. And these other investments, like the hottest new AI venture, which I wish I'd invested in, or the stock market in general, they yield compounding growth. Um, as the invested principal grows and is reinvested. This means the investment doesn't just increase at a constant rate, but it increases exponentially. Um, trees grow at an increasing rate for a while, but not forever. And even if a tree could keep up that max growth rate, a max annual growth rate, it's a non-increasing rate. So eventually the mutual fund would catch up. Investors focus on net present value, which they calculate by discounting future revenue. <laughs> Um, they discount the revenue, future revenue by a discount rate they choose based on their needed return on investment. Of course, there are other factors like the price of logs, other market prices, um, the underlying land speculation market. But the discount rate is the main consistent driver. So these bars show um, the age of final harvest for the same forest, given different discount rates. The green bar shows the biological rotation age of an undiscounted forest, and the gold bars show harvest given harvest age given a 4% or a 7% discount rate. So you can see how small changes in the chosen discount rate cause big changes in the age when companies decide to harvest. At 4%, the rotation age shrinks um, down to 45 years, and at 7%, it, um, you, you log about 15 years earlier yet. So a lot of people, um, a lot of stakeholders uh, made really wonderful testimonies this morning, and they came, they come from different walks of life, landowners, loggers, mills, um, that multiplier effect, communities, um, revenue for public institutions. So um, for whom is an important question. The, the financial rotation age is is the most financial for whom? It's an important and often overlooked question when people talk about um, the net present value. As we'll talk about sh uh, shortly, um, extending rotations could actually create a lot of jobs for loggers, a lot of thinning, thinning jobs in particular. Um, but short rotations are gonna be more profitable for landowners and investors. Um, so I've heard a lot of people say, yeah, you know, long rotations are a great idea in theory, but they're completely impossible. It would take uh, 30 years to grow out and it would mean 30 years of reduced harvest. Um, and that would mean lost dumpage, re lost dumpage revenue to investors and landowners, um, lost production at manufacturing facilities, reduction in employment, loss of timber dependent businesses, loss of tax revenue and so on. But it turns out you don't have to start to stop harvesting. There are several strategies that could extend rotations and fully maintain timber um, 
production and fiber production. Uh, recently, a consortium including Conservation Northwest, Washington Conservation Action, and Resilient Forestry teamed up to research this question, how to extend rotations in a way that supports communities. They modeled different scenarios, 364 different scenarios, on to extend rotations um, gradually over a 70-year period in Western Washington. So this graph shows their re results for private lands. So by the end of 70 years, forests that are currently managed on 40-year rotations would be managed on 80-year rotations. So their results, they found that private timberlands in Western Washington can make the transition with essentially no reduction in supply. If done right over 70 years, volume from private forests in Western Washington increases and it's higher in almost every single year of during the 70 year transition. Um, so the graph shows thinning on top and light brown and final harvest um, and darker brown on the bottom. So the key to making this transition work is a lot of thinning. <laughs> um, the amount of thinning goes up um, more and more. And then by the end of the transition, you're starting to get more volume from final harvest. <laughs> Um, yeah, sorry, Joe. So, um, so finding enough loggers to, to do this work is actually going to be, should have, <laughs> we should have put the screen over there so the board of forestry can see it. <laughs> um, so finding enough loggers to actually do this work is going to be a challenge, um, because there's a lot more thinning. So what about mills? That's another, um, Big challenge to long rotations. So today, timberland owners who want to uh, extend their rotations find a, a real scarcity of large diameter mills, and it's hard to market their logs for their for their full value. But with this gradual transition, there's plenty of small diameter logs in the short run, the medium run, and then there's a strong and predictable supply of log large logs that would motivate um, and guarantee a supply for large diameter mills in the medium and long term. Um, mills retooled in the 1990s to process short, uh, small, small diameter logs, and they can retool again, hopefully in a less painful and more planned way. <laughs> um, so another hurdle to growing older rotations is, or older trees, um, is the fear that an endangered species would be attracted by the improved habitat. Um, and the endangered, the endangered species has some real teeth to restrict harvest if a species moved in. So that's a real challenge um, and would have to be ironed out. The benefit of extending rotations at scale like this is that there's a lot of landowners together. Um, so the expense of negotiating an HCP, which sounds like it was about 28 million for the Department of Forestry. Um, I know that Port Blakely spent about a million on theirs. Um, this would go down um, on a per forest basis quite a lot. Um, state lands, of course, face an additional constraint, the additional challenge of public concern and maybe lawsuits over logging these gorgeous 80-year-old trees. Um, but again, with anticipation and planning and leverage from the immense habitat benefits, um, it seems that this challenge could be addressed by the legislature with, uh, again, with an HCP or some other kind of um, agreement. Um, we already talked about the carbon benefits, so I'll skip that. Um, um, well, maybe I'll go back to that one. So these results are from a representative sample of lands in Washington. And in Western Oregon, you can imagine the different dis distribution of species, different site classes and initial stand ages. So the optimal strategy um, and the numbers would likely be different. So um, you're gonna have to do your own modeling. <laughs> uh, maybe that's what you can use some, some federal infrastructure dollars for, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so the team also modeled um, a 70 year transition from 40 to 80 year rotations on DNR state land. Um, in Western Washington, and they excluded land that's protected for habitat and, um, and other reasons. And they found very similar results. The volume steadily grows and there's no reduction um, in volume at any year. Of course, they found these results because 
that's the parameters that set the model. They you can obviously extend rotations and reduce fiber production, um, but they were looking for um, scenarios that both stored a lot of carbon and had no reduction in um, timber production. Um, so, and this map, I'm, I apologize, on this map, the thinning and harvest are flipped. And so the final harvest is on top. Um, so you, the, the difference between state and private um, in their results is that there's more thinning initially because the, the stands are older on average and there's a lot more volume ready to be thinned. Um, and so you get more final harvest sooner and more volume sooner. Um, so essentially there's a constant revenue from timber sales, but there's an increased cost in thinning. Um, so these are initial results and um, as their model and data are refined, they'll probably change um, at least a little bit. Um, for now, it's a very encouraging proof of concept. Um, but that said, recently staff at the Nature Conservancy shared with me that they're also doing this kind of modeling um, and they're getting similar results. And just yesterday, um, an article reported and you know, Maine Public Radio reported on an article from the University of Maine and the Forest Service um, also finding that you can maintain steady fiber flow um, while lengthening rotations. Um, plus, as a reality check, uh, I showed this graph to the forester who manages those 80-year rotations we saw for uh, photos of before. And she said, yeah, that's exactly how my client did it. With 12,500 acres, their forest is large enough to get a steady volume flow by thinning and clear-cutting different stands at different ages. Um, so this kind of thinning doesn't create uneven aged forests forever, as, for example, very variable density harvest would. Um, but uh, this modeling analysis does confirm that transitions would nearly cut in half the amount of clear cutting um, each year, or the amount of land that gets clear cut each year. So more habitat, um, better water quality. Oh, another thing is the, the modelers wanted to be cautious um, about the politics, so they set their parameters so that um, no tree at the, that was 80 years old or older at the beginning of the 70-year um, transition would get cut. Um, so, wow, right? You know, why aren't we doing this? Well, um, there's a time value of money thing, but also thinning is really expensive. Um, the transition basically thins every stand that's ready to thin, which isn't standard practice and is costly. It would require a lot more loggers and a lot of money to incentivize or cover these costs. Um, on the other hand, this means more well-paying steady jobs in timber communities, a chance to bring real money back into communities. And this can be a very good thing as we heard um, from a lot of the logging companies this morning. Of course, the timing has to be right. Uh, I don't know if any of us know anyone who isn't struggling to hire these days, um, but that would likely change. Um, and in a few years, the labor market will be different. Um, and with, with enough time to recruit and, tra and train a new workforce, uh, these jobs can be a lot um, of what the communities are looking for. In the forest, um, the 12,500 acre forest, I went there yesterday and there was a lot of thinning. And um, so it, a lot, and we talked a lot about the loggers and a lot of jobs. So it, it became kind of viscerally apparent to me instead of just looking at numbers. Another strategy to uh, extend rotations and maintain timber flow is um, an, what's called an all land strategy. Um, and it, it couldn't replace the thinning strategy, but it could be a complement. Um, for example, thinning plantations in national forests could help up could help make up some of the temporary shortfall while we transition to longer rotations. Of course, these would be very tough conversations. I've talked to some hardcore con uh, conservation groups about this kind of all lands approach, and they're skeptical. Um, they're very skeptical that any progress would actually be made on private lands. Um, we talked about you know, what kinds of guarantees would make them feel more comfortable and um, conservation easements, working forest conservation easements with ecological protections added 
and also seeing progress on public land on private lands would make them more comfortable. I think everyone understands the tremendous opportunity that we have here. So to foster all these co collaborations and all this planning, probably going to need um, oversight by the state by the state and a co very cohesive strategy. So of the four hurdles to extending rotations, the time value of money is the real constraint. If we can solve that, um, the other obstacles are a lot easier to work out. So how much would it actually cost to just pay landowners um, to hold their inventory for 40 years on 4.4 million acres of um, large ownership private land in Western Oregon? Well, about $9 billion, that's all. <laughs> Uh, pocket change, right? Um, so when I first calculated that number, I was I was kind of hopeless and um, laughed for sure. Um, but we don't have to do it all at once. And when you consider the benefits and the existential climate crisis, nine billion dollars starts to seem less daunting. The carbon benefits alone would be worth about twenty five billion dollars using the social cost of carbon. So by extending rotations, Oregon's large private forests could store somewhere between an somewhere around an additional 400 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. So one way to bridge the, the final financial rotation age um, is to compensate willing landowners. And uh, a good way to do this is through um, what I mentioned before, working forest, forest conservation easements that have ecological prescriptions. Um, and there's a, a number of examples of these through land trusts. A lot of them, some of them specify long rotations, but more often they specify certain harvest restrictions that end up with long rotations um, on about the same time scale. Um, so with a conservation easement, uh, landowners receive the full payment up front for the easement and, and they can still use the land and they can still sell timber from thinning while the rotations grow out. Um, another feather in the conservation easement hat is it's one of the few tools that can guarantee perpetual rotations. And let's face it, why go through all the trouble if you're just gonna liquidate the trees after the long rotation that you've just rented is over. So um, we were talking about Forest Leg Legacy Program a few minutes ago um, with a legislative update. And uh, it's a little disappointing that that didn't make it into the budget because um, FLP, the Forest Legacy Program, is an already up and running program. It's been in effect for years through the USDA that has the framework to pay for long rotations at scale should Congress um, authorize a funding bill. Um, so, so it's it's kind of important to to see that point. There's you wouldn't have to create new institutions. You just the, the institutions are already in place, um, and the conservation the contracts are already in place. The personnel are already in place, um, and so it could go a lot faster. Um, one way to fund conservation easements in Washington state is through the Climate Commitment Act. They just, they, there's now a pool of money um, from the cap and trade and paying the extra costs of that logging and paying for conservation easements is exactly the kind of um, projects that that money is meant for. Of course, there's a lot of other projects and that's a big um, uh, debate about how to spend that money right now. Um, voluntary green markets can help like uh, carbon credits, long rotation certified, um, other kind of sustainability labeling, sustainable sourcing. Um, and they, they definitely raise awareness that all wood is not equally sustainable, which is a key step. But again, they're, um, it, it's asking people to voluntarily pay for a public good. And so um, inevitably it will not be sufficiently funded to cover long, long rotations. Um, so there are ways to pay land, uh, landowners to extend rotations. And from where we sit today, it seems completely implausible to come up with the large sum of money. But times are changing. Uh, back in the 1990s, it made sense to sell timber lands and to liquidate uh, timber. But now we're in a different place. We're faced with existential climate change, a tremendously different understanding of forest ecology, and a public that wants more from forests than net present value. 
and opportunities can open up unexpectedly. The key is to start planning now. Um, the opportunity could be private philanthropy on the scale of Amazon or Microsoft. The Gates Foundation spends, I just read, $9 billion every year. Or federal funding um, some, or something else. If long rotation projects had been shovel ready five years ago, Oregon could have been better positioned to leverage infrastructure and, and, I, and Inflation Reduction Act spending. And they're not shovel ready today, but there is still funding unallocated in these spending bills for research, planning, and regional scale experiments. Um, Funding research to refine the transition modeling would be an excellent place to start. Um, developing a cohesive strategy, planning with the commissioner of labor, recruiting landowners, working out contracts. Um, it sounds like a, a funding for uh, thinning experiments and modeling on Clatsop and Tillamook might be a really big win-win right now. Um, so in, in terms of the Oregon Department of Forestry and the one-third, two-thirds revenue share, unfortunately, Landowners and the counties would continue getting a stable revenue from a stable amount of timber, but the Department of Forestry would um, be on the hook to pay for all that additional thinning. And so that's where I think levering, leveraging federal dollars in the carbon market could play a role. So that's, I think, a good place to stop my presentation. Um, thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I'll go ahead and ask one. It, um, uh, you know, as I, I've read all your material on this and, and uh, it, it seems to make sense to me. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, because I, as a non-academic, I, um, you know, I often struggle and my eyes close over with a lot of scientific papers and you're, all, everything you uh, present is very readable. You know, unlike Brenda, who I think eats scientific papers for lunch, um, but that said, uh, in talking to some industry folks, they're, that's they're the criticism they'll make of the way you're presenting this work, you know, exactly why it works kind of for me. They're saying, but, you know, it's not a scientific paper. She's presenting a lot of information and a lot of, uh, of things as 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 you know, you, you know, you're making some pretty strong arguments, but it, but it is not um presented in that scientific paper format that has been peer reviewed what's your uh how do you answer that kind of criticism oh that, that's a great question um i did not do any of this uh, um, original research i did some calculations um in excel kind of using other people's research but what I presented was um a deep dive into the science the biology the economics I learned a lot myself, um, and I was a little bit reluctant to give you a tree biology 101 when we have a professor on the board of forestry. But um, I do think that understanding these fundamental basics will is the is the foundation of any kind of conversations on long rotations. Um, yeah, it's not my my paper is is not peer reviewed research, but it is based on peer reviewed research and some um, more recent modeling in certain specific forests that is not peer reviewed. Carla. I appreciate that we have the same degree in ag and resource economics. Um, one of the things that uh, we were always taught is these long-term natural resource managers, and you've got a lot of them in this room, while they're very good at managing natural resources, the reason they made it 100 or 140 years is because they were very, very good risk managers. And that always, that always um, resonated with me. And when, I, when I've been out on these forestry tours, that's what I hear most about is why the industry has gone to shorter rotations and mills have adopted to shorter rotations with this checkerboard policy with with the way we're managing our federal forests in this state and the sheer volume of fire that is all around them and that risk is that has moved them in the very opposite direction of what, what you're talking about. Um, I brought some papers here from um, write-ups in the LA Times and New York Times and a couple of um, you know others that I will give to you um, to, to post Hillary. 
uh, to look at some of the actual numbers on how, you know, and California is a really good example of how some of these programs, maybe the intention and how they're landing, it'd be good for us to study those numbers because they're not landing where they had hoped to. But you didn't put risk as one of your four. And I'd like you to address that. Uh, thank you, Carla, for that question. Um, I, so I assume the risk you're talking about is fire. Sure. Um, so fire is an interesting question, and there's a lot of noise. Fire is one variable, and rotation length is one variable when you're going to calculate um, loss of timber and associated spread of fire from different types of forests. Um, Walking through the long rotation forest yesterday, I thought about this a lot, mm -hmm. and I've been writing about fire recently. Um, and I think that the LA Times um, article that you that you cited, up in up in smoke, I think is the one probably, and um, it cites a, a study that says kind of the car the emissions from California's carbon uh, fires in just one year um, was equal to all the amount of carbon stored by their sequestration program and their cap and trade program. Um, and I, I think that's not an incorrect finding. It's, yeah, that's not an incorrect finding, but it is out of context. Uh, when you look at the history of forests in the United States, obviously they're very different now than they were um, before um, settlers came in and uh, excluded fire from these forests. The forests are they're a lot bigger on the landscape. So development's taken some forests, but forests have also taken over um, prairie land and other lands. And so the a fire regime is a natural cycle. And you have one very large year of fires. Um, and often those fires, especially in California, are um, and some sometimes actually permanently displacing forests because they're causing invasive species to move in and they're causing um, shrub lands to move in. But the carbon that comes up out of a forest fire is a natural process, and it will be um, sequestered again by that forest, and when ex with the exception of tr uh, fully um, replacing forest. Um, and I think, as someone mentioned before, when you when a fire comes in, the carbon is still there in the forest, um, and so the California fires were dramatic for sure. And, and recently we've seen some dramatic fires, but um, long rotations, they keep the forest cooler and more moist. And um, some studies, the checkerboard studies from Chris Dunn, for example, show that you know, older forests actually can slow the spread of fire um, and burn less severely than plantations, than young plantations. Um, and so the the degree to which you're you know, holding your inventory and having that go up in smoke, if a severe fire comes in, that's a, that's a very big variable. And then the, the other variables, you have cooler fires, uh, cooler forests, more moist forests, a more fire resilient forests. That's another variable. Um, and so uh, I think where, where you're talking about makes a big difference. California's fires, California is an incredibly fire prone land, especially you know, Southern California, a completely different ecosystem than we're talking about in Western Oregon, um, even, Northern, even Northern California, much drier. Um, the winds in California, the fires in California are much more wind driven. The fires in Oregon are much more kind of ember driven um, and, and flame driven. So you're, it's, you're comparing different, different um, kind of apples to oranges in that regard. Um, but I, yeah, so I think it's a really good question. Uh, it, dep it depends where you're looking. And I think for Western Oregon, um, it's, it's a different, it's a very different question. It's a, we're much less fire prone. If you look at a, a fire risk map, it's like, oh, great! I feel I feel good living on, on the co near the coast here. And uh, yeah, thanks, Jim, and thank you for that presentation. That was that was excellent. Um, uh, thank you also for mentioning mentioning Chris Dunn, and you didn't mention John Bailey or Bev Law or a whole cadre of scientists to publish in peer-reviewed journals rather than the LA Times. And so those are the folks that I would go to, and those are the papers that I would eat at, for lunch uh, if, if I wanted to know more about uh, things like risk. And as you just pointed out, risk is highly variable 
in forests throughout the Northwest. And in some forests, risk of fire is very, very high. In others, it's not as high at all. So, um, but I have a question uh, and that is uh, the annual growth rate can be quite significantly affected by site quality and stand density. And I was wondering, rather than thinking about um, growing trees to a certain age, like 80 years, could we think about growing trees to a certain size, say a large size, which would be achieved more quickly on high site ground or take longer on low site ground? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and in some of the, the attempts to make policy about long rotations, they often use size as a proxy um, instead of coring every single tree. Um, I think when you d define long rotation as the biological maximum, you it, it's kind of a, a, a nice way of saying it, but you can't look at a tree and say, well, you know, what's your biological rotation age? Because um, the tree won't tell you. Um, I was at an Eastern Oregon um, on, a, on a tour and the, the forest service and the loggers were all were all there and they were kind of saying, oh, you know what? But what age do you think this tree is? And so we were the whole group kind of trying to guess the age of the tree and no one, and the, the guesses were pretty um, pretty high variation. So um, yeah, I think growing to size, looking at site density, um, kind of doing some research that would help guide specific stands. Um, it, it gets really complicated when you try to make policy about this. And so I guess that's where the tree, the tree size is kind of a very easy metric. Um, and yeah, I think that that, that that could work. Um, yeah, I, I think that that would be something that scientists would have to think about to how to actually create those metrics. Yeah, thanks, perfect. Because I think if we're setting policy around tree size rather than tree age, it becomes much more complicated. I agree with you. If we're setting policy around tree age, that's easy to do, but the results can be highly variable too. So I, just, it, it, yeah. it, it's difficult either way, I think. Right. Um, if I might, um, like I was saying, it's it's impossible to set policy around biological rotation age, but that is the goal. Joe. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. I appreciate it. I could I could talk about this all day long. <laughs> <laughs> right, Brendan, I could too. Um, you know, just a couple of things <laughs> all day long, Jim. <laughs> Mine, <no. laughs> I'll try. I'll try to keep it short. Um, a couple of things. I mean, you talked about, you know, what's how you showed a picture of, you know, clear cuts in, you know, one of the first pictures you showed of kind of that checkerboard of, of different plantations. And and I look at that and I see intensive silviculture is what I see. And I, I see, you know, and I know the result, you know, why have we gone there? And it's fundamentally the collapse of the federal timber program, right? You have a collapse of the federal timber program, which has created, you know, this, you know, incentive to invest in timberlands, right? And, um, and you can also say that, you know, the forest products industry and these landowners have kept this industry alive through intensive silviculture, through growth and yield. And so I just want to point that out. You know, we start talking about how, we, you know, how we've gotten here and so on. I, I appreciate you pointing out the real challenges with this. You know, how do you, how do you create a win-win, right? I mean, how do, you, how do you begin to extend your rotations? We, we've talked about even in our uh, subcommittee um, about how do we want our carbon, right? I mean, that's been a bit of our, you know, kind of, and, and I think that's an important question for this body. You know, how do we, how do we want our carbon in Oregon and what, what do we want to do with it? Um, and it's a big question, a difficult question. I appreciate you pointing out all the challenges because there's a lot of challenges related to this, right? Um, uh, one of the things that it struck me, you talked about your analysis through thinning and I, I just want to point out a couple of things that really, that I'm very acutely aware of um, in doing thinnings. You talked about the high cost of thinnings. It's also the issue of the products you're producing, right? Can they economically, feasibly, I mean, we're running these kind of challenges, even in Eastern Oregon, where we're trying to do thinning on federal federal, pro, you know, federal lands. It can't pay for itself. How do we achieve pace and scale? I mean, those same sorts of problems are going to be real challenges in thinnings. Um, did, did the analysis, and you may not know this, um, there is something called thinning lag, right? And so if you thin forests, 
you have thinning lag, very much like uh, what happens when you start a forest anew, right? Uh, you've reduced the photosynthetic power of that of that stand. It doesn't capture as much carbon. But is that part of the analysis? And then then secondarily, through one of the other things about thinning, I'll just this isn't really a question. I'll just point out you're doing repeated entries on the same land base, uh, which has additional um, carbon associated with that. You're, you know, additional um, putting equipment out there, you know, multiple, you know, I don't know, I don't know I, your analysis, but I mean, that, that's just a piece of it that we have to think about. And it's a piece that makes this real question complicated. But I, I guess uh, um, my question is about just kind of that thinning lag related to that analysis, because you're not going to be storing it, you know, through, through thinning. It, that's, I guess that's my question. Thanks. I could talk about this. Can we talk some more, Jim? <laughs> oh, wow. Those are, those are excellent points. Thank you. Thank you for bringing those up. Um, so the collapse of, of the federal timber supply um, uh, definitely <laughs> uh, had a huge impact on rotation agent. Um, yeah, my, my brother told me, he was, shared so much kind of emotion with me about that time. And um, <clears throat> And the collapse of the federal timber supply is is maybe is likely a, an important variable for the current financial rotation age, the current short rotation age. Um, but what what's the counterfactual? You know, if the collapse, if the federal um, forest supply, federal timber supply from um, timber supply from federal forest lands hadn't com collapsed, would the rotation age be any different today? Would that trajectory have looked different? Um, that's impossible to answer. I think um, there were so many variables that happened all at the same time. All at the same time, um, uh, you know, the financial markets, federal policy, um, mergers and acquisitions. Some really smart investors just kind of um, dis disrupting the timber industry, as they say, um, and so. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I kind of push back on those analysis, and I've pushed back on lots of people about that, but um, you just don't know. Um, thinning lag, they did, yeah, definitely um, included all of the carbon in the store in the in the forest and where it goes in all their analysis in every single iteration of the model. Um, so that was accounted for, um, and those. You know, you thin logs, you know, there's pulp paper and there's you know, smaller logs up to, and five inches you can get a nice thin commercial log. Um, and so when you thin, you do create wood products. And we're, you know, the mass timber, we're going to see a mass timber um, lab tomorrow. And uh, if, if that takes off, it's, it's a great opportunity for some of these thinned wood products. Um, in terms of repeated entries, uh, yeah, I was I was talking with a forester about that yesterday. I had the same question for her, um, and and she was talking about the equipment that you need. Um, and I know there's uh, some folks who's got a USDA grant, an equip grant, probably to do some technology research looking at that question: what kinds of equipment can actually have a smaller footprint when they go in by combining two different pieces of equipment in one? So you have a um, a much smaller footprint, um, but that's yeah, that's a good that's a good question. I was looking at the roads where some of the the logging equipment goes in, and kind of asking about the the carbon footprint there. Um, and also, I was talking with a soil soil scientist recently, and he he did this great analysis over a long period of time, looking at where logging roads were and how the forest has come back where those logging roads were, and there, there's definitely an issue there. So I don't have an answer for that last question at all, and I think it's a good question. Go ahead, Chandra. Thanks, Chandra Fry, for the record. Um, I, I think my question gets to what you were talking about um, in response to Joe's question on so many variables contributing to right the, the timber market disruption that led to our current model and how your writing suggested, right? You'd have to have something similar happen to adjust a model in a large scale way, right? To, to pivot folks to this longer rotation. Um, and I'm just thinking sequentially, when you know all of the different contributing factors that are maybe inhibiting a model from shifting, 
how you would want to address all those at the same time, right? Like you need more mills. Well, you need the assurance you're going to have those larger logs. Well, you're going to need the assurance that you're not going to have take liability when you're doing that because you're attracting species and you'll need the mechanisms that are going to incentivize. And, and so I guess I'm thinking in terms of the short-term things that you noted, um, you know, folks is, I think inclination is to not want to necessarily give up the rights to their land over time or the management over time. So there are these short-term instruments sometimes, right, that we can pilot um, and say, okay, does this work? But that doesn't really address the, the fundamental market factors that would drive a longer-term shift and change, which you would need to have in place to generate this over time. And so, um, you know, what does a short-term, how do you test, I guess, some of this stuff and put yourself on a path for that? right? In a way that people will jump on board because they see the longer term outcome, but it's like a chicken and an egg thing for me, I guess. I'm trying to, it seems like a very thorny challenge. Um, and, and I really do appreciate the way that you presented the information and the links. I mean, there are a lot of links in there to the scientific literature if folks wanted to dive in. And I thought that was really helpful, but I also thought it was really helpful that you, you know, you have the solutions out there, the potential solutions and the drawbacks and challenges of those associated with all of these um, different risks that you know that that folks bring up, but I just sequentially seems to me there to be a little bit of a challenge there, yeah. or a lot, a large. Maybe that's sorry, that, oh, like under right. understatement of the year, maybe right there. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe it's not a question, <laughs> just a comment. Yeah. But, no. no, I think I, yeah, that's you kind of hit the crux. There's so many different pieces that would have to fall into place at the same time. And since some of them are not that hard, but some of them are really hard, um, pr primarily the financial rotation age. Uh, how are we going to change people's um, trajectories that they've been planning on when to log, when they're expecting that income to come come in? Um, so I was, I've been talking with some Washington DNR um, ecologists and looking kind of at a, a regional perspective and thinking about how a regional experiment would look. Um, and so I haven't thought about it much for Oregon, it's, but if you had um, maybe a state forest is, is the easiest because you don't have so many landowners, you just have one very difficult bureaucratic landowner. <laughs> um, <laughs> and there's also, it would be as I showed the, the, the difference between the private transition and the public transition or pu transition on state lands is that there's a lot more volume on state lands to thin. And so um, without having thought very much about this, the, um, I'm just starting to write about the transition. Um, those were preliminary results. So without having thought about this very much, it seems like state lands is a good place to start because of that single owner, because of the um, higher initial average stand age. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> throwing a hornet into this. I don't mean to. Um, and so that, that, I think that that would be good. Otherwise, there are places where you have more um, different kinds of ownerships. So you, you, you're more likely to have a um, high pool of landowners who are willing to sign conservation easements um, because they, they, it doesn't go against anything that they want to do anyway. So they want to, I was sitting next to some folks who manage their lands on 65 year rotations. Um, so, you know, why not sign, sign a conservation easement? Maybe there's reason, but that kind of person. And so if you have a, re, a whole kind of region where you can have landowners willing to experiment like this, then that would um, provide supply for a mill. Um, and you don't have to have a gigantic mill. There's these, you know, amazing small mills um, the cost, you know, five million, six million uh, to to build, and so that could service the land. So, so that kind of experimentation is where I would start. Maybe we start with warehouser instead of the state forest. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Ben. Oh, yeah. <laughs> This way. Um, thank you, Ben Doinling, for the record. Thank you so very much for this um, presentation. I, I could we could spend the whole day on this, so I'll try to be brief. I have a couple comments and a question, and um, um, one is I just wanted to um, um, highlight your your point about the social license to cut big trees, and I think 
a key element of this whole concept is the fact that we need to then cut these trees down when they get big. And I think that's a really challenging um, idea for a lot of the public in Oregon to get their head around. And, you know, your presentation had a lot of chainsaws in the woods, a lot of different ages. And um, I think we need to not lose sight of the fact that that um, this involves cutting big trees. And I think that's a great thing. Um, but so I just wanted to point that out. And I also wanted to point out that uh, to Carla's question about risk, risk is very important. And I think as a forest owner, we think about that a lot. And the way I see that is sort of layering, layering longer rotations over um, um, air forests with lower risk. There's, there's definitely, you can classify the risk in, in the forest in Oregon and some for some acres have a lot more fire risk than others. And if we had more time, I'd ask you what um, you thought about this in the, in the East and the South of Oregon, um, what this looks like. So that'd be my, if you've got time question, but my, my primary question was, can you speak at all to the forest that you were at yesterday? Like what were their motivations for managing this way? And what was their financial situation? If, if you, if you haven't, if you can speak at all to that, like they made some different choices and curious how that's worked out for them. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm going to be careful because it's a private company um, and they want to stay private um, or a private family. Um, but first I'll talk about, you know, the clear cuts and the 80 year old trees and uh, there's some beautiful clear cuts on that forest. <laughs> they're just, they're just gorgeous. And I wish more people could get out. Um, I'm probably going to get skewered for saying this, but um, into those clear cuts, they're, they're, there's lots going on on them. Um, and when you get clear cuts half as, as half as often, then you can have more good things going on in the forest and these beautiful clear cuts, um, and you don't have to use pesticides very much. And so you can get a lot of really different species in those forests, like different flowers that you, you don't see on the land next door, for example. Um, yeah, so the, the forest that I was in yesterday, they, um, had some decisions to make and it's a it's a private family um and they were they contracted with a forest consulting firm and the forestry consulting firm kind of gave them the standard and here's your net present value here's the best way to make money over time and they said really no that's a you want to cut cut this the forest pretty young is isn't there another way and um so then the, the, the consulting firm came back with the long rotation plan and they said yeah that looks that looks good and yeah, it was less income, um, but they were also interested in intergenerational fairness on a multiple levels. And that was um, an explicitly stated goal of theirs. Um, and I was trying to calculate in my head how much income would have been foregone, especially in those year early years from transitioning to older rotations. And honestly, the, most of the forest is not 80 years old. It's um, 32 years old, it's 54, 72. They have a couple stands that are 80 years old and they're gonna clear cut them now. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that forest shows that income comes to so many different professions within the timber sector. There's more loggers involved. Um, it's you know great rehabilitation habitat, um, but the landowners themselves definitely took a financial hit. And not I know an impossible financial hit, but they made that decision. Well, let's go ahead. All right, thanks. Hmm. Liz, Hopefully. I top of the record. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Anderson. Um, I was interested in the fact that um, you opened, you peeked into so many doors into trying to find out, you know, what were the, you know, pushbacks, what were the downfalls? And one of the um, pieces you had was a picture of all lands. And um, when I came on the board, people were asking me because of my background is why doesn't the U.S. Forest Service cut more? Well, it's pretty obvious, Ninth Circuit Court, ESA and all that can't really do that much. But did you, I mean, when you opened that door, you know, what was, did you get any sense that there is 
a social piece there that is changing from the last 30 years that would allow that. And I, I don't know if that's a question that you can answer because it's it wasn't the focus of your, but is there, has there anything, anything really changed on federal lands in the last 30 years? That's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, I think you would probably have the, a better answer than I would. <laughs> um, I would love to talk with you as uh, someone okay. so experienced with Forest Service policy and constraints over time. Um, definitely what uh, one thing that's changed is, is kind of ecological understanding of forests has uh -huh. dramatically changed since the 70s, 80s, 90s, even 10 years ago. Um, and so, and, and that science is, is getting proliferated out into the community. And so I think that's an, a, an amazing thing. Just the, the amount of science and people who are engaging with that really helps us man manage federal forests. Um, and so I think as some of the most um, contentious uh, disputes are more are farther in the past um, and, and new blood comes on, that will also change things. Um, and one thing I saw yesterday was BLM lands. And so there was you know, these long rotations, and then there's BLM lands, often the same age, but the long rotations looked, they just looked beautiful. They're, you know, actively managed. They were parked out. You could walk through them. They're beautiful. Um, and I think a lot of people recognize that. And so the questions are, you know, Joe, Joe brought up earlier, you know, how are we going to you know, pay for all this thinning you know, on all these federal lands? You know, that's a good question. Um, it's, I think, uh, you know, around here on this BLM lands, you can definitely make some um, commercial thinning going in there. And I think that's part of the answer is just kind of making commercial thinning, looking at these long rotations. I wish we had more long rotation stands as experiments that people could go and look at um, because the BLM managers are saying, hey, you know, what can I do? I want our forest to look like yours. And so that's a, that's a comment that I heard um, from the forester that the BLM kind of asked that. And then just my, my other concern and a number of people have mentioned that is you know what is the social consciousness of if you move to a, a you know an older age class you know and you get these larger trees you know what would be the social consciousness of harvesting them and I think that's that's not in any you know numbers or graphs or whatever but it's a little bit speaks to the um Conf, you know, the conflict landscape that we have lived in for decades now. Yeah, sure. yeah I wonder, I, I often ask that to people, you know, if you had a whole landscape of 80 year old trees, how would people feel about cutting them? I mean, what would, would, because you, you'll have so much, they're, they're less precious. So would you feel less precious about, about cutting them? Um, that's a question I have, not an answer. Quick, I think we'll make this the last one then, Brenda. Sorry. Um, so there's already been management in those stands, right? So it's not an 80 year old. Just start over. I missed that. Yeah. The, the concern about public reaction to cutting 80 year old trees, I think, could be uh, managed because those stands when they reach 80 years of age have already been cut several times through thinnings. Yeah. So it's not like you're going into an 80 year old natural stand. That's part of an LSR. That's going to become old growth. These are actively managed stands. As you pointed out, very different from the BLM lands. Right. And um, to some extent they're, they're multi-age diversely structured stands, but, but not, not really. Um, we were approaching an 80 year stand yesterday and, uh, she said, um, you can start to see some old growth characteristics, but, you know, not not the same thing by any means. I also um, maybe optimistically think that the public expectations can be can be managed um, a lot, you know, reaching out, outreach kind of this is what we're doing. And so and we're going to be creating all these benefits, but eventually we're going to cut these trees. And by cutting these trees. We're, we're creating half as much clear cut on the land and a lot of habitat. Benefits. So I don't know. So Kate, I'm going to try to wrap this up so we can have lunch. Um, I, I 
do want to make a comment. I am struck by the parallels between climate change and global warming and uh, and this whole discussion around longer rotations. And what I mean is, you know, we we started out many decades ago with a scientific community that became uh, was working hard to convince us that we had a crisis. And, you know, and there was a whole lot of resistance, obviously, to whether or not that crisis was real and whether it was uh, uh, man caused. And, you know, because there was going to be some implications. We were not going to be able to use fossil fuels anymore. I mean, huge implications. And, and so there was huge reasons worldwide why there was so much denial and and uh, and it took so long to get to the point of of acceptance and um and then the need for you know incredible um public investment to to make you know to get out of our um fossil economy and i think with this longer rotations the parallels are interesting i think we're kind of at that point you're there being one of those scientists who's 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 making that argument i think we're that that these longer rotations make real sense i think we're 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 still in that debate stage right now of of does it make sense and we are going to be right up against there's a whole lot of reasons for industry and communities and you know all the things that we've outlined around outlined around all the challenges um you know even if, so even if we get real solid scientific economic you know every economist is agreeing that this makes complete sense this is still going to be a long you know just like fixing the climate this would be a, to uh, once we had general acceptance that it was a good idea not completely there yet we're still looking at decades uh of public investment and work with the many facets that so it, it's just um i don't know anyhow that, that parallel got in my head so i just had to, no, to share that thinking about that also like long rotation skepticism is a lot like climate skepticism and eventually climate skepticism has largely gone away although we have heard one person today who seemed to um what question climate change but for the most part climate skepticism is in the past and um but yeah it, it delayed us from going on a better path and and the the faster that we you know long rotation skepticism can be resolved the quicker we can get on the the right path and the faster we can start doing this planning and all of this initial work um but i think even before the long rotation skepticism does get resolved we can start planning and we can start doing the research, not just research on long versus short rotations, but research on how to implement long rotations. And so then as the science and the public, as the public uncertainty resolves, we'll be well ahead of the game. Um, yeah, we didn't actually get into the scientific uncertainty. I thought I was going to get a lot of technical questions about substitution effects and, you know, what is the real biological rotation age leakage and things like that. And so, um, well, you you address you know a lot of it, or at least uh, started in in, in your papers, um, having read them. But anyhow, we really appreciate the work that you've done in the presentation today, and uh, it's going to be our intention now to take a lunch break. We're um, a little later uh, than we'd hoped, but um, we're still going to come back uh, at one um, one thirty, and. Um, we have a buffet lunch at the Science Ag Room. I'm sure we'll find out where that is. And there'll also be a walking tour offered after we've had a bite to eat. And um, and then uh, we'll all be back here um, by before 1.30. So with that, uh, we'll adjourn until this afternoon at 1.30. Thank you.
Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it is on the list. Hello, everybody. We're a little late, but we're 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 back in session, the Board of Forestry, and we're going to move on to our next item on our agenda, which is the Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee testimony from Commissioner David Yamamoto. David, we can get this crowd settled down. You can go I right ahead. We can do that. All right. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chair Kelly, members of the Board of Forestry, State Forester Mukamoto staff. Uh, I am David Yamamoto, Tillamook County Commissioner and Chair of the Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee. Uh, I am here today representing FTLAC uh, in order to fulfill our statutory responsibility uh, to advise the Board of Forestry and the State Forester on state forest on, on matters which affect management of the state forest lands. And this is under ORS 526.156. Uh, I thought it might be helpful to start with just a little bit of background on the trust counties. FTLAC is made up of the Council of Forest Trust Land Counties. The Council of Forest Trust Land Counties is a formal organization made up of 15 counties in Oregon that have within their borders approximately 745,000 acres of forest land, which the counties acquired through tax foreclosure, which were turned over voluntarily to the state for timber management. Most of these lands were transferred to the state between 1939 and 1950. The 15, counts, 15 counties in the Council of Forest Trust Land Counties consist of Clatsop, Tillamook, Lincoln, Lane, Douglas, Coos, Columbia, Clackamas, Washington, Polk, Marion, Benton, Lynn, Josephine, and Klamath. In the late 1930s, the wood products industry across the nation believed that the, that the value was in the trees, not in the land. The result of this belief created a cut and run operation. When the trees were harvested, lands were abandoned and counties would reclaim the land through tax foreclosure proceedings. Devastating fires in the 1930s and 1940s also laid waste to thousands of acres of timberland, which had also previously been abandoned and were finally placed in county ownership. In December of 1936, the State Planning Board sent a report to then Governor Charles Henry Martin uh, that over 1.7 million acres of timber and grazing lands were in county ownership through tax foreclosures. By 1939, that figure was 2 million acres. Not all that land became state forests, but many of them did since these lands were held in fee by the counties and generated no taxes. County governments had two options. They could sell the land and place the lands back on their tax rolls, or they could keep the lands as they were. As local governments were dependent on property taxes for revenues, they were nearly bankrupt. The counties then chose to turn the lands over to state for management in trust on their behalf. We are again facing a huge budget crisis. This time, ODF, the Oregon Department of Forestry, and in the counties because, the state, because of the state forest lands. Reduced harvest from the lands due to decisions by this board and ODF continue to limit revenue generation beyond what is needed to maintain environmental quality. We believe ignoring ODF's budget planning is irresponsible and sets ODF on a path to failure. The State Forest Division is one of the state's few income generating programs. It is irresponsible to ignore ODF's budget and assume the general fund will make up the difference especially as the state's legislature faces difficult budget decisions this year, as in the past. Not only will ODF suffer, but so too will the counties. Oregon's rural counties have limited resources. We would like to provide higher levels of service to our residents, but we cannot because of budget limitations. 
even more than the counties, special taxing districts will suffer even greater degrees of issues. The financial impact to the counties and special tax districts of the projected 35% drop from recent harvest levels will be catastrophic. It is undeniable that harvest levels under the implementation plan will result, will result in layoffs of public service providers, including police officers, teachers, social workers, and emergency services staff. In addition, workers in fully benefited family wage jobs in the timber industry and support services will lose their jobs at a time when no similar jobs exist in our rural counties. Board members, in your positions overseeing forest policy in Oregon, it is important to review in detail the information provided to you. If questions are unanswered or information is missing, it is important to fill those information gaps and not rely on assumptions. At the last Board of Forestry meeting and the recent FTLAC meeting, we heard about ODF's effort to update the harvest model for the forest, forest management plan from the implementa implementation plan version. We did not hear how those changes might affect revenue generation or other outcomes. At the last Board of Forestry meeting, we also heard about US Forest Service's lack of success in implementing adaptive management to support rural economic development. Nonetheless, we heard from board members optimism for higher levels in the future due to both new information and adaptive management. The counties want to be optimistic, but the harvest levels in the implementation plan are a mistake. But we have no basis for being optimistic. ODF has not shown any evidence that the implementation plan modeling is inaccurate. If ODF expects modeling changes to result in significantly different harvest levels, why is the department pushing forward with the current draft implementation plan? Further, why is ODF pushing forward with an implementation plan that goes beyond the policy direction of the Board of Forestry? While ODF reports that the purpose of the plan is to provide for the transition from current management to management under the HCP, ODF intends to implement the HCP prior to approval by the Board of Forestry. Chair Kelly, as you reminded us at the February 15th special board meeting, approval of this HCP is not guaranteed. If that is truly the case, how can ODF move forward to implement the HCP at the start of the next fiscal year? I believe ODF has the capability to develop an implementation plan that allows for continued management under the current forest management plan until the Board of Forestry has approved the Habitat Conservation Plan. I believe this is what is required since the current state forest management plan is the currently approved policy of this board for governing greatest permanent value. As drafted, I believe the implementation plan fails to comply with current policy and fails to provide greatest permanent value. Likewise, why is the board pushing forward with an HCP that patently fails the expressed twin goals of the board? Increasing financial viability and increasing conservation outcomes. As I would have liked to express at the emergency board meeting, but could not because public comment was excluded, the fact that there was a need for an emergency board meeting indicates the failure of ODF's planning. ODF failed to consider county revenue and their own budget when developing the Habitat Conservation Plan, and hence failed to consider greatest permanent value. ODF failed to perform the needed analysis to determine the needed extent of conservation under the Endangered Species Act. As a result, ODF has created a plan that is catastrophic to counties, special taxing districts, workers, as well as the department itself. It is also evident that it is unlikely to recover listed species. Barred owls are now the primary threat to the Northern Spotted Owl. 
but the plan does nothing to reduce barred owl populations. Instead, it sets aside hundreds of thousands of acres. Even so, this area is just a fraction of the area already set aside on national forest lands, which themselves have not recovered the spotted owl. How will ODF's set-asides benefit the spotted owl when it appears the national forests have not? As for the marble murrelet, Oregon's populations in Oregon are increasing. At the same time, ocean, considered, ocean conditions are changing, hindering recovery. ODF has failed to show how the HCP will increase murrelet numbers beyond the increasing trend we are already seeing. And yet the board voiced to continue with the current plan. Turning back to the need for information, public comment is an important part of any public process and a way the public can provide needed information to government agencies. Limiting public comment limits the ability of the public to shape government policy. The Board of Forestry did not allow public comment at the February 15th meeting and has limited public comment today. I have heard the Board of Forestry comment on the crowded agenda at meetings. ORS 526.016 allows for additional meetings of the board to occur. Perhaps instead of a crowded agenda with limited public testimony, additional meetings could help so the public is allowed to engage in the process. I ask you to consider what is more important, giving the public an opportunity to speak to decision makers or maintaining a crowded agenda. In addition to not allowing public comment, FTLAC members have concerns about the use of the February 15th Board of Forestry meetings use of an executive session. Executive session is legal for only narrow reasons. Use of executive session to avoid discussion of public matters is not allowed. The use of executive session at the February 15th emergency board meeting was poorly explained and does not inspire confidence in this board's process. Transparency is vital for good public process. Inappropriate use of executive sessions is not transparent. The situation at board meetings is, I fear, indicative of the entire forest management planning system used by ODF. ODF develops plans behind closed doors with agencies that have no statutory interest in state forest lands. Then the department oversees a public comment period where comments are accepted, but no meaningful changes to the plan are made as though the public has nothing to offer. ODF reports statistics around the numbers of meetings held and comments received. However, to date, there have not been meaningful changes made. ODF then, then deems the plan as incorporating public comment. Ask, ask, as an elected official, I can tell you, my constituents ask more of me. I ask more of you. Good forest planning requires considering a range of laws, understanding of financial costs, and clear-eyed assessments of possible outcomes. We ask you to change your approach to decision-making and make these considerations when planning the future of our state forests. In 1978, state forester Ed Schroeder began conversations with county officials suggesting a need for a regularly constituted group of county individuals to meet with ODF on a working basis. He emphasized that a close working relationship between the 15 trust counties and his department would be of benefit to both. Let's go back to that partnership, one where ODF listens to the issues raised by the trust counties and where the Board of Forestry engages with the counties. We all owe it not only to the trust counties, but also the trust county citizens that the partnership between ODF and the trust counties are beneficial. Thank you for the time today, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, 
One thing of note, uh, which is that that we have requested some modeling, financial modeling on different harvest levels, and I believe that we're supposed to have that in June. No, I mean like after we get the model updated uh, in June. Yeah. Right in June. Uh, so so uh, we should have um, better information on that. Um, and you might want to listen to some of the comments this morning around what we were trying to do and have been doing in terms of, of uh, comment, particularly around uh, all the steps we have taken to increase access by uh, rural voices. And I think, you know, we're, we're, um, we're, we're, we're making adjustments on the fly as we have moved to this place where we're going to do the majority of our meetings outside of Salem, something that, that, uh, that, that Cal has uh, and his staff and I have been very uh, of all of the same mind and something we really wanted to do. It becomes very different from our situation that we've had historically where it would be more typical to have three or five people wanting to test testify and right. we're in more situations likely in the future like we had today, which is a lot of folks wanting to testify and has we had in at a seaside where there was nearly 60. So we're 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 working to to restructure things to, to make that because none of us we we don't want to be going to Medford or whatever and having lots of people who want to show up and and not be able to testify. So I think we're all on uh, on uh, we're just we're just working it out as we make these changes. But but um, you know your your uh, yeah your point is well taken. Thank you, Chair Kelly. I do appreciate that very much. Um, unfortunately, this process of moving the HCP forward and the update to the forest management plan and the draft IP implementation is moving very rapidly. Fair enough. Carla. Thank you, Commissioner. I think we had about 150 people in the room this morning and right. heard from a number of people from the rural economies and the 15 counties that you mentioned. And I know when three of us new board members came on board, we really pledged we wanted a better relationship with these counties. And um, some days I, I feel like we haven't met that pledge. And I know I know many of us are still really committed to that. Would you remind us, you know, just, as we have a number of counties that want to leave the state of Oregon, and as we have this conflict with these 15 counties, I think more than ever, we need to work harder to to find some middle ground here. And uh, I know many of us are committed to that. Would you remind us the total reduction in dollars that you estimate to these 15 counties and special taxing districts and about how many jobs you think are at risk with this proposed HPCP discussion? Do you have that grand number? I don't have those exact numbers, but I can I can tell you the, the talking points that we are using. You know, it was the uh, the business case analysis of the HCP that was delivered in October of 2018 um, that was developed by the board of by the Department of Forestry to uh, make sure that the Board of Forestry at time at that time gave a thumbs up to continued work on the HCP. Um, that business case analysis said that we would have 250 to 265 million board feet of production annually over a 50 year period. It wasn't too long after that that those numbers were kind of abandoned. Um, the Department of Forestry started work with services, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and NOAA Fisheries, uh, in their draft environmental impact statement. The services themselves predicted 225 million board feet annually over a 70-year period of the proposed HCP. Uh, and it wasn't too long after that. Now, it was at the beginning of this year, actually, where we got a call. Uh, from Mike Wilson and Mike, I appreciate very much that that telephone call to discuss this IP. Uh, this IP, the proposed implementation plan, is looking at 165 to 182 million board feet annually. And we were told at that time not to expect those numbers to vary too much going forward. That was it for the 70 year period of this HCP. So the issue here is compared those numbers in the in the IP compared to the DEIS from the services is roughly a 24% decrease in timber revenue. Uh, comparing that to the business case analysis that came out in October of 2018, that's a 34% decrease in timber revenue. Um, so it's going to differ by counties, it will. 
Um, but the overall effect, especially on the Department of Forestry, is going to be devastating. It's going to be over a 30% reduction of timber harvest. Please understand, and again, I know you know this, but for the benefit of the audience, timber revenue is split between the Oregon Department of Forestry to manage state forest lands uh, and the trust counties. Um, ODF keeps roughly 37% of all timber revenue produced. Uh, the counties and special districts receive the, the, the remaining 63%. Uh, but that number, those numbers of timber harvest revenue pale in comparison to the lost jobs that we would see. These are family wage, fully benefited jobs in the trust counties. Um, so even though there is now conversation about replacing, finding a way to replace um, the value of state forest lands, they're only talking about timber revenue. They are not talking about trying to figure out how to replace uh, the family wage fully benefited jobs. Brenda, did you have a question? Uh, just a quick comment. Um, thank you, Commissioner Yamamoto. Thank you. Testimony. Um, I think just a, a point of clarification and process. Um, it is the federal services that make the final decision on the acceptability of an HCP, not this board. And it um, and that decision is based upon their biological opinion and the issuance of an ITP. So all the we, the, we have had um, votes to continue the process and learn more and gather more information. The final decision is not ours, it's theirs. I, thank you for that. Um, I, I appreciate the comment very much, but it is the the services will not provide an applicant, in this case, the applicant is ODF, uh, will not provide an applicant with what they think um, should be taken out as far as habitat conservation areas and things of that nature. They leave that up strictly to the department. Uh, it is the Council of Forest Trust Land County's feeling that um, the department has really given up way too much, especially when you're talking about the spotted owl uh, and the efforts by the U.S. Fish, excuse me, by um, um, U.S. Forest Service and BLM to put hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres aside as habitat for the spotted owl. And that's been over the past 30 to 40 years. And they have seen no increase in population of the spotted owl. And yet this HCP continues uh, with that, what I consider to be flawed thinking. All right, thank you very much, Commissioner. We appreciate you being here again today. Thank you for your time. Yeah, I do appreciate it. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to the next item. I also uh, would like to recognize that former Governor Kitzhaber is here and joined us because he's so excited to hear our next presentation. So uh, thank you for coming. All right. Up next is the uh, field tour uh, overview. And um, we've got Marcus Kaufman, biomass resource specialist, who's going to lead us. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marcus Kaufman, Biomass Resource Specialist, Oregon Department of Forestry. Chair Kelly, members of the board, State Forester Mokomoto. Uh, I'm going to give a kind of a, a preview of mass timber and housing uh, focused on the Oregon Mass Timber Coalition. So I'm joined here by several members of, of the coalition. We're going to basically spend the next couple of hours going through the opportunity around taking mass timber and creating jobs and turning it into modular housing. So I'm just gonna kind of set this up and then we'll, we'll dive into a panel here with the members from, from the coalition. Uh, for, the, for, the, for those of you that don't know, Mass Timber is an advanced wood product that allows us to build buildings that are code approved up to 18 stories in Oregon. So we're a center for excellence um, in Mass Timber construction in the Northwest. Uh, with the Tallwood Design Institute here, with PV Hall, which many of the board members went and visited recently, the the Port of Portland uh, Mass Timber Roof, uh, we're we're a center for excellence, and of course, as many of you know, we also have an ongoing housing crisis in the state, and the Oregon Mass Timber Coalition was really formed around this notion of can we take 
the technology of mass timber construction and apply it to housing? And what would it take to make that happen? And there are really several things that it would take to make that happen. And that's research, funding, and a supply chain. So we are very fortunate in the, in the Mass Timber Coalition to have earned an award from our partners at US Economic Development Administration uh, for $41.4 million to really bring forth this idea of a supply chain for, for housing and mass timber together with, with a focus on jobs and equity and, and forest restoration. So really trying to thread several things together, restoration of, of federal forests and Oregon's forests, advancing mass timber manufacturing, and bringing a supply chain forward around housing. So that's really kind of the concept of like, that's what we're um, focused on with this collection of partners um, that I will kind of talk about who we are. So the, the coalition as we, as we stand is Oregon Department of Forestry, the Port of Portland, the folks that run the Portland Airport and the Marine Terminals, Department of Land Conservation and Development, Oregon State University, U of O, um, and Business Oregon. So this coalition formed around the opportunity from the EDA. Uh, and I really want to just give some thanks to the EDA for their approach. It, I've done a lot of work around federal grants in, in the past, and most of the time it's, it's prescriptive. But in this case, the Biden administration recognized that the country was really reeling from the pandemic, reeling from decades of, of economic inequity, and they recognized that a transformational approach really needed to come from the bottom up. And they gave regions around the country the opportunity to kind of design their own approach. And they said, we want transformational projects. We want investments that are really going to move the needle. And we're not going to tell you how to do it. We want you to form a coalition that really takes advantage of the intellectual firepower that you have in the state. And so what we see represented, like where we are here with Mass Timber, is a point of the work that's already been done to get us to the mass timber industry that we have today. So the Tallwood Design Institute as a signature research facility, um, the strength of Oregon's forest products industry, the strengths of the, Fra the Forest Practices Act in Oregon. And now we're pivoting that, trying to transform it into thinking about housing. So that, that really is sort of the result of a decade of investment from the state, as well as our federal partners. So the Forest Service has been a leader in this to the tune of about $50 million nationally investing in growing the mass timber industry. So all of that got us to this point now where we can begin to think about how we transition this industry to, to bring in modular housing uh, in addition to continuing to build tall wood buildings. So that's kind of the setup of really kind of taking advantage of the moment of, of the technology of advancing forest restoration and providing a new kind of housing product that will tr try to ease some of the housing uh, crisis here in Oregon. So I'm gonna pass it off to the members of the coalition. We're gonna kind of dive into each one of the projects. Uh, we're gonna spend about the next hour on the Oregon Forest Coalition. I mean, I'm sorry, the Oregon Mass Timber Coalition. And then we're gonna dive deeper into the two forest products, uh, the two forest projects. So with my colleague, Kyle Sullivan uh, from o Oregon Department of Forestry, and Dwayne Bishop from the, from the Willamette National Forest. Um, we'll also hear from Paul Vanderford from Sustainable Northwest on our, our track and trace program. Uh, and then we're gonna close it out with the Smart Forestry Program, uh, which is led by Woody Chung uh, at OSU. And we'll also hear from Lek Muzinski on some of the research aspects of this. So what you'll see is this is kind of a, a whole string of coordinated investments that we're making through this EDA funding to try to bring this, this idea of modular mass timber forward. So I'll, I'll pass it over now to Ian McDonald, from, who's the director of Talbot Design Institute, and uh, we'll dive on in. All right, thank you very much, Marcus, and uh, to uh, uh, Chair Kelly and members of the board, thank you for having us here today. It's a pleasure to present to you and also to be the first stop on your tour tomorrow morning. So. Because we're doing that, I won't go into great detail about the kind of technical work that we do, uh, since it's much easier to show you that firsthand um, in our facility tomorrow. But I'm going to go through a few slides to explain the role of uh, Oregon State University and University of Oregon in the Mass Timber Coalition. So Tollwood Design Institute was established um, 
roughly about seven years ago. Um, we're coming up on our eighth year, and we we're funded by the state legislature. Um, we also receive grants through USDA, uh, through Ag Agricultural Research Service, and we go competitively after other grants for research and outreach. And really, our mandate is to uh, expand the responsible use of wood in the built environment beyond um, single family homes where it's currently, um, you know, 95% of the market share. So we're looking at additional opportunities to use wood, which is a renewable material um, and much more, uh, much less carbon intensive than concrete and steel. Um, to do that, we, uh, we uh, serve as a kind of umbrella organization between the universities for um, applied research, outreach, and education. So really, we're, do, we're trying to uh, move things forward in terms of the technology and, and how that can be applied. And we're trying to educate stakeholders uh, in the industry community, in the stakeholder communities around the architecture, design, construction, manufacturing, on how to use these products. So we're a collaboration, as I said, between two universities and three colleges. The um, College of Forestry here at OSU is our home base. Um, our Emerson Lab is part of the College of Forestry uh, PV Forest Sciences Complex, and you'll see that tomorrow. Um, our second partner on the campus here is the College of Engineering. And then uh, down the road in Eugene, we have the um, University of Oregon's College of Design, predominantly the architecture school. Um, let's see, I'm going to advance this here. Great. So you can see on the screen here some shots of the two campuses and uh, PV Hall in the bottom left, the atrium where we'll have coffee tomorrow morning before we walk over to our lab. And then a shot of our lab under construction around 20, uh, early 2019. Um, you can see it is actually a mass timber building. So these huge um, mass ply panels that form the structural sheathing of the building are manufactured right here in Oregon along with the glue lamb. Um, these panels are 12 feet uh, by 42 feet by three inches. So they're really massive panels that allow very rapid construction is a big part of the value proposition for mass timber. So a little bit about us, we've got, a, as, a, as a university, Oregon State was one of the earliest um, institutions to jump into research on mass timber. Um, really the technology, technologies like Glulam, as you probably know, have been around for you know, close to hundred years. Um, but really it was when a, a new panel product called cross laminated timber became part of that family of products that really there was this ability to do significant replacing of concrete and steel with wood. And so that's something we've seen in Europe since about the mid 1990s. Um, we have a more than a 10 year history at Oregon State of doing work with mass timber research. And we have around 25 to 30 faculty members at any one time embarking on research across the three groups that I mentioned, architecture, engineering, wood science, um, uh, our, we have a core team at the Tallwood Design Institute of about eight people that, and at any one time, four or five student workers um, who really kind of carry out and coordinate um, the technical and the outreach mandates and the education mandates of our group. Um, and we've, we've secured around $10 million in external funding for mass timber R&D. This is in addition to the state funding. Um, and then, of course, that kind of doubled when we got the, the Build Back Better Award last uh, September. So uh, really excited about the opportunities to kind of amplify what we do through that program. We have great facilities on the campus and at University of Oregon. You'll see some of these facilities tomorrow. Um, we recently, the, the lab that you're going to see tomorrow is our most recent addition. It's uh, the AA Red Emerson Advanced Wood Products Lab. And um, the, I won't say too much more about that because we're going to show you that tomorrow. Um, I'm going to talk more. And okay, sorry. You can see our guys making a cross laminated timber panel at rapid speed. They don't go quite this quickly, but in the bottom right, um, this is basically the process. You lay lumber up. You add. You run it through an adhesive applicator. Um, you um, build up layers, transverse layers um, at right angles to each other. Um, and then use a hydraulic press to press the whole thing. And we have the ability to do this stuff um, in a kind of prototyping capability um, right there in the lab, uh, and then to fabricate it using CNC technology. So anyway, that's for tomorrow. Um, one of the things that we've done recently, before I dive into the EDA projects, is we, we established an industry research consortium. So this is a model that's quite common in, in universities. The College of Forestry has 
I think, 17 uh, research co-ops. And these are um, partnerships with industry or external groups where um, funding is pooled in a kind of members club, and then it's used to carry out research that's of common interest to all. So we established um, last year the REACT Consortium. We have 17 companies who are really kind of groundbreaking pioneers in different aspects of mass timber. Many of them are structural engineering firms, uh, architecture firms. We have some construction companies. We have um, maker, manufacturers and makers of connectors and other, other aspects. So um, that is really helping us to kind of uh, maintain really close linkages with industry and really have our finger on the pulse of what is needed to move the industry forward. And it's been kind of quite pivotal in us being able to kind of be um, uh, you know, a key partner in this Build Back Better initiative. You see the logos of some of the companies that are featured there um, on that page. So let me talk about the five projects that are part of the, um, the EDA Build Back Better initiative. Um, the first couple I'm presenting on behalf of my colleague, Judith Shine from University of Oregon. Um, she wasn't unable to be here today, but um, you know, we work very, very closely with, with our partners down there. And so this um, is a, a project to develop um, panelized housing for uh, workforce uh, workforce housing, essentially. So we're, uh, this project is kind of targeting the missing middle, the 80 to 20, 120% of, or the 80 to 100% of AMI, average mean income. Um, so looking at people who are maybe employed in industries like healthcare, who um, have, you know, good paying jobs, but aren't able to move, just given the affordability issues in centers like the Portland metro area to move out of uh, rental housing into their own homes. Um, we're looking at using um, mass ply panels, which are a mass timber product that was invented in Oregon, produced locally in the Santium Canyon, um, and, and using those to create, uh, to drive down the unit cost of these homes, to build these uh, and develop means um, and methods of producing these in a panelized or modular way so they can be rapidly um, built in a kind of factory environment, shipped to site and rapidly assembled. So we're really looking at different ways to drive the unit cost out of these homes. Uh, our partners at University of Oregon have been working on this for a couple of years in partnership with folks like the city of Milwaukee and Providence Health uh, and other, other um, nonprofit housing developers. So they'll be um, carrying out a number of prototyping operations um, as part of the EDA Build Back Better. The, the second of their project kind of related to that is a, this is a, a concept that originated in Europe and it is being done in several parts of Europe, but this is looking at um, older uh, three or four story apartment buildings that have uh, still service life, but they have poor energy efficiency and poor seismic resilience. And so uh, the idea is to then scan the outside of these um, buildings using something like a LIDAR or a laser scanner um, bring that um, imprint of the facade into a 3D computer-aided design environment and, and then fabricate a, a, um, a pre-assembled mass timber panel uh, complete with insulation layers and external siding and then basically take that to site and bolt it onto the outside of the building, meaning that you can do this very rapidly without with minimal disruption to the occupants uh, you can increase the service life of these buildings without having to completely demolish and rebuild them. Um, and you can, in the in the process, you can support the mass timber sector, the forestry supply chain, and all of these other things, increasing the seismic resilience of these homes and the energy efficiency, driving down the carbon carbon footprint of the buildings. Um, we're going to be doing. Uh, we you'll see a mock up of a, a phase one mock up of this tomorrow in our in our. Uh, in the yard of our laboratory. And um, we'll be working on phase two of that with the EDA funding. And then we're also using EDA funding to improve the research infrastructure that Oregon has. We already enjoy, as I mentioned, uh, really excellent research facilities in many cases. And together with our close links with industry, I think we've been able to really use R&D as a lever to achieve really first mover advantage in the United States in terms of mass timber manufacturing, design and construction. Um, five years ago, six years ago, I came to Oregon from British Columbia. And at that time, uh, the few mass timbers that buildings that were being constructed here, not all of them, but many of them are being designed with 
by Canadian architects and engineers and with assistance from Canadian construction firms because British Columbia had a bit of a lead in that area. Um, and, and this includes our PV Hall building, by the way. Um, today is a very different situation. We have um, homegrown firms that have the capability to build these buildings and they're being asked to do uh, this work all over the United States. Um, and it's, it's really not an exaggeration to say that Oregon is leading the charge as the number of mass timber buildings in the US now approaching, I think something like 1,857, either in design, or construction or completed. Um, so there's a couple of gaps in our research uh, infrastructure in the state of Oregon, one being acoustic testing, which is very, very important for single, for sorry, multifamily housing. And secondly, being fire testing. You know, we have a we have a couple of leading researchers at Oregon State University doing work on fire and structural use of wood. They're currently having to use labs in Texas and Ottawa, Canada. Um, we're going to be building a state-of-the-art facility for uh, for acoustic testing at the Port of Portland's T2 facility that you'll hear about shortly. And we're also going to be building on our own campus, very close to our existing lab, um, an intermediate scale fire testing chamber, which is really going to allow us to do a lot more iterative testing at lower cost and more uh, quickly. And so it's only going to make Oregon more competitive as this sector really expands across the country. The last uh, project I'm not going to dwell on because my colleague, uh, Woody Chung, who's sitting up there on the top right, uh, is, is, is the leading that program. And it's a really interesting and very holistic program uh, we call smart forestry. I won't say too much more about that. I'll turn this over now to, I'll turn it back to Marcus to introduce whoever's going next. Thanks, Ian. So as I said, we have a, like a, a suite of coordinated investments Ian covered the, the research aspects of it. The other aspect of it that uh, Tamara Kennedy is going to talk about from the Port of Portland is really three things. One is the Port of Portland's Terminal 2 site, which is in North Portland, where we're aiming to site a manufacturing facility. The other piece is workforce investments. You know, As we've been reaching out to industry and having these conversations about moving mass timber forward, we've been hearing two things consistently, supply of, of raw materials and workforce. So Tamara's going to talk about our kind of coordinated workforce strategy. And then the third thing we've asked her to touch on, because she's such a rock star, is equity. Uh, equity and reaching those who've been left out of our, our economic system is kind of woven through all of our approach. So Tamara's going to talk about how we operationalize those aspects uh, all in 10, 15 minutes. Absolutely. Thank you. So I guess so. Hi, I'm Tamara Kennedy, Director of Economic Development for the Port of Portland. Um, many people may or may not know, in addition to our amazing, beautiful um, PDX Airport, which is going to be also soon to be the largest mass timber roof in the world from a commercial project. Um, so you'll be able to look up and enjoy that and also look down and enjoy your carpet. Um, we also um, run three active marine terminals and we're also one of the largest owners of industrial land in the state. And so this is kind of an interesting opportunity. The port, while has been around for over a hundred years, has only recently changed its mission to be focused on shared prosperity for the region through travel, trade and economic development. That came at the perfect time at this opportunity to be able to support um, and collaborate with the Oregon Mass Timber Coalition around the EDA grant. You can go ahead and put this slide up. Um, and so what's really exciting about this, as you heard from Marcus and for Ian, that this is going to be a coordinated opportunity where we are um, in the urban area able to be a hub to hopefully to the region as we connect both forestry to um, opportunities for construction and development, looking at our housing crisis and supporting innovative ways to be able to develop that, and then also really being really intentional with who's benefiting and who's been burdened. Yeah, there's some interesting bugs around here. <laughs> and who's benefiting, who's burdened from these opportunities and how, we, how might we work in partnership with industry and workforce to be really intentional about who's gonna be able to benefit from these opportunities. So um, we're gonna kind of zoom out. I think that was, um, 
a crisis sometimes can create a huge opportunity for collaboration and innovation. And I think that's what came together with the Mass Timber Coalition, with the wildfire crisis, with understanding the growth of mass timber in the region, but also really thinking about our housing crisis and where we could do and be different and creative and innovation. And so kind of a zoom it out lens is looking at how do how might we kind of connect with what we do well in this region and support new ways of doing innovation using mass timber to address our housing crisis, but also to create quality jobs and also look at ways to have shared economic benefit for economic mobility across the state. So the vision and our port, port of um, our portion of one of the major projects, which is a catalyst of this, is the T2 Innovation Hub, which is going to be a campus like environment that has um, a mass timber factory um, that will also create opportunities for focusing on modular and other ways of doing innovative housing production development. Um, you heard about the acoustics testing lab, R&D. Um, we're partnering with Portland Community College, which, which is the largest community college provider, but works with all community colleges around the state to do workforce training. Their Swan Island Trade Center is just across the river from this site. And then also thinking about ways that we can focus on climate resiliency in the ways that we're doing this production. So that's the vision. The why, you're going to continue to hear this, but we know that um, housing is critical for our region um, and affordable housing in particular. We are, this is not actually a statistic that we're excited about, but we're, we're noted as Oregon ranks fourth in underproducing housing in the country behind California, Colorado, Utah, and ahead of Washington State. That's not something we're proud of. That's something we really need to lean in and figure out how do we do that. And so looking at different technologies that have been um, done well in Europe and other places where they've been able to really think differently about how they do their housing production at a more rapid and affordable way, we're really excited to be able to lean in on that side of things and work in partnership with our partners here in the Mass Timber Coalition. So again, looking at, you know, once we're all successful of pulling all those pieces together and this coordinated investment and in supporting not only the growth of this innovation campus, but also connecting the dots between the needs in our urban um, workforce needs, as well as within the rural community, our goal is that private sector through the investment with the EDA, which has really been a critical part for this investment and, and, and supporting um, this opportunity to help leverage private sector investment. So the public will be leaning in, we'll be looking at ways that we can understand what are the gaps in skills, in coordinated pathways, and in supply. How do we actually look at market research, lean in, provide connected pathways? How do we work and understand the supply chain needs? Um, how do we also connect that for the region, not just in Oregon, but also in Washington and up to Vancouver, BC? And then how do we be very intentional in looking at targeted training programs so that we can work with populations that have not historically been able to benefit from these types of uh, programs? You heard a little bit about the Innovation Campus. Um, the one picture that is actually going to be at the campus is the acoustics testing lab that um, Ian mentioned. The location um, is kind of ideal. So Terminal 2, which is 50 acres, we're going to be redeveloping 45 acres, was a former marine terminal. It's close to the heart of Portland. It has rail access. It has freeway access. Um, it's We're working with the city and other partners on complex rezoning, but we're getting there and it's going to happen. Um, but it's also close to work, um, workforce training sites. So we really feel like this is going to be a great hub. We know that this is not going to be the only location, but this is going to be a centralized location where we're going to have a factory provider that's going to have the expertise of actually how, oops, sorry, how you actually put these panels together inside year round. So whether it's raining or not, you can have a massive production, but then also to make connected pathways throughout the state. This is a little bit of a site plan at the campus. So it's also an opportunity to repurpose some existing warehouses. We currently have um, Hacienda CDC is doing some housing prototype that they receive money from the state. Um, that's going, those housing prototypes are almost done and they're going actually back out to fire impacted communities that had um, lost their homes. We're gonna see more opportunities for that once we have a full housing factory provider. We have another modular housing factory provider that's providing modular housing in the other warehouse. And then you can see as the site gets developed, what will be look like, what it'll look like. And the vision is that this will be a coordinated, beautiful campus experience, but then we'll also have opportunities for other businesses along to help support entrepreneurial development, either in housing or other uses of mass timber. 
So the other key thing that was talked about was training. Um, and once you hear from Margaret Van Vliet, you'll understand the complexity of the mass timber ecosystem. But what we're trying to do right now is really map what are the existing pathways that we already have programs for, and how do we ensure that we understand both from the workforce as well as industry, what's the highest need for skill development? Um, where are we looking at in terms of construction for reskilling, and or do we need to adapt any programs? And so that's the work that's happening in the workforce training um, program. We have a partnership with um, Portland Community College, as I mentioned, who's going to be working closely with industry and probably the REACTS consortium to develop training. We also are doing some testing, piloting with um, in Washington State, the town of Darrington. They have the Darrington Wood Innovation Center. They're going to be doing a program that's actually going to go a little bit more upstream. They have found that in rural communities, um, by the time students are graduating from high school, they may not be interested in wood um, going to the forestry work. So they're actually doing a program that's connecting into middle school and high school to do an 18 month um, pilot program that we can hopefully adapt here in Oregon. We're going to be working with Oregon Tradeswomen to be doing a, a program that actually helps women who normally are not making livable wage to be able to get a livable wage doing trades program training and working with a local company of Sankofa Lumber, which is a, um, a women owned construction firm company that actually works and goes to construction sites, collects wood material, repurpose it, and provides it for new um, product and use. And so how they can get that kind of advanced training skills and connected to pre-apprenticeship and union jobs. So there's a lot of things that we're working on now, and it's mapping that all out and discovering that. So we have, um, thanks to the EDA, we have four years to get all of that developed to, to result in the goals that we're looking for. And in order to make sure, and we wanted to make sure that with all of the commitments that we had, that this is going to benefit rural Oregonians, that this is going to benefit people of color, this is going to benefit women, how do we actually hold ourselves accountable as public partners? So we, we made sure that um, we put into the grant and we're working through this to create an equity oversight committee that's going to be developed in partnership with community partners to ensure that every aspect of our projects have intended equity goals, look in contracting and outcomes, and that can work in partnership with the Mass Timber Coalition to ensure that we're doing the appropriate outreach and engagement to deliver on these results. So we're in the early stages of pulling that committee together, and we'll be having um, trusted consultants that will be able to facilitate those trainings and sessions. And I think I'll be done with my part. I hope I didn't talk too fast. Uh, I think people are following along from what I can tell. <laughs> All right, we're going to we're going to switch now to Kirsten Green, Deputy Director of Department of Land Conservation and Development. And DLCD has a has a small but very critical part in this whole effort, and that's around the development codes and land use codes. Because if we're developing a new housing type and we want to rapidly deploy that into communities who desperately want that housing, we have to make sure that we have alignment around codes. And that's that's their bailiwick, and that's what Kirsten's going to talk about. Thank you, Chair Kelly, members of the board. Thank you for having us in today. It's such a really a lifetime honor to be here it is a, as an Oregonian for for my whole life, several decades now. Um, I certainly have watched the, the, the impact in rural communities in Oregon of the changes in our landscape. Um, and you're very, very familiar with that. So I just want to thank Marcus, um, State Forester and um, members of the Oregon Mass Timber Coalition for organizing this this time today. My, I'm going to do a little bit of don't normally tell stories, but this is maybe the one time I will. This uh, my um, role in cross laminated timber and advanced manufacturing came up in 2014 when I was in the private sector. I was working for the um, Business Oregon to have Oregon designated as a manufacturing community under the Obama administration. So that's when um, we were. Talwood Design Institute was a gleam, gleam in, in um, Oregon's eye and just really honored to see it come to fruition. Um, Business Oregon transitioned, of course, the bulk of that work to TDI, to Ian and, and his leadership. And then the wildfires of 2020 hit. Um, you're very familiar with the warming of the forest, the warming of the climate. Um, so it shouldn't have been a surprise, but it certainly took our state by storm. And one of my close friends lost her home in Talent, Oregon. So her house um, burned down in the fires on the Bear Creek Greenway. And I started hitting my rotolodex trying to help her find housing after that, um, which led me to Lee Glancy, which led me to Ken Anderton at the Port of Portland, and um, quickly then to Ben Kaiser, who is a developer with Cross Limited Timber. You'll hear from Ben tomorrow. 
and then back to Business Oregon to Donna Green and the Oregon Mass Timber Coalition um, sort of came forth from that time in 2020. Um, it was due to the, Tamara mentioned the impact of the fire affected communities. It's heartbreaking. I know that as Oregon, you all feel this of not being able to rehome and rehouse people quickly after a devastating effect like that. So we hope to just really reverse that and have um, products rolling out more quickly and so people can be rehomed and rehoused um, going forward. I want to thank also a few of my colleagues who are not with us here today. Lee McElvain is the Economic Development Specialist for um, the Oregon Department of Land Conservation Development, and Lee's specialty is rural economic development. We have a map at DLCD of all the defunct timber mills in Oregon put together by DEQ, and it's a really sad map. So we are very interested in helping to um, restore and um, amplify um, jobs in the woods and, and rural communities throughout Oregon to every extent possible. Patrick Wingard will be with us on um, our tour tomorrow and he managed the um, phase of work, which I'm gonna just speak to briefly here today. Could you help me advance the slide, Hillary? Not, nothing happens without Hillary, we know that. Thank you, <laughs> and Tamara. So um, our, thank you. our piece of this is called Code Up. So our moment in the sun for land use planners and building professionals, we don't, we don't often lead, but for everyone who lives in a home in Oregon, it's zoned and permitted and it kind of the magic that happens behind the scenes. We want to make sure that all of that is as um, simple as possible. So creating markets, you know, helping to create the market for modular mass timber by removing zoning code barriers. Our phase one funded by the US um, Economic Development Administration focused on um, code audits in five far impacted communities, Lincoln City, Gates, Detroit, Phoenix, and Talent. And um, we will be expanding that by virtue of having won the second phase of the award um, that um, my colleagues were alluding to today. But the goal is really to just make sure that um, once these products are created, they can be easily cited. And it's not as simple as one might, um, one might imagine. We had a house bill in Oregon um, just 18 months or so ago, um, House Bill 4064, which entitled, which allowed um, prefabricated structures to go anywhere a residential unit is allowed in Oregon. So that was quite revolutionary. Again, not a lot of fans of the land use, but I certainly want to appreciate those bill sponsors for making that happen. Um, however, there still remain a number of conflicts between building code and zoning code and design standards in communities. So when we got in partners with um, MIG and Angela Planning Group, got in and did those code audits. We found just a lot underneath the hood needs to be um, aligned in, in um, particularly in definitions, more allowances for cottage clusters. You mentioned, Ian mentioned the um, middle housing goals, our agency is front and center. We've typically been involved in supply. So just assuming if we zone it, they will come. That didn't work. <laughs> we have far too many people homeless and unsheltered now. I um, want to th be thankful of Governor Kotek's executive order um, 2304, which I think Margaret might speak to here in a moment, um, but centers um, the little state agency of DLCD as a housing production entity with DCBS. So we'll be ramping up the goals on production of housing. And so this back end work under the hood, just making sure these homes are able to be easily cited and permitted is crucial. So we tried to drop out of the funding run a couple of times and people said no. And we were like, it's such a small part, but people said no, stay in and um, help finish the story of where these homes eventually go in community where people can live in them. Um, I want to just touch, um, well, I should I should mention just a few of the things that will come forth from the phase two work, um, model code, contemporary park designs, making sure that accessory dwelling units are allowed throughout the state. A lot of our regulations affect communities 2,500 in population and more or 10,000 and more, but there's cities of all sizes throughout the state. So our, we won't really rest until um, these are permitted in all 273 cities throughout the state. Um, or permit easy permittable. I also want to thank um, Deanna Grimstead with Oregon Department of Forestry. One of the other hats I wear is tribal liaison, as deputy director. So we've been able to present to the cultural resources and the natural resources cluster of the Legislative Commission on Indian Services to make sure that um, Oregon's federally recognized tribes are, are invited early to participate in the program. Um, that that follow up will be necessary for sure. Um, Tamara mentioned kind of the equity goals in our grant. Um, we dedicated 51% of our funding to diverse community engagement to make sure that we're in dialogue with um, historically marginalized and underserved communities to understand sort of what housing types 
are desired. We don't just want to kind of say, here's our product, isn't it great? You know, but to be in a dialogue of listening um, of what's important to folks in the design, and then also an invitation that they might um, participate in the workforce development efforts. So we'll be going out for RFP, request for a proposal on that soon, looking to engage a nonprofit partner who specializes in diverse community engagement. Um, we've had some partners in development of the grant. Um, we hope they'll respond to that um, funding opportunity and others. Um, and then finally, um, I think Margaret will speak extensively to this, but the Housing Innovation Partnership and um, the Center of Excellence um, plan there for uh, manufactured um, uh, modular homes, um, looking forward to seeing, seeing how that might come forth. But really just want to appreciate again, Marcus, um, partners at the Oregon Mass Timber Coalition for, for believing that something better is possible for Oregon. And thank you for having us today. All right, thank you, Kirsten. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna close out this panel with one more speaker. I'm, I'm gonna have to switch seats, do a little musical chairs here. Okay. So we heard about kind of the the string of investments that we're working on within the Mass Timber Coalition, and really this idea of bringing forth modular mass timber housing. And as I got, as I got into this, and I think others did as well, recognizing the complexity that's in the housing crisis. This is, it's not a simple crisis. It's a multifaceted crisis that hits on lots of different levels. So we began this conversation um, with Margaret and the folks at um, Housing Innovation Partnership and really quickly recognized that there's, a, there's a, a whole broad community of people that are working to take on uh, attributes of the housing crisis. And, and, and modular construction as a method of, of production is a key strategy for that solution set, right? Modular construction. And then mass timber is one part of that modular part. So Margaret's going to talk a little bit about the broader housing strategy and our potential to um, become a center for innovation excellence. Uh, for those of you that don't know what that is, it's kind of the next iteration of Oregon Signature Research Centers. You know, we have signature research centers around nanotechnology around biotech and, and clean tech. And Business Oregon is now kind of renamed that process and is out comp competing for Centers for Innovation Excellence. And we're intending to put one forth for modular mass timber housing. So Margaret's going to kind of make the case around housing and how it all and how it all fits in. Um, and that's her expertise. So thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, Chair Kelly and uh, board members, it's great to be with you today. Uh, I don't know if if uh, Chair Kelly remembers, but uh, okay, his he uh, he rolled his eyes, so that suggests that we were youngsters then. We yes, were both <laughs> babies uh, when we worked together at the Housing Authority of Portland. Um, so yeah, so um, you, you can go ahead and start the the presentation. So Margaret Van Vliet, uh, I run a consultancy now, but in my past life, I uh, did a lot of different housing work including for the Housing Authority of Portland. For the state of Oregon, I actually ran the Housing and Community Services Department uh, under Governor Kitzhaber and uh, a variety of other jobs. And then I uh, transitioned to Sonoma County, thinking that a little job running at Little Housing Authority in wine country would be a nice glide path towards retirement. And then the place burned down. So um, anyway, so I have some wildfire experience in my background and uh, I'm glad to be back in Oregon and uh, glad to be part of these efforts and have some affiliation with the really good people at the Mass Timber Coalition. So yeah, so I'm gonna tell you about the, is this gonna work for me? Um, so I'm going to tell you about kind of the housing connections. Uh, you've heard it woven through what you've already heard this afternoon. I would just sort of reiterate the big idea here is that we have this, you know, the, the combined forces of climate change, rural economic despair, uh, race-based inequities, and then this chronic housing shortage uh, really sort of are driving a lot of our policy intent here and that we have this opportunity now uh, to tackle these challenges in a way that we can address them together and holistically. Um, 
and sort of speaking on behalf of the, the hoped for uh, CIE or Center for Innovation Excellence, we think the fact that the EDA, the federal government, has already sort of endorsed this approach speaks volumes about kind of what's the potential here. Um, and I think to Marcus's point here, all the investments you've just heard about with the Build Back Better regional grant, the $41 million, and all the other efforts that have been going on, if the housing sector isn't ready to take those issues up and to really adopt the technology, then it will it will be for naught. Or if it takes too long, we will have missed the opportunity. So that's sort of the big idea. Indeed, Governor Kotak, uh, you, if you're not a housing nerd, you may not have paid attention to this like I did, uh, but Governor Kotak issued an executive order on her first day in office uh, calling for kind of a state of emergency in, in housing in Oregon uh, and underscored, you can see the numbers there, but um, underscored the vast need for housing production um, in our state. The numbers here, I'll just quickly rattle them off. We have a current shortage of about 140,000 units. We're just that much behind today. Uh, but to, to keep up, to keep the market in balance, we need you know, 450,000 more units over the next 10 years, or excuse me, 20 years. It's a big order. Um, and so let me just sort of step back and sort of talk about, you know, so, some of this is obvious, but why housing matters and why it touches everything else in sort of society. Uh, what we know is homelessness is a, a direct result of a shortage of housing. And I don't probably have to tell folks in this room about uh, how bad the homelessness issue is across the state. Uh, what we find is that people who end up paying too much for their housing uh, neglect other needs. That has negative effects, of course. Children who are unstable, forced to move, uh, they suffer academically, they suffer in many other ways as well, uh, and then employers struggle to recruit uh, workers. So there's a lot of reasons. And so I think, again, it just, it just calls the question about why there's urgency around housing and how these solutions can work together um, to, to, to really address some of our most uh, persistent challenges. Um, I do think it's, we've talked a little bit about a, um, equity, uh, Tamara in particular, but I think, you know, in the housing space, and I've been a kind of a student of housing for over 30 years, racism in our housing system is alive and well, and we're living with the legacy of segregation in the past, but there's persistent racism as well, and that's part of the opportunity as we scale up housing, how do we do it in a way where we learn and, and kind of reverse those trends? Won't spend a lot of time on this, but there's lots of resources. We can, uh, uh, Kirsten and I can load you up with lots of resources about the shortage of housing, but the, suffice to say, it affects every region of the state. Uh, here's some numbers that get to that 443,000 units that we need to produce over the next uh, 20 years, and you can see, again, pr the preponderance is, of course, in the metro area, uh, but it's really a statewide problem. Um, the average number of units we've been building uh, per year, that is just measured by residential building uh, permits, is about 20,000 units per year. Uh, Governor Kotek's call to action in this executive order is to increase that by 80%. So her call to order it, or her call to action is a huge increase over what Oregon's been producing. Um, and so we come to the need, the urgency around innovation. Um, there's a lot that has not changed with how it is we produce and finance and cite housing uh, in, in many decades. Uh, just the way it is that home builders do their work, yes, there's been improvements, uh, but really the basics have not changed much. Uh, we're, we're updating, thankfully, the land use system. It was adopted 50 years ago. It's fantastic. And it didn't anticipate what we've got today. There's very little that's changed about the housing, affordable housing finance system. 
uh, local governments, as you heard, I understand a little bit earlier today, uh, especially in rural communities, uh, are, struggle with capacity. They, they, their revenue streams that accrue to local governments aren't sufficient to keep, you know, the a well uh, a well staffed planning department. Um, and then we were hit with the wildfires that destroyed 4,200 homes a couple of years ago. Um, so industry needs to move if we're going to meet this mandate from the governor. Um, it's starting to, but we want it to keep to, to reach scale. Um, and so one of these pieces that we're looking at very seriously, as you've heard, is uh, modular housing. Separate and apart from mass timber modular, just modular production uh, generally can really speed uh, construction and delivery of homes. Um, you know, it doesn't happen on day one of a factory building housing, but under the right conditions and at scale, uh, modular construction is more cost effective. It does save time. Uh, there's a lot less materials waste um, and it can produce really uh, high quality energy efficient homes. Um, it's also, frankly, safer working conditions for construction uh, uh, construction workers. This, uh, you don't need to memorize. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, this is the bubble chart, uh, we worked on. Uh, so we've, so we've thought about with the Oregon Mass Timber Coalition and the Housing Innovation Partnership that you've heard about, we've been thinking about what's the ecosystem for mass timber and modular housing look like? And how do we, are we sure that there's really a case to be made to do this, to ask Business Oregon and the Innovation Council to designate uh, our CIE and, and designate and fund our CIE. And so we did an assessment. Uh, I think it's a fascinating look at various parts of the industry. And this was sort of the diagram that came out of that effort. Um, it kind of, we've centered a lot on the supply chain in the middle, which goes from sort of timber owners all the way through uh, mills and fabricators, mass, uh, mass timber uh, factories, the development community, and so forth. There's private sector players in that. There's public sector funders and regulators kind of around the margins. Um, and so, so the system is really complex. And I think in some ways that fact by itself speaks to the need to have a designated place where we, that, that works on making the connections, that works on connecting developers and builders to the technology so it can be deployed. Um, so this is my last slide. This is kind of our best thinking at the moment about what a Center for Innovation Excellence uh, would look, could achieve, and what its primary functions would be. Uh, connecting the research and development to the home building industry is really the top thing, but there's other pieces as well. So I will stop there. Thank you, uh, and happy to answer questions. I'm not sure how you're running this piece here, but... Chair Kelly, it's up to, it's up to you all. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, we have a really special guy in the audience. Uh, Woody, can you stand up? Woody, Woody he is a professor here at Oregon State and took a bunch of us in uh, the industry to New Zealand a few years ago and showed us the CLT uh, projects at the university out of Christchurch. And they had just had those massive earthquakes. And we could see how the strength of that, and I, in the presentation, I didn't hear the word safety, but that was the number one thing they talked to us about was the safety of that um, material versus steel and, and concrete. And that was just so interesting. My family just finished a hundred plus unit project in Eugene. And Kirsten, I would, um, two things I would really look at. One is expediting codes and zoning is just everything to achieving this goal. And looking at the total cost of permitting and, and just the process that has nothing to do with building. Because it's alarming what a high percentage of the cost that is and that all accrues to the renter. And so I just applaud you to take a look at that and how do you expedite it and um, you know really help lower that cost. And then secondly, 
is incentivizing builders. You know, all of this comes down to incentives. Um, and we're all motivated by incentives because it's a high risk and you're putting capital at risk and you're putting capital to work. And how do you incentivize and expedite, you know, that process? So thank you for what you're doing. Um, we're going to need the wood. And we're sitting here on a $6 billion asset that should be part of this solution. And uh, I really applaud what you're all doing. Thank you. Thank you. Liz Ekpow for the record. Well, I'm not gonna be as efficient as Carla in one, two, three, because my palms are sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going back to um, Governor Kitzhaber visited us about a year ago and talked about being an emergency room doctor and articulated wonderfully what the consequences are um, in a declining, um, you know, when people lose their jobs and was looking at um, what good housing can do and address that chart. And I wrote a few things down there, Margaret. But my palms are sweating because this morning we listened to a room full of people um, who, uh, who were very passionate and professional about what it is that, um, you know, declines would be doing. And then, you know, you come up with, four th you know, 4,200 homes were lost. The need for um, 140,000 homes right now, and in 10 years, $450,000 of 4,000 homes that I wrote down. So um, I just want to, there is something about DNA, and I think that's come up a couple times. And um, in my DNA, I'm always going to be 5'2". I'll never be 6'1". That's just who I am. And there is a DNA in forested communities and forested watersheds. It's who they are. So um, what I loved about your elegant and comp complex bubble, but it was elegant, is that um, between hearing what Governor Kutzhaber said a year ago and just trying to figure out how does it all work, you one by one by one by one in this panel went through and it looks like, you know, within a few years have put together all your talents um, to start down a path that gives me such hope. And, um, ja, you know, good for you, <laughs> well, folks. I mean, I think that's the, like, I am like actually happy right now. <laughs> I'm like, I don't oh, good. optimistic, <laughs> you know, can that be true? Anyway, um, so I want to just thank you, and I thank you for letting me come in for a landing and babble around for a bit. We're always happy to bring the hope. Thanks. I, you know, obviously you all know that the work you're doing is so important, and uh, so I don't have to tell you that. Um, it's, it's, it is very impressive to hear about it. And I don't know where it was. I was just reading recently about the fact that, you know, over the last few decades, we decades, we have had as, as a society, tremendous improvements in most industries in terms of efficiency, um, you know, manufacturing in just about any area of the economy, except for one construction. And uh, that's what I, you know, so what I really like hearing is that you guys are attacking all the different facets of this um, and if I remember the you know main takeaways from that article was permitting process, huge amount of process that we have to get anything built anymore, and obviously particularly in uh, commercial areas. And then the other is just the technology, you know, and then and and what you said, Margaret, you know, just we really haven't moved very far in the technology since World War II. and and so you guys are uh, addressing that, you know, uh, head on uh, with the approach on on modular. So, uh, congratulations to all of you. I do have one question, and that is, um, you know, and I totally uh, understand and agree that we have to have a huge focus on workforce housing, but uh, where is the nexus here with SRO housing? Um, and, you know, the type of places where we may, maybe we all have communal bathrooms and all of that. Is there a nexus here with uh, the... Um, Absolutely. The, yeah, yeah, tell us about uh, that. Yeah, thank you, Chair Kelly. The So the, we, the, the only pictures you saw, I think, of housing were... Um, 
kind of small scale look like single family or maybe duplexes. So absolutely the technology can be used in multifamily buildings and tall buildings. So uh, mass plywood panels uh, can absolutely be used and have been used. Uh, there's one new building open that's a multifamily affordable project that uses mass timber uh, panels for the walls and I think ceilings, if I'm not mistaken. We just heard about it the other day, Marcus and I did. Uh, and then modulars can be stacked and in fact uh, are being stacked in other states um, and, and more frequently in Europe. So the type of unit you can design um, and build and then either do in cottage clusters or do tall buildings that are multifamily at any affordability level, right? So if you want deeply affordable, you'd probably use all the normal affordable housing finance tools. Um, and if you want at market rate, you may not need that public, you may or may not need that public subsidy. So all product types, rental and ownership, I think are possible. Okay. And Tamara, one thing I would also say uh, to you is that uh, Portlanders need things to, you know, to pin some hope on, and uh, <laughs> and, and you know, having what's going on at, at Terminal Two, uh, I just hope that um, that you will have a uh, vibrant program going on for the public to be invited in and and to be able to see what's happening there. Brenda. Just a quick question. Um, do you have a, any estimate of what a trained workforce would look like to be able to accomplish the building goals that were set out? Not yet. We're in the early stages of basically what we're trying to understand right now is community. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, we're trying to figure out what the workforce. Sorry to make you come back up. Sorry, um, thank you for your question about workforce. So one of the goals we're doing right now, um, as you saw in Margaret's map, there's a lot of complexities of where workforce intersects. And so what we're trying to do is take that and do a kind of a deeper understanding of what programs are already existing that might just need to be adapted. Um, and then what are the things that we actually need to do new? And so that's what we're doing the work right now and assessing. So um, I think we'll have more information about that in about six months once we've done some more testing, but we don't know the exact. Is, we were asking like in general, what is it going to take or how much it's going to cost? Well, a two, kind of a two-part question, I guess. So thank you for that. I, I understand that you need to understand where the programs are, but it's the people. Uh, getting the people into the programs and having them have the skills, especially with increasing levels of technology uh, in, in this new form of building, um, so that that doesn't become the thing that slows down the process in terms of achieving these goals. Right. And that's what we're starting now. So it's um, our hope is that while the factory still is probably about three to four years out to being built, that we're doing some understanding and engagement and testing to understand so that we can have workers ready um, by the time the factory is built. But one of our other partners is Work Systems Inc., which has connections across the state and the Oregon Workforce Board to make sure that we have career navigators that can go and connect once these jobs and these opportunities are in place and or um, specific training programs or pre-apprenticeship programs that we are going to be kind of doing some more targeted outreach. Thank you. All right. So, Chair Kelly, if, you, if, if you're willing, we can move on to the two forestry projects on this. I know that we're kind of running a little bit behind schedule and we have a, a break coming up, um, but it's it's up you, to you, sir. You bet. Um, you know, we can, we can go a little bit longer before we do that break, so go right ahead. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll invite uh, Kyle Sullivan with ODF up here and uh, Dwayne Bishop with the Willamette National Forest, Deputy Supervisor. So let me just set this set up this aspect of the project. Um, obviously, we're concerned about where the wood comes from. And one of our goals is really to demonstrate that we can have a supply chain from restoration activities on federal forests that fits its way into um, into modular mass timber housing. And I also should mention while that Paul Vanderford is going to be a part of this panel uh, as well. We just couldn't fit him fit him up here. Actually, there's a chair, Paul. So why don't, why don't you come on up as well? 
So really this aspect of our project is entitled advancing a forest restoration supply chain. And it, and it really, it builds off of the work of ODF's federal forest restoration program. Um, and we chose to work with the Willamette National Forest because we have a long history of partnership, partnership and successful collaborative work on the southern end of the forest. And when you show up and you say, hey, we might have several million dollars that we want to put to work, you have to have solid relationships in place, good standard operating procedures, a good track record so that you can take the next step and go in, into the next gear. Uh, and really, that's what we had with the Willamette uh, is, is a solid, solid way of doing business. Uh, so I'll, I'll let Kyle and Dwayne talk about that. And Sustainable Northwest's role in this uh, is essentially around a vastly improved program of accountability and transparency. So we're taking wood products from federal forests and putting them into, into the supply chain. And there is no proxy stamp for FSC or SFI that we can apply to that to give consumers the confidence that the wood that they're, that they're getting is from well-managed forests. So we, we face a bit of a, a confidence gap uh, with regard to wood from federal forests because it's, it's far more complex. So that's what the track and trace program is all about is to show people where the wood comes from, to give them the insight into the, the economic outcomes, the socio, socio and ecological outcomes of this kind of work. Uh, and so that's, what, that's really what that is all about. It's, it's socioeconomic monitoring and monitoring where the wood is gonna go. So I'll let, I'll let Paul talk about that and Kyle's gonna kick us off with the insights into the Federal Forest Restoration Program. Thanks, thanks Marcus. Um... Chair Kelly, members of the board, State Forester uh, Mukamoto, for the record, Kyle Sullivan Astor, um, and I serve as the uh, Federal Forest Restoration Program Lead at ODF, and happy to be here to, to speak to the, the advancing uh, restoration supply chain portion of this, this EDA project um, and the Federal Forest Restoration Programs uh, and ODF's work uh, on this project. If we could pull up, um, yeah. Um, the slide deck. And so if you'll bear with me, I'm going to briefly I'll, I'll go through this as briefly as I can, but I did want to set a little bit of the context for the program's work um, overall um, and just level set with a little bit of context. Um, these, these are all of our forests in Oregon, 30 million acres, um, covers half the state. And just illustrating, uh, this is 60% of the ownership and it's under federal jurisdiction, 17 million acres. Um, illustrating the importance of those, those federal forests in meeting the department's mission, protect, promote stewardship, uh, managing Oregon's forests. Um, and so why, again, just setting the stage for why this program exists at ODF, it actually is grounded in work in this board. Um, in 2009, uh, there was a, a report released achieving Oregon's vision for federal forest lands, which really just laid out the vision for the board and how federal forests can contribute to sustainability. Um, and it is really anchored in that mission. Our mission doesn't define jurisdictional boundary. Uh, it's, per, it's all of Oregon's forests, all 30 million acres. And so the work um, really bridges the gap between state and private forests and the federal forests in Oregon. A lot of our wildfire risk occurs on our federal forest lands. Uh, this 65%, uh, according to the light, latest quantitative wildfire risk assessment, um, is on federal jurisdiction. And how do we address that? Well, we have a forthcoming 20 year strategic plan. Um, and I think that the program is gonna be a real integral tool to helping mitigate and, and uh, mitigate wildfire risk. Um, and then just overall, I think the program is really a mechanism to link board priorities, mitigation, adaptation from climate change, creating uh, new forest resource markets to federal forest lands uh, in, the, in Oregon. So it's, it's kind of a mechanism for, for the board to, to link to federal forests. Um, just very briefly, so we do have, this is what really guides us, our mission and our, and our legislation that's on the books, the state legislation that guides our work uh, in the program, our mission to increase pace, scale and quality of federal forest restoration. And uh, it is a policy of the state to pursue projects under good neighbor authority that increase timber harvest volume, contribute to job creation, reduce wildfire risks, uh, improve wildlife life habitat and uh, stimulate local economies. And how do we achieve that mission? 
and and uh, adhere to that guiding legislation. It's through two through a blend of funding sources, uh, through federal and state funds, and through three program components. The first is good neighbor authority. We use good neighbor authority as a tool uh, to implement both commercial and non-commercial restoration projects. Uh, through our federal partner support component of the program, it's really about alleviating those bottlenecks in the system to planning and implementing uh, forest restoration on, on federal forests. Um, and then also importantly, our collaborative support component, which is basically two uh, grant programs that are really trying to build social license and build agreement among di diverse stakeholders um, um, in Oregon. This is those same fund sources and same program components broken out into our biennial budget. And um, the real key takeaways here are the just the sheer amount of federal resources we're able to leverage with the state uh, resources that we have. Um, and, um, and also important how important those state general fund pieces are to the collaborative support, to funding uh, critical staff, um, and to do the NEPA planning work that's necessary um, uh, on within our program. Um, the program really does take a systemic approach to, to this work um, and uh, both doing the planning, the implementation, of course, but also that monitoring and collaboration, the full adaptive management cycle to this work um, and just some select accomplishments, um, tens of thousands of acres of commercial and non-commercial work nine contracted CE or categorical exclusion projects, just the state funds alone, 38 jobs and $3 million in GDP per year, um, and engaging with over, over 20 uh, forest collaboratives in the state. So just illustrating the impact of the program. So on to the actual project itself. Um, so our goal with this project was to partner with the Willamette National Forest, as Marcus had indicated, to both plan and implement um, forest thinning treatments that adhere to all the applicable federal laws, uh, produce restoration fiber for the, lo uh, the local mass timber, timber manufacturers, and achieve uh, both positive and uh, ecological and so social outcomes. So resilience to disturbance, structural heterogeneity in the stand, road improvement and road access, uh, public access. Um, and so just breaking those out into two kind of big buckets, right? There's the planning and then the implementation side um, so on the planning, investing these EDA funds in the procurement of the surveys, documentation, and analysis, basically what we refer to as contract NEPA. Um, so procuring those services uh, to, to have uh, three projects go through the system. The first two are 70-acre um, contract, uh, the categorical exclusion projects. The third is going to be... Um, a little bit larger of a planning area, possibly using a new fuel break category uh, that was established in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, and so on the implementation side, uh, working with the Willamette National Forest, we've identified a commercial thinning already analyzed under NEPA um, that, that would be a good candidate for this project. So it's ready to be implemented. It's located uh, in an area near an engineered wood facility. Um, and it's also within a high uh, fire watershed. Um, and then the second commercial thinning project is really just implementing the, the planning of those first two 70 acre uh, projects. So 140 acre commercial thinning. All of this work is going to be taking place over the grant term, which is um, through September of 2026. Um, so fair, fair amount of work within that roughly three, three year time frame. Um, but just illustrating, you know, what what is this commercial uh, good neighbor authority, and what is the opportunity there, and how does this this look? This this graphic really kind of tries to illustrate some of how that can work. Um, a good neighbor authority timber sale can really generate revenue um, to do a variety of different things, but non commercial thinning in this case, planning area for the next planning area, doing aquatic restoration monitoring, and preparing a prescribed fire treatment. Um, and so in this case, the timber sale A is leading to planning area and B in timber sales B, C, and D are, are generated. In this case, C and D are implemented through the forest service by conventional means. Um, that's generating funds for the counties. Um, and then B is implemented through good neighbor authority. 
and uh, generate, you know, is funds from that are going to the next planning area. And in this case, again, this example, a fuel break. So just illustrating that cyclical nature of the, and the potential of this work under Good Neighbor, um, and also how it can leverage um, be, well, how can actually be additive and, and leverage um, and add to the program of work uh, of the, the forest. Um, so just very briefly before I close out, some of our priorities for moving forward in the next biennium, the 23-25 biennium, cross-boundary projects, I think, are where ODF really has the ability to leverage our, our strengths, working on our state and private forests and, and leveraging our work in this program. Um, continuing to pursue projects that are additive, that's the key to this. Um, and how, how we do that is through our, our planning work, through the, uh, the NEPA process. Um, and then continuing to plan and implement projects within high wildfire risk landscapes. So this is the quantitative wildfire risk assessment, top four risk, wildfire risk categories, and then just some of our priority areas. And the Dry Beard project is actually on the north end of the Willamette, and it's within a, a high-risk watershed, and it, uh, it's also within one of our priority areas. Um, and then I'll just close with acknowledging some of the risks and challenges as, to this work. Um, litigation and wildfire are really the top two. We've had one of our contract uh, NEPA projects uh, litigated, um, and we've had four projects uh, burned, completely burned, um, since we began this work. Um, payments to counties, uh, the, the, you know, the perceived impact that the Good Neighbor Authority work has on the, those payments to, to the counties has been a political challenge. Um, it's mitigated by really being an additive and focusing on really not supplement, you know, supplementing that program of work and, and, and actually, you know, adding capacity as opposed to just uh, augmenting, uh, capacity. Um, and, and that challenge is illustrated uh, even on this, this map here showing the, the ONC lands within national forest. Our national forests have ONC lands as well as the BLM. Um, and those are areas where we've actually avoided doing any commercial work. Um, but you could see the challenge of that with also wanting to do cross boundary work because those just happen to be the, the areas that are adjacent to all the private lands, uh, a lot of the private lands in Western Oregon. So there's, there's kind of diametrically opposed forces there. Um, and then nothing new here with environmental reviews are costly and time consuming. And, and many of these projects, um, particularly in Southwest Oregon, Eastern Oregon, they don't pay for themselves. And so it needs outside uh, public funding in, in some way. So those are just some challenges. And I think we'll probably do questions after Dwayne, uh, Dwayne goes, so. All right, Dwayne, great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So good afternoon, State Forester Mukamoto, uh, Chair Kelly, and members of the board. My name is Dwayne Bishop. I'm the uh, Deputy Forest Supervisor for the Willamette National Forest. Uh, when I was asked to talk today about the EDA uh, Mass Timber Coalition and our part in advancing the forest supply chain, you know, I had a yes out of my mouth before even thinking about it. Um, uh, I've, I've been involved with GNA sales since the original SPA was signed in 2018. And um, I've just I've found ODF to be a great partner, um, really leveraging more work, more restoration on public land. So um, I've uh, I look forward to how how this this project will move forward with the EDA. Um, so for me, uh, you know, as I was talking with Liz at the break, uh, you know, I'm 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 uh, in my 31st year working for the Forest Service, and. Uh, I've always grounded my work in public service and a strong land ethic for future generations. Um, and uh, when I was approached to become a partner of this, um, the supply chain, I found it a great opportunity for the Forest Service um, to be public in public service in a different way um, and in a lasting way. Um, I really believe that this will hopefully uh, carry forward with uh, Oregonians in, into the future. Um, most of my career has been around natural resource uh, management, providing recreation opportunities for individuals and families while providing goods for uh, the, the public and from public lands. Uh, for me, I see a direct connection with this EDA grant, um, the science of building of affordable homes and the supply chain that may have not historically been used for the, these products. Um, 
As we continue to explore and learn how to utilize these products to build affordable homes, I see long-term benefits for Oregonians and for our environment. I also see an opportunity to share with the public the thoughtful and in-depth way we complete our environmental analysis when we do any sorts of projects on public land. I look forward to uh, pre, during, and post-harvest field trips uh, with the partners to visit these sites where we generate this material. I think uh, it's really uh, critically important for us to show where this where this material does come from, you know, uh, stump to truck, truck to mill, mill to uh, ultimately the building site, or as we spoke of earlier, the campus, you know, at, at T2. Um, I think it's really critical for us to, to do a better job of showing where these wood products come from, and it's not Home Depot. And I, I think that's a really important point, and I think for Oregonians, um, for a lot of them, they've departed from that understanding where their wood comes from. So um, I think Kyle did a, a great job and thorough job at talking about the history and the goals for, for the Federal Forest Restoration Program. Um, I wanted to kind of give a little bit of context and what we as a um, kind of the, the source for the wood uh, for this, kind of what we're fighting through right now. So most recently, we've the Willamette's experienced uh, large extended fire seasons that really began back in 2017 um, and that all the way that have continued up until this year um, you know of course we've we've heard a lot of people talk today about holiday farm lion's head beachy uh, all of those were on the willamette um, and that was just in 2020 uh, in 21 we had the middle fork complex and then of course 22 we had the the cedar creek fire you know that's that's about 360,000 acres on a 1.7 million acre forest. And so uh, huge, Im huge impacts to, to uh, the forest, uh, our staff, and, and also our work. Um, so how do, how, do we, how do we manage through this? Um, you know, the, the Willamette National Forest is under the Northwest Forest Plan that was signed back in 1994. And with that, we have several land allocations that kind of give us direction on different parts of the forest. As an example, matrix land um, is really the primary, the primary driver for matrix designated land is, is for timber production for local economies and, and community. We have other things like um, uh, uh, LSR, late successional reserves, riparian reserves, wilderness areas, or adaptive management areas. And those are areas designated where we can try new science and different types of science around uh, um, innovative wood products. Um, so as you can see, uh, um, you know, for us being a multiple use agency um, and with, with land allocation giving us kind of direction, plus overlaying the 360,000 acres plus of forest land that, was, that has been burned in the last few years, um, we have, a lot, we have a, lot of, a lot of challenges ahead of us. Um, so what have we done with those challenges? Um, We've been working on the NEPA, the, the sold and awarded sales. We actually had some sales that were in the middle of being cut um, as well as near completion. Um, we've done the analysis and a lot of the negotiation on the, those sales from 2020, and we're still working on 2021 and now 22 sales. So again, a big workload for us. <clears throat> so I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, with, GNA funds and and specifically the EDA um, program is looking at, at restoration, um, which are really important products of, of the project, um, either passive or active restoration. Passive, we use such things as our land allocations like wilderness, late successional reserves, and other ways to allow for passive restoration towards a healthy forest. More active, active restoration, um, we, we do planning and implementation of specific restoration actions. I think Kyle highlighted it earlier. You know, we have probably hundreds to thousands of acres that of that, that really um, homogenous, you know, one cohort, one, uh, one canopy, usually one species types of, of stands that are, are second growth that we really need to do some work in um, and, and focusing on um, um, forest resiliency and, and restoration. So um, we also, other opportunities for us with mass timber is we have, we have a, a large number of stands that are past that pre-commercial thinning stage, but yet they're not quite commercial. 
And so those acres, we can maybe invest those into mass timber, um, do uh, improve our in, uh, restoration and recovery of those stands, but also move them to this new this this new target of mass using it in mass timber. So lots of really great opportunities there. Um, also wanted to highlight, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the restoration that's funded with GNA funds, like uh, stream restoration, wildlife restoration. Uh, road maintenance, road improvement. Um, you know, we had over 400 miles of road that that were significantly damaged from the 2020 fires alone. And so using some of those receipts to do some of that work, as well as our traditional receipts um, from traditional sales like, uh, you know, KV sales uh, towards those can, can, uh, can really help us in that work. So, uh, you know, as, as Kyle had mentioned, you know, right now we have a, a pretty good track record on the Willamette, actually an excellent track record. We have nine sales to date. Um, four of them are completed. One of them, which was in the Holiday Farm Fire, which, which was lost, um, and we've been working through that. We have two sales that are ready um, and two in progress. And then we had one sale that was prepped and ready, and then the, the Gales Fire um, from the 21 Middle Fork Complex uh, took that sale. So we have completed one NEPA, um, a CE uh, that was uh, in the, the, that has been completed and that's moving forward as well. And um, I, and I know I'm between us and a break, so I'm, I'm <laughs> cutting a bunch of my talk. So, um, <laughs> um, so I, I guess for me uh, in closing, um, uh, we, we, and I'm speaking for the forest and even for the forest service in general, we very much value the federal forest restoration program and the use of GNA sales. Um, and the many opportunities this EDA grant will, will provide us, uh, we fully expect to explore, learn, and grow with through this experience. We also look forward to continuing to work with OSU U, and U of O and share our successes and our challenges for the betterment of the under, and understanding of this product. Um, we look forward for the opportunity to work with the many uh, partners in the mass, the Oregon Mass Timber Coalition. Many are new to us. Many, many are new partners. I would say to the to the to the Willamette National Forest. Um, we look forward to finding that common ground and understanding, and a focusing on affordable uh, homes to the market and closing that housing gap in Oregon. Um, again, I think this is kind of a new a new era for us, at least on the national forest system side of the house. Um, and then lastly, I uh, wanted to mention, you know, we had a number of employees that lost their houses in the 2020 uh, fires. Um, and so this is very near and dear to a number of our employees that are in these local communities. And so, again, this, this is a, a really strong project for them. And then lastly, um, I, I really wanted to reiterate what I started to say at the beginning was this is really, you know, our, the Forest Service motto is caring for the land and serving people. And again, looking at this EDA uh, grant and the opportunity strikes out just solidly. And so we, we're very excited about it. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll hand back. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Chair Kelly, should we continue or is, was the board, would the board like to take a break? I think, um, uh, hey, what else do you guys have left to, to uh, Paul Vanderford would, would take a couple moments to talk about track and trace. Why don't we wait? Um, and, uh, we'll, we'll take a, a short, uh, 10 minute break and, and then we can do that and uh, follow up with any questions. Uh, and hopefully not be too far behind schedule. I know I'm a nag. Um, okay. we'll take a break then. All right, we'll we'll take a break, uh, and um, just about three thirty. So we'll uh, return uh, at three forty. Thank you. Great, thank you.
Okay, we're ready to um, be back in session. We had a uh, uh, the last part of a presentation to get done here. Okay. A rowdy crowd today. Yeah, we'll get things back going again. All right. So, Chair Kelly, members of the board, State Forester Mukamoto, we're going to close out the panel on the advancing forest re forest restoration supply chain with Paul Vanderford from Sustainable Northwest to talk about our track and trace program. Um, and really just to recall kind of the, the reason we created this is to boost consumer confidence as we build this new market for modular mass timber. So we'll have evidence and transparency. We can point back to, to that of like, yes, this is where your wood came from. So that's kind of the whole purpose of that is to kind of provide that backstop uh, as we seek to increase social license. So, Paul. Thanks, Marcus. I'm Paul Vanderford. I work at Sustainable Northwest as the Green Markets Program Director. Um, thank you very much for having me here today. It's definitely an honor. Uh, so Sustainable Northwest, I feel like it's worth at least saying who we are. <laughs> um, we've been around for 27 years and we cut our teeth helping to establish middle ground for forest restoration on federal lands, trying to avoid the impasses that get created in the litigation that sometimes comes out of that. And so, you know, after 27 years, we um, have in various forms supported that collaborative process across several different um, states and, and, and national forests. We have 27 staff, as well as a wood warehouse where we help bring fiber from 42 different local mills and, and operations across the Pacific Northwest into an urban setting and try to promote and sell that product um, as we can. The programs that we have at Sustainable Northwest include forestry, rangeland, water, energy, green markets. Um, and I think the reason I'm here <laughs> is because, um, you know, we've, we're talking about housing and I think it's really inspiring all the things we've heard so far. And we're talking about forests and we know that forests are not a binary situation. And we know that there's tension there. And we know that there's a lot of really good work that gets done on the forest landscape. And it's easy to talk past each other because if you're building a building, wood could come from anywhere. And so how do you tether that wood to the results we're talking about on the landscape? And my career has been building markets that recognize and reward forest stewardship in its various exemplary forms. So to dig into that a little bit more, I would say we're dealing with a commodity market and the commodity market intentionally in its goals removes identity and re removes recognition for where it comes from so that you can sell a uniform product. And so what we're working against is, is that natural market force. And we uh, uh, have some tools, right? I mean, there are green building standards. There are third party certifications. But none of those market tools that are in front of us allow us to drill down to the people and places to recognize and honor those values in a meaningful way. And none of them have been set up in the space to try to understand and connect to restoration work. A lot of them are driven by an attempt to kind of bring a bar up from some minimal place to some other place. But what we're talking about is really something entirely different. And so reestablishing that connection. And the thing that's been really a joy for me over my career has been connecting with projects that have a lot of ambition and helping them understand what the opportunities are for them to connect in real ways to the positive impacts on the ground that we've been talking to. Um, you know, sometimes people are asking about, can I connect to a family forest? Can I connect to a tribally managed and, and, um, and fiber coming from tribal community forests? Can I connect to forests where wildfire risk is being dealt with? Because I'm really seeing that as an issue and I'd like to build in a way and procure my fiber in a way that has a value there. So reestablishing that relationship is what I do. And the tools that you put forward to make that happen is what I'm going to spend the rest of the time here talking about. So thankfully, we have had a chance to create and test some ways to do this. We have had Wood Innovations grants to try to create pathways for the market to drill down and find these values. And over the past five years, we've um, essentially created six options. And we've had the op opportunity to partner with the Port of Portland on their large project that was mentioned earlier. 
we've had a chance to connect with Ray Hall at OSU uh, and some of the fiber going on there uh, to trace it back to the Yakima Nation, to trace it back to the Colville National Forest and honor the restoration work happening on both those landscapes. And uh, the honor to work with Meyer Memorial Trust on their headquarters to connect to um, seven small family um, wood products businesses, six um, businesses uh, that were minority owned and to connect all 12 different wood items in their in their uh, headquarters to forests in this region, which was really important for Meyer because of their desire to support jobs in these communities. So we have these pathways. We know how it can be done across different scales, right? The largest mass timber building in the country, the, you know, more kind of commercial applications and then and then headquarters. And, and we do this work on projects I'm not including here that are smaller in scale. And so I think we have found ways to connect with and honor these goals um, already. And so now what we're doing is we're applying that uh, to, to our work moving forward. And I would just say some of the measures for success so far that I've felt were, are the mills, which are sometimes skeptical about some of the unique requests we make of them, willing to do it again? You know, if we're getting in their business and asking, hey, can you buy fiber from here? Or what, what is this all about? Show us some transparency. You know, there's a natural opposition to say, hey, I'm just in the business of selling wood. And I want to recognize that. So one of my gauges for success was, are the people we're asking these questions to at the end of the project interested in doing it again? And I'd say that Zippo Laminators in Eugene, one of the main vendors for the Portland airport, 2.2 million board feet of, of blue lamb beams in that project. I wish they had done the... Um, the uh, Hayward Field re remodel because they're right here. And for some reason, that fiber came from a lot further away. But Casey Holstrom and John Redfield there are they're saying, who, who else wants this? Who else wants to do this? And so I see that as success. Um, you know, for the Terminal 2 airport project, we had leadership from the port. We had the construction teams, Swinerton, Timber Lab, ZGF Architects come out to Yakima Forest Products and tour the mill, go out to Yakima, nation's forest land with some of the elders so they could learn about the cultural first food and medicine values that were personified in the restoration work done there. So we know it's possible. We know it's possible at scale. So the work that we're doing here, and, and uh, there's kind of three core areas of work that Sustainable Northwest is doing for, for um, Mass Timber Coalition. And we first and foremost are doing track and trace so that we can establish that, that connectivity, that we can give the transparency needed to achieve the linkage between a building and a forest. Um, you know, we're doing that for the Willamette National Forest work that was described in detail a moment ago. We're doing that for Ferraris, which is one of the mills um, in the wood basket, as well as anyone else who gets involved in the fiber procurement. And uh, we're doing that for some of the affordable housing vendors. Um, Ernesto at Hacienda has been doing really great work. Ben Kaiser at, at Path House has been doing really great work. Anna McKay at Shortstack and others are doing really great work. And as we advance this, they'll all be needed in order for us to hit those housing goals. So the track and trace work we're doing, we're really wanting to honor both this unique source back to this particular forest, as well as understanding what are the opportunities more broadly for the amount of fiber needed for this success across our entire state. Uh, you'll see in here that that pie chart is is from Ferraris a couple years ago. They gave that to us as part of track and trace for the Portland airport. And then the, I should mention that the unit on the right is one of Hacienda's prototypes. We were trying to get it down here. It's too expensive. Um, so the second, <laughs> if anyone could carry really heavy things. So the second phase is we need to have deep authenticity and we need to be able to have the optics of this project be one of our strengths. And I think Sustainable Northwest has built a part of this scope so that we can be with the Forest Service, with ODF, as the planning process is going on to avoid pitfalls that we understand over the last 27 years have caused problems in projects. And then how can we put a monitoring program in place so that we can have pre and post harvest treatment monitoring and really speak to the trajectory of these stands moving forward based on best science? And we can really help answer people's questions that come with legitimate integrity asking, is this really right for the forest? Is this really an ecologically benefit out outcome? And so that we can speak truth to that. And, you know, we will show what transpires, right? It, it, the blemishes and, and the good. 
And so we're planning to have, you know, if we need publishable level, high quality monitoring, and if, and if there's a lot of social buying from the get-go, then targeting our work there um, to really speak to those values in other ways. And then the last part is the funnest part by far, which is getting people on the ground. I mean, people, uh, when they see the work we're trying to do, will be excited too. And the storytelling, the opportunity to both bring people in the flesh, as well as bring stories to people through video and in other formats is really powerful. And the work we did with uh, Edward James Ray Hall at OSU is what I've thrown on here just as an example, but the Future Forest website has deep content where you can hear from um, individuals from the Yakima Nation and, and you can hear them talk about the fiber that, that went into this project. You can hear people on the Colville, including environmental groups that historically litigated against those timber sales, talk about why they supported the restoration work that produced the fiber that went into this project. And so um, that is the, the third part of the scope that we're gonna do. And we're gonna, we're gonna, there's gonna be so many valuable ways for us to bring those stories forward. And I suspect it'll be the thing that galvanizes people to push through the hard times because not all of it is easy, <laughs> but if we can inspire people, I think there's a way to achieve the goals that we have. So I would say we also are not doing this alone. Others are attempting to do this. We have tech clients that are trying to do this with massive campuses. We have um, private industry doing this in various formats. And so uh, just know that other mills are being asked these questions. The transparency we're putting in place is not just for our own project. It's something that we can really put forward and use as a, as a way to galvanize value and support for our state's forests. Uh, Sustainable Northwest is leading, um, putting $25 million on the ground with 190 different producers, including five tribes to do restoration work on private landscapes. And we're gonna trace those fiber supplies and show those maps and create the tools for the market to buy that fiber too. And so this is a complementary set of work. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that because that's not why we're here, but just know that we're not doing this in isolation. And the big picture here is that there's a lot of money and attention being put on the ground. And a lot of times it's put, being put down separately, right? People spend money to try to figure out housing. People spend money to try to reduce wildfire risk. People spend money to create rural jobs. What we're doing is a, in a big picture is we are creating a situation where when we develop housing, we are solving forest health. When we're solving forest health, we're creating fiber for housing. We start to create this really nice positive feedback loop that I think really gets us the resources we need that aren't in any of those individual buckets. Then it helps us kind of knit together the narrative that we need to succeed. Uh, so my thanks for hanging in here. I think this is my last one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to really double down on the point that transparency is our friend here and that there's really nothing to hide. Um, you know, strong scientific defensibility has to be the foundational piece of scaling this. And, you know, having the partners like Hacienda and Path House and all the others succeeding and then buying in and having the resources they need is going to be critical for the scale we're talking about. And then the very last thing I would say is, uh, you know, we really have to bake into the recipe of this pie, the, um, the different values we're talking about so that we come out the other side with the social license that we need and the inspiration that we need for people to, to really do all this good work. So uh, hopefully I didn't go too far off the main topic of the three things we're doing for this project, but I wanted to put it into that, um, into that larger context. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Paul. Chair Kelly, y'all have any questions? Um, I'll start with one, Paul. Um, do you have any recommendations uh, in, in terms of uh, what the Board of Forestry should be doing relative to that kind of work or, or policy positions that, that you would um, be seeking? I don't know enough about the mechanics okay. to give a good answer to that, but I would say, you know, the acres that are being treated by some of the work that the Good Neighbor Authority is doing here, you know, hopefully this is the start. And so whatever we can do to help line up what we learn and deploying it across the next level of scale is going to be really important. And my, my attention would probably go there, but I um, I don't have anything else probably all that useful to, to respond with. Other questions? Go ahead, uh, Joe. Um, I, I have two questions, Paul. First, um, 
as far as you know the narrative about where the wood is coming from are you talking any about the forest practices act in oregon uh the new private forest accord the regula regulations of wood just that's you know in place that uh, is under the authority of this board is that part of your narrative about talking about wood is that absolutely i think you know i think as soon as we start talking about where's wood coming from people can it naturally and understandably be defensive we do a lot people are asked to do a lot and so just sharing what it is we do as a baseline is important and helping people understand what the Oregon Forest Practices is doing, what, you know, what things we're seeing and what we're, we're learning over time. I think those are all useful things. And, you know, the Meyer Memorial Trust Project, their primary goal was let's support jobs in this region. Let's buy wood from here. So, you know, these affordable housing partners are going to get bids from Europe. They're going to get bids from places that are not going to have impacts that we're talking about today. And so I think the primary focus is to make people recognize that that's a baseline we need to achieve. The baseline probably needs to be know where your wood comes from and get it from here. Mm -hmm. So honoring what the from here means in all of its forms, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a second question for Dwayne. I'm going to talk about the elephant in the room, uh, supply. Uh, you know, Mar Marcus, you know, pointed out the two challenges that, you know, not surprising, you know, uh, workforce development and log supply. Uh, since you're here and i appreciate you being here duane um representing the forest service and we you know we this board discusses a lot of you know even though it's not under our, our authority you know what's happening on neighbor you know the the largest landowner in oregon the US forest service public lands um what do you think the real potential of supply is from a lambent national forest uh in the forest that you manage and how do we get there i mean how do we you know we're talking about um you know building these houses and our housing crisis you know and I, I i applaud the work that you're doing the scale of it is troubling and how do we build scale how do we do that Dwayne? <laughs> okay how long do we have? Um, that's a 64 dollar question um you know to try not to go too far into the weeds i think i think uh you know, there's a, there's a couple thoughts there. You know, one, we still have lots of fire recovery to do, um, and and some of that material, um, I think we have uh, danger trees that were that we'll plan to remove. Um, you know, in the next couple of years, around 250 miles of road. Um, that's a lot of a lot of volume in and of itself. That's kind of as well as, and I'm not going to talk about the GNA side of it right away. Um, we we continue to be successful with our GNA. We we talk quite often about how do we grow that? How do we make it bigger? You know, ODF has invested with more staff just recently. Uh, the, and I mean this last year to continue to grow that. We're very much interested in growing that as well. Um, and looking at different ways to to grow our own program. Um, it, it is it is hard. We're we're just now starting to understand with the the number of you know 360,000 acres that are burnt uh, on the forest, um, and its effects to to like spotted owls. What you know we're relooking at that. Um, how much habitat did we lose? How much? Um, what can we do in the remaining habitat? I think uh, you know we're we're just now beginning to that. Um, with the goal of also trying to um, uh, to imp uh, increase restoration, you know, we're looking at doing uh, working on um, potential. Uh, uh, we're calling them pods, which I'm sure you've most of you have heard of. Potential uh, operation. Op thank you. Potential operational delineations. Looking at ways we can block up the forest using current roads. Uh, rock scree areas, meadows, we can tie them together to go in and do fuels work so that then we have these blocks on the forest that will improve our efficiency and success in fire, fire, firefighting. Well, with that will be a fair amount of biomass that will need to be removed um, to make those spaces more uh, treatable or, and we'll have a higher success rate. That's another area that we're looking to grow quite uh um just in the next couple of years and that's a kind of uh, newer science that that has been in place for only a couple of years that we're really looking to embrace um and so there's there's we just have a lot of push and pull um you know the the our washington office just um invoked uh standing up a faca committee to relook at the northwest forest plan 
Northwest Forest Plan was signed in 1994. We have a you know forest plan that's almost 30 years old. And so with that um, comes, you know, like I talked earlier about land allocations and the encumbrances or what they allow us to, what they don't. Um, I, I questioned our ability to do large scale restoration given some of those challenges. And so with, with the standing up of a new FACA committee to look at using the, the, the current Northwest Forest Plan, looking at climate change, looking at forest resiliency, look at um, critical fire, um, you know, where we are with that as well, and rolling that into an updated version of the Northwest Forest Plan. Is that gonna be fast? No. Um, but it, it's, I would say it's very much overdue. And so I'm excited that we are, um, they, they actually started building that 20 person committee um, in January. And so hopefully that's going to roll out this spring and we're going to we're going to continue to have uh, open public comment on what that might look like. And I really encourage people to, to be very vocal about about the very things that we've talked about today about forest health and resiliency. So probably a long answer to a, a very long, long question. <laughs> yeah. Ben. Um, thank you. This this is been a fantastic presentation by by everyone here this afternoon and as i'm mulling this over i guess i've i've got a couple questions but i guess i wanted to sort of build on what joe was saying about timber supply and wondering and maybe ian can speak to this or you folks have sort of um we're talking about mass timber we're talking about these sort of modular affordable housing projects can you talk a little more about the the kind of log that goes into these projects and the kind of log that's coming out of these particular restoration projects you're talking about. And, you know, we talked a lot about thinning before lunch here. And I'm just, I'm trying to put all of this in context in the log supply that we have in Oregon and what role these new projects that we were talking about, what role they play. Um, and just maybe an ask for everybody is I'd love to go tour um, one of these GNA projects on the, on the Willamette. Um, the little chart you showed on the screen of the different matrix of what you're doing out there was fascinating. And I think it'd be really interesting for, for all of us on a future tour to, to go see some of that. So thank you. Well, I can take a stab at the, uh, the log question and the, what kind of material goes into the mass timber products. So if we're talking cross laminated timber, you're basically that is primarily made up of two by sixes and two by eights, number two or better. So Doug fir, um, spruce fir mix, uh, that, the, that's the basic feedstock for going into cross laminated timber. So you can make that out of material that is thinned, assuming that you have a log that's at least six, eight inches high quality. Um, and then for what we're talking about with mass plywood, Ferris can take down to a five inch top, uh, assuming it's Doug fir. So that gives us, a pretty close restoration or resilience nexus where you're removing small diameter material, um, not exclusively small diameter material, um, but certainly there, there's a fit there. It's an instance where we, we actually have a market for the byproducts of restoration and resilience up to a point. You know, we're not going to take everything. We can't take the biomass. We're not going to take the brush and the junk, um, but that, that is an existing market. And the, the last panel that we're gonna close out with, with Leck and, and, uh, and Woody, Leck's gonna talk about new research to really find mass timber uses for um, even lower value material for species from ponderosa pine, white fir, um, and even lodgepole. I, I think that's another place where this investment is gonna drive those restoration markets but they're not here yet. They're still in development. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. And we'd, okay. of course, I'd, speaking on behalf of Kyle, be happy to host you on a tour. I do think we need to move on to our next two presenters. I'm sorry, Carla, but I think we're just getting too far behind here. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for your you time. Guys. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay, well, I'll, I'll set this one up quickly. Um, the last two presenters are going to talk about the smart forestry project, which is a another component of the EDA work. Um, Woody Chung is gonna, gonna lead us off with kind of the overview of a, a basket of investments around safety, 
and efficiency in the forest context. And then Lech is going to Lech Musinski is going to follow up with some of the research uh, into underutilized species in advanced mass mass timber panels. So sorry for the delay. Sorry, we're getting a little bit behind, but we'll we'll close out strong here with these gentlemen. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, um, Chair Kelly and then the members of the board. Uh, it's our honor to be here. Um, and I don't know why you saved the uh, two boring college professors for last speakers. But That's anyway. for last. Come on. <laughs> so my talk is about the ADA Smart Forestry Project, uh, paving the way from forest restoration to mass timber. Um, and this project, well, we are proud member of Oregon Mass um, Timber Coalition. And in this presentation, I want to um, talk briefly about the ongoing big challenges we are facing when we plan and implement forest restoration projects. And then after that, we are developing some solutions to tackle those challenges. So I'm gonna introduce those solutions. And then at the end, I will introduce the team of uh, Smart Forestry members. And then, um, so challenges here. Well, two big challenges, economic challenge and a workforce challenge. Many of us know that if you do restoration treatments, then cost exceed revenue. Simple, that is a big challenge. And then also there, there is uncertainty around wood supply, like the last question. Okay, we don't know how much timber or how what kind of timber we can produce out of, out of restoration. And then infrastructure, lack of in infrastructure is a problem. Workforce, there is obvious trend of diminishing and aging workforce in forestry. Big problem, big challenge. And uh, let me give, give you more context around these challenges. One study in 2015, it analyzed Western Washington and, and no, not Western, Eastern Washington and Eastern Oregon and Southwest uh, Oregon. And they found that 40% of all coniferous forests in those regions are in need of restoration. It is about 11 million acres. So we are talking about large areas. Yet, if you look at the active sawmills, Sawmills are concentrated in Willamette Valley, Coast Range. So lack of infrastructure in East Side, East Cascade, and Southwest Oregon. And of course, because we understand this, because it's, it's difficult to have large capital in investment without having reliable, reliable source of wood and long-term contracts. And we have this. And then if you look at the treat treatment costs, there's a study that looked at over 20 cases of restoration treatments, and they found the average cost is about over $3,000 per acre. So what that means is we have to produce $3,000 or more, or more dollars of revenue to be able to make restoration profitable. But we know that it is difficult to generate $3,000 revenue out of treatment, restoration treatment, because of this small wood. Okay. And this is a nice picture after treatment. And then we leave all the healthy big trees behind. And treatment, restoration treatment, basically we take small wood, dead wood. And then that's why we don't have, those materials don't have much value. So you can see the challenges. What about workforce? Who would want to work in the deep in the woods, in a steep, rugged terrain with chainsaw? It's hard job, okay? Labor intensive, okay? And at the same time, it's very dangerous job because re restoration occurs in unhealthy forest, <clears throat> you know, dense forest uh, with a lot of dead trees. So this is extremely dangerous work environment. <clears throat> if, as a matter of fact, if you look at these statistics, logging is one of the most dangerous jobs in the United States. In 2021, the, the, the yellow bar, 2020, it was second highest uh, fatal, fatality rates after fishing and hunting jobs. So it is dangerous job. Um, if you look at the number of workers in forestry or in logging business, uh, from 1992 and how that chain number changes over time um, up to 2017, you can see here, this is the age class of 
between 25 and 44, which is very active, his most active workforce age range, you see the huge reduction in terms of number of workers. And if you look at the, the pie chart there, that age class used to be 61% of the total workforce in forestry. But now 2017, it shrank to 37%. Whereas the age class between 65 or older people used to be 3% only in 1992, but it became 10% in 2017. This tells us diminishing and aging workforce in Oregon. Why? Because young people, they don't want to pursue their career in forestry. Okay. Because the forestry job is dangerous, difficult, and we have to live in rural areas, areas not urban areas. And also, sometimes we have to drive a couple of hours to get to work site. Yet, pay is not there. And then the, there is negative public perception about logging business. So all this contribute to the loss of workforce in forestry. Now, what is the solution, by the way? Mm -hmm. Solution is going to be very simple because, you know, economic challenge, we just need to reduce costs and increase revenue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what I learned from Carla in New Zealand. <laughs> and workforce challenge, we just need to attract more young people to our profession. How to get there is not going to be easy. And that's what we are working on in this smart forestry project. And this is the way we pave the road okay, from forest re restoration to mass timber. And the first task is forest mapping solution. We are developing next generation mapping solutions to, to map the areas that are in need of restoration and what kind of trees and what kind of product we can generate from there. And as well as we can estimate harvesting costs and haul transportation costs. That will, that tool will provide basic tool to do initial financial analysis of any registration project. Second, we're, we've been developing smart technology applications in forestry to improve the efficiency of in-woods operations, which will result in the reduction in cost. And then third, where we're, we're investigating the tethered logging technology and the use of exoskeletons to improve the workers' health and safety. And then first, we are developing new manufacturing technology to be able to use the small ponderosa pine and latchable pine trees for mass timber. And Lek is gonna talk more about that in a minute. And then number five, we're developing intelligent education and training programs to attract young people. So I wanna give some little bit more ideas about these individual tasks. The first mapping solutions, we are developing the online tool that utilizes readily available satellite imagery and then ground plots, and as well as um, pod and uh, road, road network and so on, so that we can identify the areas that are in need of restoration. And also we can generate force inventory from uh, satellite imagery. And then in that, um, and then also user can provide what kind of harvesting systems and where the mill locations are, then we can uh, estimate the cost of treatments and then transportation costs. We're gonna demonstrate the tool in this four national forest. Um, and one of the, our focus areas is gonna be in east side of Cascade where the dry mixed um, conifer forests are. And that those forests are vulnerable to fire and um, uh, drought, the climate change. The second task, smart forestry. Um, application. So we've been developing this kind of tools, and let me show you one. Um, this we developed this device. This is computer vision system uh, we developed um, a couple of years ago, and this system is uh, taking pictures and analyze the process the the picture to recognize trees. And not only that, we can know uh, accurate location of individual trees, okay, relative locations from the computer vision system, and not only locations, at the same time, you can measure the tree diameter and straightness okay, very accurately, real time. And in this project, what we like to do is we, by the way, OSU has a patent on this, um, this work. In this smart forestry project, we want to mount this system on harvesting machines. So the machine operators can focus on driving the machine and machine is gonna see the trees 
and then analyze those trees and get this information, not only the location and also the, the size of the trees straightness, but at the same time, the additional functions that we are developing is we want to identify species because species matter for mass timber. And also the number of knots and size of knots and location of knots because it, it affects the quality of wood. So developing those new functions to this, now the machine, the harvester machine is going to, again, look at trees and then know the accurate attributes of individual trees before the machine cuts down the tree. So what that tells us that we can really maximize the value out of individual trees we cut. So what product, this, this tree, for example, this tree is gonna make, make for, this tree is gonna be mass timber material. That tree is gonna be saw timber material. That, that's gonna be pulp and that's gonna be biomass for energy, something like that. So we can maximize value recovery at the time of treatment. And then also the harvester will know, we'll, we can, because we know the product, we can separate those piles. Okay, so we know the pile locations, we know the you know, what sort okay, that pile has, and also the volume of each pile. We can communicate this information uh, with the forwarder operator or truck operator and the mill manager in real time. And we're developing this uh, communication platform for that so that we can, we can improve the efficiency of supply chain. So again, we are trying to reduce the cost here. And then tether technology, we have to do a lot of restorations on steep slopes. And yet the only method was manual chainsaw because we, cannot, we could not drive machines on steep slopes. But with this new tether technology, we can operate machines even up to 80% slope. Um, and the reason why we want to investigate this for restoration is because we want to remove people from that dangerous work environment and put people into machine cap, which is a lot safer. And then also we want to look at this exoskeleton. Skeletons, this is a wearable devices that can support uh, body posture and structure of workers. And then this has been used in many different industries like mining and other industries, but have not been used in forestry. And so we are investigating that. Um, and then we did a pilot study and we, we mm. tested, oh we, we looked at 10 different timber fallers and then measured their body posture during timber falling. And what we found out was that they spent a lot of time bending their torso, more than 20 degrees. And this is the 3D um, biomechanical analysis. And you can see here, the back lo uh, low back compressive force is that exceeds the NIOSH limit. So what that means is this, this confirms that many timber fallers suffer low back pain and injury. So this kind of device can help mitigate that issue. Now, manufacturing technology. So, Black is going to talk more about that in a minute. The fifth um, task is workforce development. We are developing these intelligent education and training programs, and our target audiences are all education levels, starting from elementary schools, middle school, high school, and college. And we team up with the OSU Extension and also um, pre-college program, and we are developing uh, new forestry lessons for SMILE program. And SMILE is a science and math investigative um, learning experiences program. Um, elementary school, we are developing cross laminated timber lessons. So elementary school kids will know about CLT. <laughs> and in middle school, um, we develop uh, forestry classes like climate change and sustainable forest management and forest re re restoration. So what we are trying to do here, this workforce challenge is not a simple problem. Okay, we need to have a long-term investment. So we are, we are trying to seed, I mean, the plant seed so that the young people, you know, ha, you know, they, can, they can grow their interest in forestry. And then for high school, um, we work with this uh, CTE program and the uh, Korea and Technology Education Program is a statewide program in Oregon. And this is uh, recognized by the, the board, state, state Board of Education and funded by the state. And we provide these simulators um, machine simulators to high schools and they can play with that 
And then we, we, we are developing 3D and a virtual reality computer games, basically. And it's going to take you know, a couple of months for me to play with that. But high school students, by the way, they know how to use joysticks. They know how to play game. And OSU is hosting uh, events like this um, annually and competition programs uh, among high schools. And then this the bottom photo came from last week, um, um, well, in last month, uh, from Oregon Logging Conference. OSU set out those simulators there, and we attracted hundreds of people. Um, and then we recently developed this uh, forest machine apprentice program. And what that is, is uh, we recruit college students who are interested in machine operation, and we train them using simulator and classes. And then during summertime, our um, industry partners, they will hire them as intern and train them using real machines in real setting. And then if students are interested, then these companies will hire them as machine operators. We have currently two undergraduates enrolled in this, in this program, the first year. Who are we? Smart Forestry Group, okay, with double S, because safety is important, okay. <laughs> safe and sustainable. And then basically these three um, organizations are doing most research and development work. And OSU, four colleges are involved in this, in this project. College of Forestry is taking the lead, College of Engineering, College of Public Health and Human Sciences, and Agriculture Sciences. And University, University of Montana and Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station, they are building, uh, they are developing the mapping system. And then industry partners, community partners, they support, they help us implement our solutions. So this is the last slide. Uh, our vision, we want to make Oregon forests, Oregon community more resilient to the impact of climate change through restoring forest health, modernizing forest practices, and improving health and safety of workers, and transforming forestry jobs into high-tech and high-pay jobs, hopefully. Hopefully. And then we hopefully we can create more jobs to support rural communities. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Woody. Mm. All right, Lech, you're up to uh, close us out here. We, we can ask questions when we're done. So picking up from uh, the intro, kind introduction to Woody uh, did to this uh, part of the program, um, I had trouble what kind of information should be included in this because this is like last talk of the of the uh, meeting and essentially many of the topics have been covered have been covered already quite eloquently. Um, I'll skip through these slides uh, that talk about uh, the the. Uh, that include repetitions uh, fast, but generally, we think of a of replacing this evil cycle that that we have right now, so, sort of like man made pro uh, problem with a man made uh, solution, greener, sustainable, is turning the. Uh, restoration fiber into uh, high-end products. In our case, we are thinking of, of mass timber pumps specifically. Uh, the fiber, as uh, Woody has uh, stressed, that is being removed in restoration projects is not the best fiber that you have on the stand. On contrary, you want to preserve better fiber, better trees on the stand and remove uh, lower uh, quality uh, logs. And these lower quality logs uh, are not good for everything. Nevertheless, if you look at the, I got these numbers without much commentary in here regarding the uh, forest restoration project, the volume generated between 2009 and 2019, this is in uh, MMDF, so these are the, the numbers in here. In Oregon and Washington, it gives you a uh, point of reference. I would be specifically referring to this number of 600 uh, MMDF uh, as a volume. This is about 1.5 million cubic meter a year. And I put it that way because most of the uh, mass timber uh, or CLT production is being expressed in, in cubic meters uh, or millions of cubic meters per year. So as I said, not all of this uh, 
volume removed is being immediately good for structural uses, right? So this is like the first kind of uh, squaring that uh, Woody's uh, teams are going to figure out already at the during the harvesting, right? What is a potential for structural, structural use as opposed to what is not. And in terms of what we are getting from there is uh, we, we talked already about species. Uh, it's not going to be exclusively prime uh, Douglas fir, and it's not going to be uh, other prime uh, species necessarily, because there's like different objective for these treatments. And if you see the map of the forest fires and the map of, of uh, where do you find ponderosa pine in the system, it's more or less like, uh, not surprisingly, ponderosa pines, white firs, and other species not uh, typically considered for uh, structural uses are going to uh, constitute a substantial volume, substantial fraction of the volume in here. So this is something to think of when we think of uh, placing it in the uh, in mass timber panel. The next thing is just the sizes. I mean, here you see a variety of, of um, diameters and there is going to be overrepresentation of the smaller diameter logs this is very different fraction of of the regular commercial harvest this is another thing that we need to deal with and the small diameter logs i mean it is possible to sow some of them into dimensional lumber but uh in some cases it's going to be just the sideboards and essentially it's not just that you ask a sawmill to do that there is very few sawmills who can do that in a effective and cost effective way most would not touch those uh, logs. Is it impossible? No, it is possible. It just requires certain investments uh, on the part of the uh, lumber processors, okay? So these things have to be kept in mind when we uh, position ourselves in a task to secure low value wood for the mass timber industry. And mass timber, again, uh, this fiber is not going to be good for glue lamb. We are essentially speaking specifically about mass timber panels. Right. Um, so here is the, the rationale for this, this extent of forest fires that we see and where we find this uh, fibers that needs to be removed. And we look at our map of the mass timber manufacturing sites. The mass timber manufacturing is already dispersed in the landscape and it's growing. It's going to, to become larger. So this is why our focus is on, on this uh, mass timber panels, uh, cross laminated timber. And this is not just a, this is beyond proof of concept. The wagon timber in Northern Washington, they already do their own, I mean, wagon timber is like a brotherly uh, institution. One side of the company does the forest uh, restoration projects sawmills, uh, the process, the lumber, and the other is manufacturing mass timber panels out of these uh, products. So proof of concept is there on a smaller scale. What we need to do in order to extend the scale is uh, as follows. Of the potential structural uses, essentially the number ones typically get the home without any problem. This is the part of the, of the logs that are being sold without any problems, right? We are focusing on this number twos and number threes. Uh, these are those that can legally be put in uh, the, the cross laminated timber. Um, if they cannot make the standard uh, grades of cross laminated timber, this is not a big problem because the standard allows us to build a custom grade that would be for specific projects. Now, this is a little mismatch because what we know about the mass timber uh, panel industry is all but a commodity type of, of industry. So let me go in here. Um, not going to go through all these details, but to tell you that what are, what's going to follow now is based on long series of research projects that we've done from the very beginning. This is the first project on the top here uh, that uh, was on CLT, uh, utiliz of, on utilization of, of wood in CLT. It's been already focused in 2013 on low value lumber. The second one, is one that launched uh, D.R. Johnson into, into product, production of uh, mass timber panels, okay? So 
things are being based on a long series of research and this allows us to put a finger on what is needed uh, at this very moment. So what we know about mass timber panel production is that these grades are going to be regraded uh, typically on the entry of, of uh, mass timber uh, manufacturing. And, but still, only number two and number three are going to be used in manufacturing. Now, the problem is uh, that what this is again, what we know about uh, global mass timber panel is like matching the supply and the capacity of, of uh, processing this stuff. We do a lot about the global uh, mass timber industry. I'm not going to go into any of this detail, but if you look globally, the global output of the uh, CLT industry is 2.5 million cubic meter. Can you remember the number of the output from uh, of the small logs from Washington? And uh, this is like half a million, right? Uh, tops, a little bit. This is global number compared to the global number. These are the uh, squares or to scale, right? So this is scale of the global CLT industry compared to uh, global plywood industry. And not all of this industry is located or produces here in North America, right? So to visualize it, this square represents the volume of these logs being produced, right? This square now represents the capacity of the uh, mass timber industry globally. This little cube represents the current capacity of the mass timber industry in the region annually, right? Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Uh, we we did some research and we know that already not all of this lumber, not all of these logs are going to be good for uh, the, the CLT manufacturing. So having a larger volume to pick from is a good thing. But going forward, even as we develop this industry, the question is, can we push, can we use even lower grade wood? And the answer is yes, but the current, what we know about the harvested in the restoration project, lumber harvested from the restoration project, the visual grades do not make the national design standards specifications for design. So is it stop for this? No, we can put this and this is how we, now this is the, the challenge that we are addressing within this, this EDA project, we can put this lumber, this visual grades for this um, harvest that has you know, more than usual volume of juvenile wood on the NDA standards to allow engineers and manufacturers to build panels with this, with this lumber. We also know that it burns somewhat faster than uh, regular uh, lumber. This can also be put on the national uh, design uh, standards in order to enable manufacturers to use this lamp, right? So this is some, is this type of panels going to go to this uh, wooden skyscrapers, to this uh, wooden unicorns, rather not. The solution for this is the uh, modular, smaller uh, scale designs and rather not one of a kind, right? But one that has been uh, talked about eloquently uh, previously on this, something that would go to uh, affordable housing units, nothing quite sexy from the point of view that would catch the eye of an architect, but sexy for us, because it can pedal large volumes of, of uh, stuff. Our research shows that this kind of um, products are good, these panels are good for, for this kind of solutions. They pass seismic tests. The only, the only barrier is now putting them legally legally on this uh, design uh, code values. And this is what we plan to do, right? So this is where we are with this project. Here is a summary of this, some unorthodox or uh, not very frequently used species for structural uh, products. The lower than current design values uh, uh, in the, in the logs that, that are cut as, as very small logs and the larger proportion of narrow sizes, uh, which and the, the thin lumber that we can cut with it from it, that can be addressed somehow. I mean, we cannot really rely on the, the uh, current 
CLT manufacturers to swallow this material right away. Some of this may be reconstituted on the edge bonding presses to make lumber, makes the sizes that uh, they are willing to use as the laminations. So this is one part of the, of the project is to just push the edge bonding technology for CLT. And with this, this is more or less how these objectives uh, are being found in this larger project is what we plan to do. Uh, too much uh, technical no uh, information to, to cover. Let me just finish with, with one thing. We were asked to provide like estimate of the potential impact per unit uh, being harvested. And it, I cannot just stop looking at this utilization treatment, jobs, 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 right? There's lots of synergy that has been talked into this room for the entire day. It's like first time really that this happens. Before affordable housing response to disaster, to, to disaster loss of homes, uh, treatments of, of forests, uh, the technology that can absorb this, these were all compromised, being looked separately. And it's nice to see the synergy that is going to uh, get us there. So in summary, we have, uh, the objective for our part of the project is adjusted design values uh, that are prerequisite for the structural uses of this fiber. Edge bonding te technology that can expand this use to the sizes of lumber that would normally be a hard sell for mass timber manufacturers. And the, uh, it needs to be understood based on the uh, comparison of the volumes available and volumes that are capable uh, to, of being processed by the mass timber. This is has to be seen as just part of the solution. It's not going to be a solution for this problem anytime soon, right? And as the parallel work, we work on the nitty gritty of how to put this uh, fiber into modular um, modular housing, and we are promoting solution. Uh, promoting the solution of this as a holistic, holistic, in holistic approach rather than one by one. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm sure you're tired out, but we, uh, we're happy to take questions if you all have them. I'll just say you were not boring professors. Um, <laughs> wow, uh, that's just incredibly impressive work. Questions? I, th I think we're getting kind of worn out here, I suspect, I um, but I, truly impressive. So we really appreciate all the presentations today. And Well, right. thank you, Chair Kelly, State, State Forester Makamoto. Thank you for your time today. Appreciate it. It's, it's been an honor. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and for your attention. Okay. I'll... Um, we have one thing left on our agenda, which we can probably get through pretty quickly, which is just our wrap up um, comments uh, for the day. Um, and uh, I'll start it off um, by saying something that'll probably make you all groan, um, board members. Uh, and that is, you know, we are going to uh, eventually get through our policy work on the forestry program for Oregon and to governance work. And I think it's time for us to start thinking about what is the big policy work we will be doing, uh, you know, when we're done with those projects. And I'm not, you know, not, not seeking an answer to that uh, this evening. I told you to start groaning. Um, look at that. They're laughing. Uh, and uh, I thought we'd, Whatever we do, it's going to be the same subcommittee. I think we'll put in charge. <laughs> but um, but seriously, I, I I will throw out for for thought. Um, you know, I'm 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 constantly thinking about the fact that that you know if you do think about an all lands approach, we're you know what's happening on federal lands is just so important to all the rest of the lands, not just around fire, but on the economic and on species and all the environmental impacts. Um, and uh, and Cal is telling me that that actually this vision for federal forests was in 2009 um, was never really even completed. And uh, so food for thought for me is is uh, might might that be a, a direction that we um, start thinking about uh, in in uh, 
2024. <laughs> anyhow, and uh, other than that, whatever other. Uh... Yeah, Jim, I, I uh, appreciate that. Uh, boy, yeah, next thing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I have one go back. I have one question I want to ask Josh. I got to tease him up a little bit. Could you, the Climate Smart Forestry Award, could you walk me through again the committee uh, that will be selecting that award? It was a question I didn't, I didn't get to in the regular part of the meeting. Yes, I can do that. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Kelly, members of the board, State Forester Mukamoto. Um, so yeah, I can clarify that a little bit. And so there will actually be two steps when those... Uh, nominations uh, for those Climate Smart Awards roll into the agency. So internally, we've collected uh, a group of folks from across the agency, uh, mostly operating programs in the field that will be part of um, when those uh, applications first come in and trying to make sure they fit all the criteria and those sorts of things. And then the next step after that will actually go to an external work group that we have that currently already exists. We have the Forest Legacy and Stewardship Program Working Group that's housed under the Committee for Family Forest Lands. And that work group is a, a broad array. Um, there's landowner representation, small forest landowner representation. Um, several federal agencies are represented there, um, NRCS, um, Forest Service, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we also have ODFNW on that group. Um, I'm just going off memory, but it, it's a fairly large group of folks. And what the intent there is, is for them to provide a recommendation back to the state forester on the selection of those applicants. So that's that's what that process would look like. So there would be an internal component and an external component in the recommendation back to the state forester on those uh, awards. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate that. Um, Brandon, Brandon. 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 Um, so this is sort of a follow up on what's happened on federal lands and um, Dwayne, I mean, what are you mentioned that um, uh, that a number of sales had been um, impacted by some of the wildfires. What are some of your um, strategies um, in dealing with that? What do you when that happens, uh, you know, where do you go from there? And along with species and all that other uh, impacts? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. Um, I think it kind of depends on the effects of the fire. You know, if you had a stand replacing fire, um, there's probably not a lot you're going to be doing with that. Um, you also need to look at the NEPA that was done for that original um, treatment. And so if, if it was, you know, kind of a low intensity fire that maybe thinned out the stand a little bit, you're still within prescription. Um, we do what's called a supplemental information report and a SIR. Um, we go through and we look at the analysis that was done pre-fire and the prescriptions that were covered in that analysis. And then we compare that to the post-fire conditions. And then are they, are they still within the, the conditions of the prescriptions? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, then we go ahead and we make a decision there. Sometimes there's, there's a number of the sales or units in a sale that we'll have to drop. Then we negotiate, um, use other pull volume from somewhere else. Yeah, Jim, I was just going to follow up on your all lands next, next fund project. Um, and a couple of things come to mind. One, one is uh, water and not to steal Sandra's thunder because I think that she probably would have a lot to add here. But um, if we think about... Um, riparian management areas on federal lands as the stream fall comes down through the headwaters and then crosses into private lands, we have a different policy. And then it goes down into the ag lands and we have a different policy, but we're treating one ecological system in three different policy arenas. What's wrong with that? And potentially quite a lot. And, um, the other is uh, the treatment of public resources on private lands, and that's uh, wild fish and wildlife. And so that has to take an all lands approach. Uh, you know, is there something that we should be doing, thinking about on uh, on forest lands that takes a more all lands approach to recovery of marbled merlets or uh, red tree voles or other species that are either 
at risk now or likely to be at risk and keep them from being at risk so we don't end up with uh, uh, policy impediments to, to managing forests. So I think there are a lot of things that come to my mind at least that, that do extend across uh, landowner boundaries. Well, I think there's a role for us, uh, you know, particularly on the, on the federal side, as you know, better informed the normal um, Oregonians um, to um, be able to, to to hopefully come up with some ideas and prescriptions and then and be able to try to influence our our, uh, our congressional delegation. Sorry. Go ahead, Carla. So I think as a wrap up. Um, I certainly enjoyed this afternoon more than this morning. Um, <clears throat> you know, it seemed this morning we were talking about layoffs and loss of family wage jobs in rural Oregon and uh, further uh, restriction of timber supply. And uh, Cal, I, I wanna be sure we ferret out these numbers, but I think um, HCP as it's currently proposed is 56 to 60 million for ODF on a biennium and 110 to 120 million to the counties on a biennium, but I'd like you to, I'd like you to verify those numbers. Um, but this afternoon, and I really appreciate the governor's agenda of looking at you know, homelessness and housing and affordable housing. I, I do believe those are you know, Oregon's biggest challenges. And I just really appreciated the role of, and some of the you know, thinking of you know, what we're doing um, to really provide supply to to address that at the last meeting i serve on a i'm in food processing and farming but i also serve on a forest products board and you know the industry what we learned at the last meeting and which many of us already knew is we see all the new mill infrastructure going into the south hundreds of mills billions of dollars and we've got three going into oregon upgrades or or new mills and uh, losing capacity is something that's really got to be on our mind as we think about fighting these wildfires and just the capacity of this industry. And if our biggest need is housing, well, certainly we need wood availability to go with that. And if we're trying, you know, forestry is such a big part of our economy and we, we don't keep that capacity if there's not supply. And certainly the federal forest is a big piece of that. You know, we've burned 4.3 million acres in 15 years. Uh, that's one in six acres of our, you know, forests in Oregon. Some of that we've burned twice. So I think some really thoughtful, Woody, I love what you're doing on the thinning and mitigation. The Wildfire Council was just so clear on how essential that was and the threat on those federal forests. So I think some, you know, thoughtful, thoughtful things were really came out this afternoon and I appreciate that. Ben, maybe you're going to get the last word. I'll be I'll be quick. Um, I just want to thank everybody for today. Today was again a really fascinating board meeting all day long, and um, one little call out. I didn't mention this this morning, but in the consent agenda, the I just wanted to say the annual report on tribal working relations and activities. That was fantastic, Cal. Um, it was an improvement from last year, and um, I just wanted to say thank you for for the work that your staff is doing on that. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, thank you, Ben. But uh, I'm gonna have to say that uh, the addition of Dr. Uh, Grimstead, uh, Deanna, has really helped. She has gone from the office visiting with tribes all the time. And I just really appreciate her, her uh, dedication. And then the overall focus of the executive team has really elevated tribes in their discussion, so. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, with that, I think we are. <laughs> yeah, I'll turn it off. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, with that, we are um, about to end this. I just, um, Hillary, we are uh, to meet for our tour at the PB building at 8.30, am I correct? Anything else we need to know?
I can as today's event, uh, folks will need to purchase a parking pass if they're going to plant their vehicle and join the van pool that will be leaving from tour stop one. Um, but yes, we are anticipating to see the public join us at PV Forest Science Center, the, the atrium area, um, at 8.30 a.m. is opening conference. All right. Okay. All right. Um, with that, we are adjourned.